Can you beat Final Fantasy X by swapping classes with another character? So, what do I mean by this? In Final Fantasy X, each character has their own specific job or class, be it a white mage, a black mage, a warrior, etc, etc. And you level up on this game using a sphere grid. On the sphere grid, you move along the board and you gain abilities and stats that fit the character's purpose. So for a character like Lulu, she has high magic and as you go through her sphere grid, she gets black magic spells and high magic stats. What I want to do in this run is swap the characters that usually have high magic with a character that usually has high strength and see how difficult it becomes when everybody's stats and abilities are jumbled up. So with all that being said, I'm going to show you the rules that I've set up for this challenge. So the first rule is pretty self-explanatory. Every character must stick to the sphere grid that they have been assigned to. I am allowing people to use black magic spheres and white magic spheres and things like that to learn other techniques from different sphere grids, but they cannot change sphere grids until they have completed the one that they have been assigned. So I've banned Yuna from summoning any Aeons in this run because they're quite overpowered and it just makes the game way too easy. So unless the game forces you, like during the Isaru fight or against Belgamine, Yuna is not allowed to use the summon command. So the next rule is no overdrives. I created this rule mainly just to make the game a little bit harder, add a bit more challenge to it. I originally didn't have this as a rule, so like for the first part of the run, up until about the first Seymour fight, I am using overdrives, but as soon as I started to realise it was quite easy and that they were quite powerful, I decided to stop using them. So when the game ramps up in difficulty, we stop using overdrives. So the final rule is no overgrinding. I want this to be quite challenging, so I'm not going to stay in one area for a long time and just grind up levels. I do do a little bit of grinding towards the beginning, but that's just to get people onto the right sphere grids. Then after that, we are just going through the game without stopping to fight loads of monsters and gain loads of levels. So now let's get into each character and how I've decided who they're going to swap with. So I want it to be as challenging as possible. So I tried to swap each character with another character that had very different stats and abilities to them. So the most obvious one to me was to swap Yuna with Auron. So Yuna has really high magic, MP, agility, magic defense, but low strength, HP and defense. And Auron has really high HP, high strength, high defense, but very low magic, MP, agility and magic defense. Auron is a character that benefits from having very high strength, which Yuna doesn't have. So it's going to be quite interesting to watch Yuna grow in strength and become this powerhouse. So now let's move on to our next magic dealer, which is Lulu. And I thought the best person to swap her with would be Waka, as he gains the second highest amount of strength stats in his sphere grid right after Auron. So I just thought it'd be fun to have Lulu and Yuna, who typically have the lowest strength, now be the highest strength characters. So Lulu's role is going to mainly be a status dealer. Because everyone's jobs have swapped, it's going to be harder for our characters to one-shot enemies. So Lulu's techniques of darkness, silence and sleep are going to come in handy because random battles are going to be a lot harder and you need these statuses to negate the enemies doing damage to you. Lulu, towards the early game, is very handy in just dealing statuses and then in the later game when the strength starts to stack up, she actually becomes a very powerful character. This is the only direct swap I do. So Lulu is on Waka's sphere grid and Waka is now on Lulu's sphere grid. And the reason for that is that their stats are just so oppositional to each other and it just made the most sense to me. Lulu's MP is the highest in the game and Waka's is the lowest so it's going to be really hard for him to cast multiple black magic spells because he just doesn't have the MP to fund it. He doesn't have the lowest magic in the game that goes to Auron and Tidus but I just thought this would be the most fun way to do it. Now I didn't realise this at the time but I actually added another layer of difficulty to this challenge because in the game there are certain enemies that are out of range from most characters and the only people that can hit those out of range enemies are Waka with his blitz ball or Lulu with her black magic spells but because Waka was covering both of these roles it meant he was literally the only person that could deal with out of range characters. So next up is Tidus who I decided to make our white mage and swap his sphere grid with Yuna so their stats are quite different in terms of strength and magic. Titus's is quite high in strength and Yuna's is very low. 
Tidus has the lowest magic in the game and Yuna has the highest. Tidus also has really low MP so he can't really cast many white magic spells. They do have some similarities, they both lack defense, they both lack HP and they both have pretty high agility. But aside from that, they're pretty different. Next up is Kamari, who is quite difficult because in a regular run of this game, Kamari can go to any sphere grid and become any character he wants. I had to just think about which one would be the most difficult for him, and I figured Tidus would be the most difficult. Kamari has really high strength, defense and magic, and low agility. And on Tidus's grid, he won't be able to utilize his high magic as Tidus doesn't have any offensive magic skills. And also, towards the beginning of the game, a lot of Tidus's stat increases on his sphere grid are very low, and barely boost at all, so it means that we can't utilize Kamari's high stats as they won't be increasing quite as much as everyone else's will be. His main role will be to cast haste on the other characters, making him sort of like a time warrior. Next up is Auron, who actually has the lowest magic stat along with Tidus, so I could have given him Lulu's role, but then I didn't have anyone to give Riku's sphere grid to, and I figured the main component of Riku is that she has really high agility, and Auron has the lowest agility. Auron has really high natural HP, and Riku has really low natural HP, but she actually gains a lot of HP nodes in her sphere grid. So Auron's gonna pick up on all of these and just have super, super high health, making him sort of like a thief tank, I've decided to call him. So the final character is Riku, who I've decided to sort of swap with Kimari. Because Kimari doesn't actually have his own sphere grid, it's hard for him to swap with anyone. But I've decided to make Riku a red mage, and she's going to float around between all the different sphere grids. So she's going to learn a few white magic spells, a few black magic spells, uh, a few of Auron's techniques, Waka's. She's going to go around to each person and just learn the basics of all of them. One thing you could say that makes them opposite is that Kamari has naturally very high stats when you first get him, and Riku has naturally very low stats when you first get her. So in this way, they do feel like opposites. Okay, so now that we've gone through every single role, here is a quick little recap of what each character's new role is. And yeah, without further ado, let's get on with the run. Okay, so this isn't the beginning of the game, but I decided to skip all that and get to the part where we have our main party ready, as the beginning part of this game is very slow and boring. Throughout the run, I'm also going to give you a few opinions on the story and what I think about it, and yeah, let's go through each battle, how we strategized, and what changes we needed to do to prepare. So here we are at the Killica Woods, and Yuna, after knowing Tidus for about five minutes, asks this. I want to ask you to be my guardian. To which Tidus responds with his usual answer of I'm just not really sure what's going on. Also, this is a really old save that I just loaded up and that's why Tidus is named that. I thought it was funny, it's not, but if we could just ignore that, would be great. Thanks. Let's go into our first mini boss fight, which is against Lord Uchu. There's not really much to talk about in this fight. Our stats are all pretty much the same as when we started. Nobody has started leveling up into their other roles yet. So most people are exactly how they should be. Ochu likes to use Poison Claw ability, which poisons people. So we're going to use Yuna mostly to cure the poison and heal our party members, and then use a combination of Kimari and Tidus to attack them. As you can see, I still use Kimari's overdrives at this point. I hadn't set the rule to not use them yet. They don't really come in too handy in the beginning. So we do stop using our overdrives at some point. So Tidus is using cheer while Kimari attacks, Yuna is healing. Another interesting thing is that each of these characters learn Lancet because they have to cut through Kamari's sphere grid to get to other people's sphere grids. It means that all the characters end up having Lancet and Lancet's a very helpful ability as it allows the mages in our party to get MP back. And because Tidus and Waka's MP is so low, you would find yourself having to waste a lot of ethers just to get back very minimal amounts of MP. But with Lancet, Tidus and Waka can simply draw MP from enemies and not have to waste as many ethers. So it's a very handy technique to have. Ochu's big attack is the Earthquake, which deals a good amount of damage to everyone, but not too much. And as you can see, Tidus missed, which I didn't even think was possible against Ochu. But I guess it's because we haven't leveled up at all. Uh, Tidus actually misses twice, which shocked me, and then he misses a third time, and then Kamari misses. So it was getting a bit wild, so I bring out Lulu and just decided to use fire, which I should have done a long time ago, just to get the fight done quicker. 
So just a few more attacks from Kamari and T to Siege, and then another Poison Claw, which we just ignore. One more attack, and Ochu is down. After saving the game, we venture through the woods. Uh, the battles here are pretty easy, so there's not really much to show you. Um, I decided to test out Lulu and Yuna's strength, so Lulu does about 39 damage while Yuna does 31. Uh, so they're not very strong at all at the moment, so it's going to be interesting to see that grow. As we make our way to the temple, nothing much has changed. Everyone is still in their roles. Waka is killing the flying enemies, and Lulu is killing the elementals, but that is all soon to change. Before we get into the next boss fight, I thought it would be a good idea to cash in on some of the sphere levels we got from going through the woods. So now Kimari has learned Cheer, and Waka has learned his first black magic ability, which is Blizzard. Lulu and Yuna haven't really progressed yet, they're still waiting to get to their sphere grid. And same with Tidus, he has not yet learned any white magic spells. Okay, time for the Sin Spawn fight. So we start off by taking out the two giant tentacles with Lulu's fire magic. And then it's time for Kamari to test out his new ability, cheer. Uh, and we do this with Tidus as well. So we have two people cheering, which is actually quite helpful as cheer increases the strength of our characters and also reduces the amount of damage taken from enemies. What I like about this run is that it forces us to use techniques like this. Because in a normal run, you wouldn't usually use things like cheer because everybody's stats are where they should be. But because our stats are going to be a bit messed up and we're not going to be as powerful as we usually are, Using things like cheer and focus really help to boost our stats to where they need to be. So after the shell cracks, Kimari gets poisoned by Venom, which we use an antidote from Tidus to cure, sort of like he's practicing for when he becomes a white mage. The Sin Spawn uses his staccato ability, which doesn't do much damage thanks to all the cheers we've been doing. Then we just keep on wailing at him over and over again until he dies using our most powerful spells from Lulu and our powerful attacks from Kimari and Tidus. Tidus gets poisoned by Venom, but we ignore it as we know we can finish it with a spiral cut, ending the fight. Before we get to the temple, we get this awesome scene of Lulu being a complete hey. bitch to Waka, which I appreciate because Waka's a racist and he kind of deserves it. I've been thinking. Amazing. Simply amazing. Sin didn't take Chapu anywhere. Sin crushed him and left him on the Jose shore. It's pointless to think about it and sad. So we're about to enter the temple, but then we get ambushed by a group of homosexual bully athletes known as the Luka Goers, who just so happen to be Waka's biggest rivals in Blitzball. You here to pray for victory too? Us? That's weird. What's your goal this time? You gonna do your best again? <laughs> this time, we play to win. Ooh, play away. Just remember, even kids can play, boys. See you in the finals! After we finish being bullied, we get thrown into the Cloister of Trials. We pick up the Red Armlet, which is a very useful armor for Kimari, as it gives him some elemental protection. We then complete the Trials, obtain Ifrit, who we never even end up using, and then test out Waka's new Blizzard ability. After that, we head to the boat where we get bullied by the gays again. Oh right, you're that idiot. We get bullied again, but this time by the voices in our head, and we learn the Jack Shot, which will actually come in handy later on when we get to Luca. So we arrive in Luca, but the bullying doesn't stop there. This time the entire city decides to let Tidus and the Oryx know that they ain't worth nothing. But Tidus has had enough and he decides to stick up for himself, like he should. Stop right there, goers! The woman was too stunned to speak. You guys are smiling now, but not for long! Cause this year, us Oryx are taking the cup! <laughs> Now it's around this time that we get introduced to the main villain of the series, Maester Seymour. 
And for the most part, he does a really good job at being super creepy and menacing. Mostly because he likes to thrust his genitals into the camera. <laughs> pick up a magic sphere and a HP sphere from behind the docks while Yuna repeatedly slams her face into a shipping container. Then, it's time to visit Waka, who provides some really overpowered weapons to us throughout the game. We pick up the stunning steel which has slow touch. At this stage in the game, nobody has the slow ability, so having a weapon with slow touch on it makes our life so much easier when we're fighting random battles. And then, just before we can start the Blitzball match... <gasps> Kamari! Yuna's gone! I wouldn't worry, Tida. She seems to be taking good care of herself. We find out Yuna's been kidnapped and it's up to Kamari, Tidus and Lulu to save the day. We also bought a Thunder Spear for Kamari which is only really helpful for these enemies but I figured why not. These fights against the robots are pretty easy. We just use Thunder with Lulu and attack with Kamari and Tidus until they're dead. After killing all the robots we make our way onto the Albed ship where it's time to fight the giant Blitzball robot machine. This thing's kind of stupid. Okay, so I bought those weapons from a Waka to make this fight a lot easier. I thought if I got slow on him and used a Thunder Strike weapon on it, that it would go down a lot quicker. But to be honest, this crane is so busted that it wasn't even worth buying those weapons for this fight. The slow touch weapon does come in handy much later in the game as well, so it was good that I got that. But I did not need the Thunder Spear for Kimari. The Blitzball machine thing likes to use this attack that makes you blind, which can be a bit annoying, but honestly, Lulu using Thunder and the crane doing about 4,000 damage to it made this fight super easy, so not much to report on here. We destroy the Blitzball machine, and Yuna is saved once again. Isn't that nice? After winning the fight, there's no time to rest because Tidus has to win the Blitzball match against the Luka Goers. We do actually really want to win this game because you win a Strength Sphere if you win the match. So, the tactic against the Goers is to basically stop them from ever shooting because Keeper has really low shot. And uh, we're off to quite a bad start here because Grav goes for a shot, but luckily we had enough people to block it and Jasu grabs the ball. As soon as Jasu has the ball, we want to set it to manual mode. Basically, during the first half of this game, it's very hard to score a goal because our stats are quite weak and we don't have any abilities. So in this first half, we are just passing the ball around, mainly between Letty, Jasu and Tidus, as these are the only three that are really any use to us. Datto is never going to be able to score, so don't bother passing it to him. Botta, it's okay to pass to Botta, but mainly Letty and Jasu and Tidus are the ones you want. Mostly Tidus, because he can lend Jet Shot, which is extremely powerful. So as you can see here, Tidus manages to level up to level 4, which is perfect. It means he has more HP to use Jet Shot, he's got more Shot and a bit of Endurance, so he should be able to score. But let's see how it goes in the second half. So we equip Jack Shot and then Grav catches the ball. Now, it's he is quite a powerhouse Grav. He's got a lot of high stats Grav, so he can be quite scary. Uh, as you can see, he goes for a shot and then Datto misses. I'm like, oh god, here we go. Keeper's going to miss. Uh, luckily, Keeper doesn't. Uh, he blocks the ball and it goes to Datto, who is pretty weak, but at least he has a lot of endurance. So he manages to take a hit and passes it to Letty, just because Letty was in a better position than Tidus. So we can take Bixen, no problem, and then we just pass it over to Tidus. So with Jack Shot, you can actually bypass two of the defenders. So I do this thinking it will do the strongest two, but it does the weakest two. The only one left has eight block, and now I'm thinking, oh god. And then they block it. And then we just score with one shot remaining. So that was really risky. I was assuming that it would take out the top two, but it took out the bottom two defenders. Because you can only use Jack Shot once because it costs 120 HP and Tidus has about 200 HP. So I had one chance of that and I nearly messed it up. Um, Tidus gets the ball again and then I think, you know what? I might as well go for a shot again. I'm already here. So we go for the shot and it goes down to two and then to one and of course the goalkeeper catches it now 
the goalkeeper passed it to Abbas and I'm thinking, oh god, but it's fine because there's a scripted part in the story where Waka comes out to help. Uh, Waka is also pretty good. You can, if I did miss the shot with Tidus, I could have just got Waka to score because he has Venom shot, which is very powerful. Um, but we've already scored the goal. We've got the strength sphere. So we just decide to give Keeper a few kisses and then proceed to constantly kick him up the butthole until time is up. And there we go, we've earned our strength sphere. There's no time to celebrate the win though because the Blitzball Arena and Luca itself is being attacked by fiends. It never actually explains where these fiends come from. They just sort of appear and we're expected to kill them and it never happens again, but that's fine. Um, so at this stage in the game, Tida should definitely be able to one shot these fish monsters, but he can't. So it takes one hit each from Waka and Tidus just to kill one fish, which makes these fights a little bit annoying, but it's not too big a problem. Uh, we also get a lot of lucky crits in these fights, which really help to just get through it. Finally, we're introduced to the badass that is Oren, and Oren is honestly one of my favorite characters in this game. Him and Yuna have the best storylines in the game, and they just have so many great moments that they really make this game what it is. You murder the big birdie and then it's time for possibly the coolest cutscene of the entire game. And I've got to give props to the art designers of this game because whoever came up with the design of Anima must have been on some mad sh** because it just looks insane. Like what is it? It's just this giant beast with hands wrapped around it, chains coming out of it and blood dripping from its eyes. Like I remember when I first saw this as a kid and I thought it was so terrifying, but so cool. And it really sets up Seymour as this massive threat because you know that even though he's a good guy now, he can summon this terrifying beast, which you know you're gonna fight later on in the game and it's gonna be scary. Yeah, I just, I love this cutscene. It's so cool to just see him wipe out everything. It really shows off his power, what Seymour can do, the presence that he has. It, it, it makes him a really, really cool villain. Back to the plot though, and we learn that. Sin is checked. And then Titus is all like. Uh, no, that's ridiculous, no way. I don't believe you. And then he has a quick little giggle with Yuna. <laughs> And then it's time to use the strength sphere we got on both Lulu and Yuna. Since they're at the same point in the sphere grid, it means they can both utilize the strength sphere, which will just help boost them along. I also give them both the HP sphere as well, just to give them a bit more last ability and really get them into their roles of Waka and Auron sphere grids. And now with Oren in our party, I wanted to see how long it would take him to get to Riku's grid. And it turns out it would take 17 sphere levels to get him over to Riku's grid. So we've got a long way until Oren properly becomes the role that he's supposed to be. But until then, let's keep on going. And guardians, don't forget to smile. So before we go through the Meehan High Road, I decided to do a little bit of grinding. I know in the rules I said I wasn't going to grind too much, but I just wanted to get five sphere levels to get Auron a little bit closer to where he should be on Riku's sphere grid. As you can see here, my highest damage dealing characters, Tidus, Auron and Kamari, are still barely doing over 100 damage. Uh, Auron does a little bit more, just over 200, but it's still not enough at this stage in the game. So I just decided to get a few levels here. Okay, so now it's time to spend those sphere levels. Auron gets two plus 200 HP spheres, and he also learns haste on his way to Riku's grid. Tidus is finally a white mage, he's learned cure, he's learned Ezuna, and I decide to put a magic sphere there so that Waka can also access it on his grid, so they both get the plus four magic. Not too much has changed with Kamari, his stats are quite low at this stage. He manages to learn Flee, which we don't use too often because I try not to run away from many fights. And then onto Yuna's grid, she finally learns Guard, so she's officially on Auron's. And Lulu's accuracy and strength goes up, and she also learns Silence Attack. 
Waka learns the rest of his black magic abilities and he gets that plus four magic which he got from Tidus earlier. I also decide to give Waka the MP sphere mainly because he's a black mage he's going to be using a lot more spells than Tidus does and so having 40 extra MP is going to be really handy going through the Meehan High Road. Let's take a look at their stats after we've leveled them up. So Oren has still got the highest damage of everyone in our party and also has really high HP. He hasn't yet developed his agility to Riku's level yet. Kamari's stats haven't really changed much since he's on Tidus' grid. He hasn't increased his stats very much. Now that Tidus has Cure, we can actually put that 11 magic to good use. His MP is still at 12 though, so he's not very useful. He can cast like two Cure spells, I think, at this stage. Waka's stats are looking a little bit better. He has 14 magic and 70 MP, plus fire, blizzard, water, and thunder. He's turning into quite a good black mage. Yuna still has 9 strength, so she's not going to be killing anything anytime soon. Similarly, Lulu has 12 strength, so she's doing a little bit better than Yuna, but that accuracy is at 7, so she won't be killing flying monsters like Waka does. Now, I wanted to show you this fight here against two bombs and the big horned guy which I believe is called the Jewel Horn. And I just want to show you how weak we are. So essentially the only things that can kill the bombs are two of Lulu's blizzard spells and then a powerful attack from either Kamari or Tidus or Auron as they have the highest strength. But they deal so much damage to us. And that's one thing I find a lot in this run is that we take way more damage than we usually do in a normal run. Waka's HP, as you can see, goes all the way down to 91 and he has over 800. It's just a couple attacks and boom, you're right the way down into critical. And this happens a lot. I found myself healing a lot more than I usually do. But yeah, this is just a random encounter and you can see how tricky and long the fight is. The Jewel Horn is really deadly, but having Lulu and Waka both know Dark Attack comes in so handy because this Jewel Horn is such an issue. It does so much damage. And having it blind means that we just don't have to worry about it ever dealing damage to us. You can see here Oren is testing out his new haste ability, which isn't on Riku's grid, but we had to pass through Tidus's grid to get to Riku's grid, so that's why Oren has haste. And it makes sense for his character because he's supposed to be a thief, he's on Riku's grid and he's all about higher agility. I kind of don't mind him having haste. But yeah, you can see here the fight has taken a long time and if this happens two, three, four times, then it's taking a long time to get through this part of the game. Yuna is still healing, her magic is a lot higher than Tidus's, and as you can see Tidus has 8 HP at the moment. He's not going to become an effective white mage until he gets at least a couple of MP spheres. But yeah, I just wanted to show you guys that fight just to show you how long it takes us, how much we have to heal and how little damage we do in general. After some more casual racism from Waka. But this isn't our bed shop. Is that a problem? I'm not tired one bit. Well, I am. It's time to use up some of the sphere levels that we gained by going through the Meehan High Road. Now, this is where the game actually starts to get interesting. As you can see, Yuna is learning more strength and HP based stats, while Tidus and Waka are gaining more magic based stats. So you can really start to see the changes in their classes now. Also, Kimari learns haste, which is awesome. Now, the best way to test out our new stats is by fighting the Chocobo Eater. And this guy wants to stay blind as long as possible because he can deal quite a lot of damage. So I use Dark Attack and I also use Power Break. So even if he breaks out of the darkness, he still won't do much damage. As you can see, he manages to break through the darkness and deals 450 damage to Auron. Now, Oren has a lot of defense, and the Chocobo Eater's strength has been decreased thanks to Power Break, so the fact that it's still doing 450 damage shows how underpowered we really are. We managed to push the Chocobo Eater back, but he soon retaliates and pushes us right back again. We're still using Tidus's Overdrive, which does just over 400 damage, so not very impressive. And once again, we're getting darkness on him. We're using our strongest damage dealers, which is Kamari and Auron, along with Waka using fire. We could have used Lulu as her magic stat is higher. But I wanted Waka to feel useful. So, you know, I let him cast fire on the Chocobo Eater. 
Now I should have done this at the start of the fight, but I just remembered that Auron and Kimari both had haste, so I make sure I get that on both of them, and then just continue to attack and attack. Now you can see here also that Kimari's red armlet comes in handy, because the Chocobo Eater likes to counter-attack sometimes with Blizzard, and as you can see here, it does about 100 damage to Kimari and 200 damage to Auron. So that's a nice 50% reduction on elemental damage. After taking a lot of damage, I think it's time to bring Yunnir in and heal up Kimari and Auron, or they just continue to attack. They both have piercing weapons, which means that they can get through enemy armors, meaning they're the best two to really fight the Chocobo Eater. We really want Yuna to get a piercing weapon because then that means that she will properly feel like she is on Auron's sphere grid. So as soon as we get Riku and we can customize weapons, I will be trying to get piercing for Yuna. We decide to ride the chocobo to avoid any more random encounters and then we make our way to the Mushroom Rock Road. From the first time I laid eyes on him, I never did like Seymour. But you know, some of the things he said that day, they made a lot of sense to me. We pick up an armor for Tidus from a walker called the Metal Shield just to give him a bit of a defense boost. So the fiends on Mushroom Rock Road aren't too difficult for us. They're not too big a step up from Meehan High Road, they're quite basic. But there is this one enemy, which is the little mushroom fire thingy majingy that likes to use pollen. So if you don't kill this thing in one hit, it decides to automatically counter attack with a move called pollen. And what Pollen does is it puts your party to sleep. But if there are no enemies left that can do physical damage to you, then you can't come out of sleep. Where, as you can see, everyone falls asleep, and the only two enemies left are a Fire Elemental and the Pollen Dude. So they just use fire on us and get our HP down really low. Thankfully, the sleep doesn't last too long, and we can get our health back to where it needs to be and kill them off. But yeah, at this stage in the game, Lulu should be able to one-shot these enemies with fire, so you don't have to worry about the counter-attack. But, because she hasn't been getting any magic stats due to being on Waka's grid, she can't one-shot the enemies with fire. Now, the whole point of Black Mages in this game is that they can one-shot these elemental enemies. But as you can see, Waka is doing just over 200 damage, which is nowhere near enough to kill these elementals. He ain't one shot in anything anytime soon. Now we get pretty lucky. We only get hit with Pollen twice going through the Mushroom Rock Road. This here is the second time, and as you can see, we get super lucky and only Yuna gets slept, and we manage to just kill it off with Auron. We make it to the end of the Mushroom Rock Road and prepare ourselves for one of the hardest battles in the early game, in my opinion. So Tidus has finally got some magic and MP so he can actually use Cure effectively. Not much really changes for Waka. We get focus. I feel kind of sorry for Auron not getting many stats, so I give him the Fortune Sphere. And he's now getting very close to Riku's grid. Lulu learns Aim and Sleep Attacks. Now she has Silence, Sleep and Darkness, which is brilliant. Yuna learns Magic Break and gets some Agility and Kimari is still chugging along. Now, this is a very important shop. We wanna buy the TKO for Waka because it's such an overpowered weapon. It has Stone Touch, which this early in the game, a lot of enemies aren't immune to stone. So when things get too tough, you just bring out Waka, hope for the best, throw your Blitz Ball and instant death. Death to all of them. Oh. It's so good that it feels like cheating, but it's not cheating, it's in the game at this stage. So, we're using the TKO for most of this run. As you can see, we're also selling off almost everything we own just to buy Auron's Sentry weapon. It has initiative, which increases your chance of preemptive strikes. And that just feels like a thief ability to me, so it was quite fitting to give that to Auron. Even though it is really expensive for not a very good effect. We send Garter off to his doom. Now it's time for one scary mother f this Sin Spawn boss creates a shift in the game where we start to see the difficulty ramp up just a little bit. There are three sections of the Sin Spawn that you can attack, the two arms, the head and the stomach. You cannot attack the stomach until both the arms are gone and you need piercing to get through the armor. Kamari and Auron's strength hasn't increased very much so it's going to take them a few hits just to get the arms down. Also the head can only be hit by Waka and Lulu's magic. 
He also deals a lot of damage. He can do Demi, which cuts everyone's HP down by three quarters, and his physical attacks do a whopping six to 700 damage, depending on the character. Our tactic going in is to destroy the head as quickly as possible by using overdrives and by using some black magic spells. We also use Auron to cast haste on himself and the other party members and destroy those arms as quick as possible. Whenever it says the head is moving suspiciously, you want to attack it immediately so it can't use any powerful attacks on us. So as you can see here, boom, 732 damage on Auron knocks him out. We send in Yuna because she has a lot of HP and she has the ability to cure. So she's actually in a better position than she would be on a normal run because she can cast healing spells and can still survive due to her high HP. But she doesn't have life so we do have to rely on Phoenix Downs if she goes down. At this stage in the game, it's possible that Lulu would have learnt her level 2 black magic spells, but we do not have that privilege so we just have to slowly chip away at his massive health until he goes down. Once we get haste on everyone, it means we get enough turns in before they attack and don't have to heal as much, which is really good. But again, the amount of damage he's dealing is such a problem because after every hit, we have to cure. And Yuna's magic hasn't increased. The cure is only healing about 600 while he can deal 700. And then at this point, the arms regenerate for a second time. I'm like, oh God, here we go again because they have 800 HP and that means Auron would have to attack three times just to kill one arm. And it just takes a long time, even with haste it takes a while. And then there's also the threat that he could die and have to be revived. So yeah, it's, it's quite annoying. Luckily we get his overdrive and we use that to make the process a little bit quicker, but it doesn't attack the head so I'm getting desperate at this point. I bring in Waka to use his overdrive because I know that that will hit both the head and the stomach and hopefully just get the head out of the equation because as soon as the head goes, it makes the fight much more manageable and less of a stress. We do a good chunk of damage to both of it and then Lulu uses one more black magic spell to get the head down. Finally, now we can bring out Kimari to use haste on himself. Now, Kimari is good because he has high strength, he has haste, but the issue with him is that his HP is so low. I'm not sure if he can survive a physical hit from this enemy. I use cheer to boost our defense and strength a bit, and then I send in Tidus as our white mage, mainly because my thought behind it was, when there's no healing that needs to be done, I can use Tidus to cast cheer, and then I can just focus Auron and Kimari on attacking. So you see me start to do that here. But again, it was risky because Tidus' HP is so low. And then once again, the arms come back. And I'm thinking, right, this is getting ridiculous. Luckily, we get a critical hit, and it means that Tidus can finish off one of the arms, which was so good. It meant we only needed two hits to get rid of that arm. And then the second arm takes three hits. We're getting in the stride now. We've got a cheer off. We're looking healthy. The head is down. Now it's just time to get the job done. So this part here, it attacks and goes for Kamari. And I'm like, oh God, here we go. He's dead. The cheer is going to be worthless. And he survives on one HP. That is madness. So if it wasn't for that cheer earlier, he wouldn't have survived that. And then if it wasn't for that fortune sphere that we gave Auron earlier, he wouldn't have been able to get two critical hits in a row off on the arms, meaning they each took one hit to get down. So I was feeling like the preparation that I'd done for this fight was paying off and things were going smoothly. And I was worried that this would be the first game over we got and that doesn't look like it's going to happen, which is lovely. Now we're just getting to the home stretch. We get another critical hit from Auron, which is awesome. He's super lucky. Even Yuna's doing over 100 damage at this point. We're looking good. And it's just about getting in the final hits before he finally goes down. So it wasn't as hard as I thought it would be, but that's mainly because of the overdrives. And although we got lucky, I don't think we would have got a game over had we not used overdrives. 
Mainly because the issue with this battle was just speed. It was just taking longer than it should have. And then we actually have to fight the Sin Spawn again after a cutscene, but I'm not going to go into it too much because Seymour is super powerful. He has level 2 black magic spells. We cast a lot of those. He dies. And yeah, I feel like that's a good place to end the first part of this video. So I'm going to try and upload these every week so you can keep up to date with this run. It gets a lot more interesting as time goes on because the battles get harder and harder and we have to use different tactics to get through it. So stick around for part two and I will see you all again soon. Welcome back everybody to the second part of my Final Fantasy X challenge run video. On the last episode we had just defeated the Sin spawn and then proceeded to watch Sin destroy everything. Tidus wakes up after the battle and he is going to go visit Luz- what? Wait a minute. I'm pretty sure we selected the option to kill Gata, but whatever. We get more badass lines from Auron. I'm not done talking to you. Don't you run away. You're the one running. Then it's time to continue up the Jose High Road. And I mentioned in the last episode that the battles start to get a little bit more difficult. There's a, a bit of a difficulty spike after the Sin Spawn boss. And you can see that in this fight here. As you can see, everyone is missing. Nobody has enough accuracy. Oren should be able to one-shot those hard enemies, and he can't. Tidus should be able to kill those dog enemies, and he can't even hit them. And then when he does hit them, he doesn't do enough damage to kill them. So that means we're going to have to change up our tactics. You can also see that the enemies are just doing a lot of damage to us. Tidus gets KO'd by that hard enemy. I went into this fight just blindly attacking, thinking I would win, and it turned out to be quite difficult. We're going to have to really utilise the statuses from Lulu and the Stone Touch weapon for Waka to get through these fights. And this next battle best shows off these tactics. So if that last battle was showing us how everything could go wrong, this is now showing how everything can go right. So we got a crit from Auron, which was lucky. Then we managed to get the stone touch off on the dog, killing it. And now all that's left is the flan. And the good thing about the elemental flans is that they're weak to silence. And as soon as they're silenced, they can't do anything. They have three turns where they cannot do damage. So honestly, you can just keep whacking him and whacking him because our spells won't do enough damage at this point. And you can just hope for a stone touch or whittle it down. So yeah, Waka really is the MVP. And Lulu definitely comes in handy when his stone touch doesn't come off. But yeah, Waka becomes super useful to us at this point. We make it through the Jose High Road without bumping into any super hard fights. And now it's time to go pray at the Jose Temple. But before that, we have this scene, and I don't know why, but the way Yuna says Jose here always really bothered me. And before that, we get to pray at the temple in Jose. I managed to get quite a few sphere levels by going down the Jose High Road, and that means that now Auron is finally on Riku's sphere grid, and we learn steal and use. The only other notable thing that happened from this leveling up session is that Tidus learned life and got some very important magic stats. Once we're inside the temple, we bump into Isaru, who is another summoner on a pilgrimage to defeat Sin. I'm playing this game on the PS4 Remastered Edition of Final Fantasy X, and it's very clear that the developers spent a lot of time reworking Yuna and Tidus's face in particular, but all the side characters like Isaru, their faces and the mouth in particular just doesn't look correct. Of course, I have no intention of losing either. Are you homosexual? Huh? Are you homosexual? So perhaps we should race to see who can defeat Sin first, no? The Jose Temple Trials aren't too difficult, and we even obtain a magic sphere from the chest. We give the magic sphere immediately to Waka, giving him plus four magic. And as you can see on his stats here now, he has 21 magic, meaning he officially has more magic than Lulu did at the start of the game. So that kind of puts into perspective how weak we are. All these guardians, and Sir Oren too, and I hear Maester Seymour is quite taken with you. I didn't mention her in the last episode, but there's this recurring character called Donna, who kind of follows you on your pilgrimage, and she just has this weird vendetta against Yuna and hates her guts. Uh, it's never really explained why, but any moment that you see her, she's just being a complete bitch. Uh, and she also suffers from the same issue as Seymour, which is thrusting her private parts way too close to the camera.
Before we head to the moon flow, I decided to pick up this Blitzball player named Q or Kyo, who knows, who cares. But the reason I picked him up is because I had the idea to do a challenge run within this challenge run. So when we get the airship, I'm going to do a special episode where we try to get first place in one Blitzball league using only goalkeepers. Here we are at the moon flow and there's not much of a difficulty spike between the Jose high road and the moon flow. Honestly, because of Walker's TKO, this part of the game becomes a cakewalk, much like the Jose high road did. So I'm just going to show you what a typical battle looks like. So this fight that we're in here is one of the more difficult fights because we have two wasps and an Uchu. And the only thing that can kill the wasps is Walker's blizzard and the only thing that can effectively kill the Uchus is Waka's TKO. So Waka really is the MVP right now. He's the only one who can actually deal with most of the enemies at this point in the game. So we really want to get haste on him as quickly as possible. So we send out Kamari, give him haste, and then it just becomes a case of hoping that Stone Touch succeeds. Because the success rate of Stone Touch is not 100% on an enemy like Uchu, it means we just have to sort of pray to the gods that it actually comes through. Uh, there is some backup strategy though, so if we don't get Stone Touch off, we can send out Lulu and she can use Sleep Attack on Uchu, and that just ensures that Uchu never gets a turn and can never really poison us. But once again, Sleep Attack isn't 100% accurate, and as you go through the game it becomes less and less accurate. So we can't really rely on these sort of statuses for a while, but at this stage in the game it's kind of broken. And as you can see there, Waka gets his stone touch off. And this happens through almost every other fight. So here's a quick little montage of Waka just demolishing everything down the moon float with stone touch. Piece of cake. We arrive at the other side of moon float and pick up the snake head weapon for Kimari. And then it's time to... Ride but oh no, Yuna's been kidnapped. Again. Walker and Tidus jump in the water to save Yuna as they're the only two that can swim. And we also have a little boss fight here against this giant blitzball mech machine. I was originally quite worried about this boss because I thought Walker and Tidus' defences are quite low and their magic isn't very high so I wasn't sure how they would deal much damage by themselves. But it turns out this blitzball machine thing really doesn't have much health and using Thunder and Tidus' slow touch weapon made it so that this fight really was nothing to worry about. And any time we did take damage, Tidus could easily just use Cure and get our HP back up. So this was honestly nothing to worry about at all. I won't show you all the fight because nothing really happens. We, we get through it very easily and rescue Yuna. We pick up our second goalkeeper on the other side of the moon flow, and then we discover Riku, who was actually in that giant blitzball machine that tried to kidnap Yuna earlier. And for absolutely no reason whatsoever, she just decides to join the party. Nobody has any reason to say that she can't. Lulu, Yuna and Riku go off for a little bit and are all like blah 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 blah. And then Yuna comes back and is all like... I would like Riku to be my guardian. And then Oren's like, If Yuna wishes it. Yes, I do. And then that's just it, like she's just in the party. Bearing in mind, this is the reaction everybody had when Tidus was asked to be Yuna's guardian. To be my guardian. You know what? There's no time for jokes, yeah? I just want him nearby. Wow. The woman was too stunned to... So that's cool. We've got our red mage now. We have a full party of seven characters. And it's time for the most boring part of the entire run, which is getting through Guado Salam. So there's really not much to see here. We pick up a cool weapon for Lulu, which has Death Strike. So Lulu and Waka can both one-shot enemies quite easily now. And we also pick up Yuma Guado, who is our third goalkeeper for our goalkeeper-only team. 
Some important story stuff happens, like Seymour asking Yuna to marry him before disappearing. They say Seymour went to Macarena Temple. <laughs> but before we can meet Seymour, we have to go through the Thunder Plains. Oh no, we're here. So the Thunder Plains is actually quite a scary place for us and it's mainly because the enemies are just pretty darn tough. So the best way to get through the random encounters here is the same as always, make sure Waka can get his stone touch out and make sure Lulu now can use her death strike. So these two are becoming the most powerful because our regular attacks just aren't strong enough, the damage numbers aren't high enough to one shot anything. It's also very tricky to hit some of the enemies, like the flying enemies in this area. They are resistant to magic, so we can't rely on magic spells, and nobody has high enough accuracy to hit them except for Waka, and even Waka at this stage. It isn't guaranteed that he always hits the flying enemies because we haven't been gaining any more accuracy nodes. So you can see there, two of our party members got KO'd and we had to use Phoenix Downs to get them back up again. Uh, Yuna and Auron are actually the best two to have out because they have quite high HP and defense and can usually survive hits, but everyone else goes down like a sack of You called? Yeah, you can see there, Waka actually missed with his Blitz Pool, so even if we connect the hit, we have to hope that Stone Touch goes off, and if it doesn't go off, we then have to hit him again when we can miss, and... It just means random battles take way longer than they should. But that's part of the fun, I guess, is seeing how challenging random battles are and having to change the way we would usually play the game. A little bit more healing now, and then we get one more hit off from Waka. The stone touch doesn't go off, but it does enough damage to end the fight. We get halfway through the Thunder Plains and then end up at Rin's agency. And we decided to do a little bit of leveling up just to use some of the sphere levels that we've got. And then I had the idea to do some lightning dodges. So usually you do the lightning dodges at the end of the game when you have no encounters and you dodge 200 lightning bolts in a row, giving you the Venus sigil for Lulu's celestial weapon. But if you dodge 50 lightning bolts, you actually get free strength spheres. Which isn't completely necessary, but I thought, I'm here, so I might as well do it. And it would just make this run a little bit easier without having to cheat. I can put the strength spheres on Yuna and Lulu and just get them closer to where they should be. And make them really strong early on, which is exciting because the strength spheres give you plus four strength each. So that's 12 extra strength on Yuna or Lulu or whoever. So... It's, it does really good, it's really good. Now, had I known that this task would take me two hours, I maybe wouldn't have done it. But it was worth it in the end. There were several times that I thought to give up because it was just taking far too long. And there's no counter to tell you how many lightning bolts you've dodged. So you have to sit there and count in your head how many you've been dodging and hope that you don't miss any. And every time you get struck by lightning, you have to start all the way from the beginning again. And that doesn't sound too tedious when there's 50 over 200, but it really is like, it's so hard to time them. I found this little spot. So if you stand by the lake and wait a few seconds, a lightning bolt will come down and then immediately after another will come down. So you know that you can get two consecutive ones, but you just have to be very, very focused because the timing is so precise and if you slip up or miss it or do it too early, do it too late, you get hit, you have to start again. Also, you can still get encountered by random battles while you're attempting this. So I decided to put Riku and Auron and Kimari in the party. So Riku and Auron will always go first because they have more agility and they can steal light curtains and lunar curtains and chocobo feathers from the enemies around here which is really good for customizing weapons because it can give us sos haste sos shell sos protect which is cool i get to farm without grinding too many levels because i would flee with kamari after but yeah this took so long i'll shorten this so you don't have to watch it all you won't have to suffer as much as i have i've sped it up but yeah, trust and believe, this took a long time. And even when I got 50, I decided to dodge a few more because I could have counted wrong or missed something. So, yeah, it, it was a very, very long process. But we got the free strength spheres. And, hey, 
I'm I'm happy with it. You know, I put two of them on Yuna, I believe, and then I save one because Lulu has Death Strike. We kind of don't need her to have a lot of strength at the moment, so I thought I'll save one Strength Sphere for later on if I desperately need it. So yeah, I'm feeling good now. Yuna has really high strength now. She's actually the strongest in our team. She's got more strength than Aura now, so I'm feeling good. It feels like this is what I wanted from this challenge, to see Yuna just bah, bopping enemies with her massive staff. Yeah, I'm really happy. After spending way too long at the Thunder Plains, I'm really excited to crack on and get to our next destination, Macalania. Before we start our journey in Macalania, I decided to get a few sphere levels. Waka has learned all of the level 2 black magic skills now, which is incredible. Uh, Tidus is nearly at Cura, he's just got a few more stats on him, which is nice. Uh, Kimari's accuracy has increased, making it easier for us to kill the enemies that Tidus usually kills. Lulu gets some strength and some magic, which is awesome, because we might learn Drain soon, which is a nice ability on Waka's grid that utilises Lulu's high magic. Yuna gets some stats, and Auron gets a few stats. He also learns Spare Change, which is a pretty crap ability that we never really use. And most importantly, Riku learns Cura before Tidus does, so she is now our most powerful white mage. Okay, so let's test out the strength of our characters after that little level up session. So here we have a wasp and two elementals. Nobody can hit the wasp with physical attacks again. They have way too much evasion. So we use Lulu's blizzard spell to get rid of it. And since she's on Waka's grid and Waka kills the wasps, it kind of feels correct that she kills them with blizzard. I don't know, that's the excuse I'm saying. Volterra does a lot of damage to us still. Our magic defense and defense and HP, it's always going to be low, way lower than it should be. But check out here how awesome Riku is. She does over 1200 healing to Waka, so she's a way better white mage than Tidus is. And Tidus nearly dies to a war terror because he is just very weak. But luckily Riku can get him back. Uh, we are just switching through the characters, trying to get everyone experience. Waka's Fundara isn't enough to one-shot these elementals, so we do need to get two hits out on them to defeat them. Uh, luckily, Null Tide is super handy in negating any of Waterra's damage, and you can see that Lancet gets Tidus's MP way back up again, so I actually love using Lancet in this playthrough. It really helped out a lot, having every character be able to just replenish their MP whenever they want to. I wanted to show you another fight here against the Chimera, or Chimera, whatever it's called. The dude with the two heads and the tail and the snake and, you know, the this guy. Because uh, I feel like this kind of shows off how powerful we are. Even without Stone Touch or Death Touch, our characters are just much better at dealing with things. You can see Lulu's Drain is actually super powerful, way more powerful than Waka's Black Magic abilities are. Because she just is naturally a better Black Mage than he is. What I really wanted to show you from this fight is just how good our attacks are. And Yuna doing 500 damage is awesome. Also having a Poison Strike weapon is really good and Auron's damage is doing about the same as Yuna. And our defense is really good, 183 damage from this guy. That's pretty solid. I get haste out on Yuna just because I want her to attack more and finish the fight. Get one more attack in and then BAM! 1064 damage. Yuna is a boss ass bitch. We make it out of the woods feeling pretty good about ourselves and then we head over to Awaka and buy the Force Knuckles for Riku giving her more strength and magic. Then it's time to level up and Tidus learns Cura and Riku learns Shell. So now it's time to fight the giant jelly queen nucleus monster water thingy. I don't know what this thing is. It's very random. It kind of comes out of nowhere. Uh, nobody knows what it is, why it's there. And it's really uninspiring and ugly. Drag her! I feel like the devs just wanted to have a boss battle here, but couldn't think of anything. So like, you know what? It's quite easy to render water 
We use water a lot in this game. Let's just have a monster that's a ball of water. Um, it's got a little egg in the middle. But yeah, we're gonna we're gonna stop judging Sferimov's appearance because that's not very nice. Let's just judge him as a boss. And as a boss, he has a pretty cool mechanic, whereby every time you use a magic spell on Sferimov, it can either absorb it or be weak to it. And how you tell which magic spell to use on it is by attacking him. So we use Lulu, Waka and Riku as our team for this fight. And the reason for this is Lulu and Waka can both do elemental damage and Riku can use Cura when our health gets too low. So we bait out an attack with either Lulu and Riku to see which magic ability it counters with. So say it counters with fire, we know to use Blizzard and Blizzara to counter it. And then it will shift again and you rinse and repeat. So the elemental damage that it deals is an automatic counter attack. So it's quite easy to bait out and it doesn't really do that much damage. So you're pretty safe on that front. And then the physical damage it does is also very weak. So this fight goes by quite smoothly. We use focus to help us out a bit, but yeah, not too much problem. I always really like this boss. I think it's quite cool. The mechanic of having to test what elemental to use and not being able to use physical damage. It gives your mages a chance to shine. I'm gonna skip over most of the fight because it is literally the same thing over and over and over again. And you get the gist. We do the thing, it dies, we move on. After the battle, we head to Rin's agency and do a little bit of leveling up. The only notable thing that happens is that we get slow for Kimari and shell for Tidus. So having slow on Kimari means we don't have to rely on Tidus's slow touch weapon anymore. And then we go into the next battle, which is against the Albed who have ambushed us and use this giant cannon machine to kidnap Yuna again. We want to start off by killing the negator because he stops us from using any magic spells. But the issue is he is out of reach for most characters. So the only person that can hit it is Waka with his blitz ball. But his strength is so low that it won't do enough damage. Luckily, we can use Riku and Auron to use the use ability and throw electro marbles at it and make it go down in only two hits. So. That's our biggest problem out of the way straight away. We can now use spells so we can heal. And I test out how much Fundara does to this guy and only does about 500. It counter attacks with assault after every single attack that you do. And assault does almost a thousand damage to us. And our higher health characters only have about 2000 HP. So they can just about survive two assaults. So here's what I'm thinking. We need to use Yuna and Auron. They have the highest HP and they have the highest strength of any characters. And then Tidus needs to be the third character as he can cure them. Another reason to use Tidus over Riku is that Tidus can use cheer, which boosts our strength and defense. So we take less damage from assault and deal more damage to the enemy. Kamari will also be used in this fight to use haste on everyone. And he can also cast slow on the enemy, which is awesome. Luckily on the enemy's turn, all he does is countdown to this big mana beam attack that he's doing so you're pretty safe to do a lot of setup in this fight the enemy won't attack you for a long time especially when you have slow on it it means you get a lot of turns to really set up i really like this fight actually because it gives you that time to prepare so yeah the mana beam comes out and it does 1500 damage to all of us it's a very powerful attack, but once again, it only happens after every three turns that the enemy gets, so you can really prepare for it. After every mana beam, it just becomes a case of using lots of high potions and cura to get everyone healthy again before we're ready to attack. But each time, we're getting stronger and stronger because we're using haste, we're using cheer. Cheer also increases our defense, so assault does less damage, and we won't need to heal up as much after every counter attack. So we bring out Tidus, get everyone healthy again, use some cheers. Also, when the fight goes on for quite a while, it just stops counter-attacking. 
for some reason. At the beginning of the fight, after every single attack, it counterattacks. And then I think it starts to feel sorry for you. I'm assuming the developers put this in as a thing to make it not last a very long time. So you'll see eventually when we start to attack it, it won't even bother counterattacking a lot of the time. But even when it does counterattack, our defense is only getting higher and higher and assault is doing less and less damage. The only thing we really need to worry about is the mana beam, but as soon as we know that mana beam is about to happen on the third turn, we just switch into Lulu, Yuna and Auron as they have really high HP, and they can just tank all the damage. It's um, It becomes easier as the fight goes on. The hardest part is the beginning, you know, figuring out what he does and getting all the cheers off to get our defenses higher. So I'll just quickly show you how much health this guy has at this point. Yeah, you can see there, he's, um, we need to do a lot of hits to him. Most of the time we're doing like 600, 700 damage, even with cheers off. It's, it's another slow one. Like every single boss fight in this game, it's, it's incredibly slow because we just don't have very good stats. So yeah, I know a mana beam is about to come up again, so I'm just making sure everyone is at full health. Yuna wax him, the mana beam comes out, and let's see how much damage. Yeah, still about 1300, 1500 damage. But luckily, they've all got high enough health that it's not an issue. So we're at the final stretch of the fight here. And we're at the stage where it's just deciding to not bother counter-attacking us, which is perfect. So we send out the dream team of Tidus, Auron and Yuna. And since it's not counter-attacking as much, it means we can effectively get off even more cheers. It just becomes a case of doing enough damage until it dies. I'm pretty sure we can get it down before it does another mana beam attack. So cheer whenever it's Tidus' turn, and attack whenever it's Yuna and Auron's turn. Heal up whenever it decides it wants to counter-attack, and then the fight is over. Quite a challenging fight, it did a lot of damage to us, but once you realise the patterns and how it attacks you, it becomes quite simple, and once you have the correct setup, you're good to go. It's just, once again, a long fight, but pretty enjoyable nonetheless. He didn't have to be so mean, yeah? Cried. After we win the fight, we get this gross little date scene with Tidus and Riku. It can actually change depending on who you talk to the most and what answers you give in some of the cutscenes. I somehow ended up on Riku, I don't really know how. But it's very gross when you think that she's supposed to be 15 years old. Yeah, this is where we find out that Riku and Yuna are actually cousins and Tidus is like, I had no idea, if you say so. And it's like, what? Did nobody think to ask, why Why has this only come up now? Did Tidus not question why Yuna decided to just let Riku join the party? I know I said this before, but I do just find it kind of crazy that nobody questions this. Nobody even asks. They're just like, yep, Riku is now part of the team. This seems kind of awkward. And Tidus is just really dumb with his uh, responses. He's just like, oh, cool. Da, 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 da. Like, he's just being really douchey. Um, Tidus is kind of hot, though, I won't lie. I know he's like super annoying and kind of stupid, but there's something kind of hot about that. I don't really know what it is. Maybe it's just because he has his shirt constantly open and wears like little tiny short shorts. I don't know where I'm going with this. Um, moving on. We arrive at Makalania Temple and it's time for a big boss battle against Seymour. So here's our stats going in. Waka, his magic, magic defense, evasion and accuracy are all on 25, which is interesting. But you can see here Lulu is just still way better with super high magic, magic defense and evasion. Auron has some pretty good strength and his agility is getting up there. His HP is high as well, so he can take some hits. Uh, Riku's stats are pretty awful. She is really bad. Drag me. But her agility is high and her magic is okay. And Tidus is the same as Riku, but with slightly higher HP and magic and a little less agility. Kimari's stats are fine. They're nothing crazy. They're very average. His magic defense is awful as well. We don't have Yuna in the party, so we can't see her stats, but her strength is around where Auron's is. She's quite similar in stats to him. I'll be honest, I'm a little bit scared going into this fight with Seymour because he is very powerful. There are three phases to the fight. You have to beat Seymour on his own with his two little minions. Then you have to fight Anima, and then you fight Seymour on his own for the final time. And from what I remember, he does a lot of damage with his magic spells, and Anima can use pain and instantly destroy us. Plus, Anima can also get his overdrive off Oblivion, which does tons of damage. And that's fine if you kill him quickly, but we're not using overdrives anymore, 
and our stats are low. So we're not going to be killing Anima quickly. He's going to get Oblivion off, whether we like it or not. So I'm not even sure if we're going to be able to survive that, if it's even possible. We're probably going to get a game over, but let's just see how it goes. Let's get into the fight. I will fight you too. All right. So be it. So the fight begins and immediately the two little guards use protect on themselves so physical hits aren't going to do too much damage and Seymour also uses shell on himself. I use talk on Tidus, I don't really know why, I just wanted to see what it did and it raises his strength which is useless so that was very pointless. I decided to give haste to Yuna because Yuna is just a powerful character, I feel like I'm always going to be using her a lot. But then this is where the problem happens. We only did 400 damage with Protect, and the guards counter-attack with a high potion that heals 1000 health. So now it becomes a case of just trying to find an attack that does more than 1000 damage. Also, whenever it's their turn, they use a remedy to get rid of poison, so we can't rely on statuses either. And yeah, Lulu's Drain does under 1000. I then send out Waka, and Waka's magic spells do under 1000. So I then send out Riku, and I'm like, okay, maybe she can use Fundaga. So I go through her items and find a Lightning Marble, which does a Fundaga spell. That just about does over a thousand, but we only have like 10 of them. So it's not a very feasible strategy. We're going to run out too quickly and we won't be able to pierce the armor. So now I'm like, Fuck, what do I do? I just keep going through, trying to attack, maybe... I thought I'd try to get poison off on him again to see if he always uses Remedy, and yes, he does always use Remedy. So, Lulu's Drain seems to be the highest damaging thing that I can see. I decide to give Lulu haste and then send out Waka to use Focus, increasing our magic and magic defense, which is the best strategy I could think of. The magic defense increase also helps us because Seymour only attacks us with magic spells, so we boost up our magic and magic defense until we have enough damage to kill the guards. I haven't even thought about what we're going to do with Seymour yet, I'm just trying to get the guards out of the way. The first phase of this fight is just getting haste out on Waka and Lulu and using lots of focus and drain. So I've skipped ahead a little bit and that was us getting off our fourth focus. So now you can see Drain is doing about 1200 damage, which is better. It means that it's piercing through the 1000 health that is being regenerated every turn. This Drain actually does 1300 damage, so that's really good. Uh, we get off a few more focuses. I'm not sure how many you're allowed to use until it's maxed out, but I just thought I would use as many as possible because we're in a pretty good position. I was just scrolling through Riku's items to see if there was anything she could do but I didn't want to mess it up so I just stole a high potion. We use Drain again, we're doing 1300 damage, we're now looking good. He is going to go down to one more Drain I believe. We get off another focus just in case we're not maxed out and now it's time for the final Drain to get him KO'd. Yes, that is one down. Unfortunately, the next guard is um, suffering from broken heart syndrome and can't counter attack with his high potion because his friend is dead and we just kill him with two spells. And then it's time to kill Seymour. And I forgot that he had shell on him, so I'm throwing magic attacks and it's not really doing much. So I just decide to attack and see if we can kill him like that. Lulu and Waka aren't the strongest two at the moment, so they're not doing much damage, so I send in the big bad bitch herself, and Yuna does just over 800 damage to him. We just keep attacking him, I don't bother sending out anyone else because he's not a threat to us. But what is a threat to us is his big ass scary Aeon Anima, which we've seen what this guy can do in Luca when he was zapping away those fiends, and now we have to fight him. So this is pretty scary and he's actually pretty tough. So he goes for boost every other turn and in between those boosts he uses pain which doesn't do any damage to us it just immediately kills us. And that's a problem because we've got six focuses off on Waka and Lulu so as soon as they get KO'd all that focus is gone and they're no longer using really powerful spells.
Every time he uses boost, it increases his overdrive gauge, which means he's going to use his oblivion attack. And like I said before, I don't know how much damage it's gonna do. I feel like it's gonna be a lot because I know this enemy is tough. So I want to kill him before he can get oblivion off, but we're just probably not doing enough damage. I'm worried that we're going to get a KO, but I'm thinking if we do get a KO, the strategy would be to get off loads of cheers and focuses before we go into the anima fight to make sure we have enough damage to get him down before Oblivion. But I just thought I would see how it goes. We're doing good damage with Waka. He's doing over 1600 damage. Aura and Yuna are also doing about 1100 damage each. So I'm like, okay, we're, we're pretty powerful, right? And then I see his overdrive gauge fill up and I'm like, okay. I'm going to send out my strongest characters. I've got Auron out. I feel like Auron is the one who could survive. If anyone were to survive, it would be Auron. Kimari has a sensor on his weapon, which shows us that Anima only has 3000 HP left. So I'm like, ah, can I find anything that does 3000 damage? I'm panicking a bit. I'm just going through and seeing if there's anything I can do to just kill him immediately before he gets Oblivion off. But I'm not seeing any options. So I'm like, okay, I'm going to send out Yuna. And I'm going to use a high potion. And that gets Auron all the way close to his maximum HP, but not quite. And then Oblivion comes out. And it's pow, 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 damage, damage, damage. Everyone's dying, everybody's dead except Auron. He does one final blast and I'm like, oh God, Auron, you can do it, buddy, I believe in you. And he survives with 500 HP. So, hey, that's pretty good. I thought that was gonna be an instant game over and we survived it. Barely, but we survived. Now, we need to make sure we get everybody back up on their feet ready again. And we really do not want another Oblivion to go off. So nobody's looking very healthy. We've got two KO'd party members and we've also got everyone else on very little health. Also, Anima gets a lot of turns in. He has very high agility. So pain is gonna be coming out very quickly. He's gonna be boosting very quickly. So I'm just trying to make sure I get everyone up and ready because I know that once we defeat Anima, we then have to fight Seymour again. So we need to make sure everyone is healthy and that we kill him quick and that we still have enough MP and HP remaining to defeat Seymour in the third stage of the fight. This is a tough battle, one of the best in the game. I think this is probably my favorite boss battle actually because this is the first time we see Seymour being evil and we get to see the power of Anima. We also get to see Anima's Oblivion Overdrive for the first time which is badass as hell. It's just one of those battles that you never forget after you finish playing the game. You remember this battle, you know. It's got multiple phases to it. It's everything I love in a boss battle. It's a very key moment in the story where things start to shift. But yeah, we're getting towards the end of the phase. We get one more drain off with Lulu giving us an overkill, but it ain't over yet because we've still got to kill Seymour himself. That power that defeated Anima, it will be mine. I'm feeling pretty good going into this fight because I didn't think Seymour would actually be that difficult. I know he uses a lot of magic spells, so I get a magic break on him to try and negate some of the damage that he deals to us. I can't exactly remember what he does, but I know he's powerful. And everyone's kind of beat up from the anima fight, so I'm just trying to get people back up to a good amount of health. So he goes for multi Blizzara, and I'm like, whoa, 1500 damage. Okay, he's a lot stronger than I thought he'd be. And I'm starting to panic a bit because he has a lot of agility. And if he uses multi Blizzara or multi whatever again, it's going to KO another character. So I'm like, crap. Okay, I need to think about this. I send out Lulu because I know that Lulu has higher magic defense. And this is a time where I think, okay, I have two Mega Phoenixes. If I'm ever going to use one, this is the time. I don't want to be retrying this fight. So I use the Mega Phoenixes, which means we can survive another turn. And this time, after his multi-attack, only one character goes down. So we have two characters to play with. I send out Kimari and get haste onto Yuna, because I know that Yuna is going to be a strong asset. She's got good magic defense, good attack, and um, she can also use magic break. I also notice that the magic break didn't actually go off. So we managed to do that again. And this time, we're looking so much healthier. 700 damage onto Yuna and only 400 damage onto Kamari thanks to his red armlet that we picked up ages ago in Kilika. We're looking good. This is looking nice. 
everyone's back up and we use a mega potion just to get our health back up and his attacks are barely doing anything. We get haste off onto Riku so she can put shell on everyone just to make his magic even weaker. So yeah, now that everybody's up and his magic has been broken and everybody's got shell, I'm not worried at all. So he goes for another attack and you can see 400 damage and 400 damage. Easy. We went from 1500 to 400. So that just goes to show how powerful shell is and magic break. It just halves everything, you know? So we just keep on attacking a few more times and we get him down. Okay, that was a pretty difficult fight, but we got through it. And I think that's where we're going to leave it here today. This is a really nice stage in the story where things start to change. So on the next episode, we're going to end up in Beaconel Island and we're going to continue from there. So thanks so much for watching, guys. See you soon. Welcome back to the third part of this series where I try to see if I can beat Final Fantasy X by swapping jobs. This is the first recording I've done since I've uploaded the first video. And the fact that people are actually watching this and enjoying this is crazy to me. I initially made this just as a bit of fun, just as a little side project to see if I could do it and to have a bit of fun with it. And yeah, I'm just, I'm super happy that the response has been so good. So I'm going to do that cringy YouTuber thing and just ask that you please like, comment and subscribe. I would love to be able to do something like this full time and be paid for it. So putting down a like or putting down a comment and especially subscribing to my channel will just help mean that I can make more content and do more things. So yeah, without further ado, let's continue on with the run. So Seymour has just unfortunately died, but not really because it comes back like three other times. So instead of arresting us, we just continue on doing the Cloister of Trials, obtaining Shiva, and then the Guado chase us all the way back to Lake Macalania where this big old random yeti dude just comes out and decides to fight us. Why the yeti is friends with the guado and doesn't like us, we'll never know. But let's get into the fight. As you can see, the gimmick of this fight is that the big yeti is constantly in berserk. And honestly, after that big old battle that we had with Seymour, this fight is such a cakewalk. The good thing about this battle is that the Yeti is weak to so many statuses. He's weak to blind and he's weak to sleep. He can't be poisoned and he can't be slowed down. But darkness and sleep just ensure that he can't really ever hit us. The most difficult part again is killing these two guards. Because once again, just like in the Seymour fight, if you attack them, then they automatically use an auto potion to heal their health back by a thousand. There is a little difference though. The... Guards in the Seymour fight had 2,000 HP, and these only have 1,300, I believe, or 1,200? I think 1,300. And another difference is they don't use Remedy whenever they get put into a status. So, Yuna has a Poison Touch weapon, and whenever she poisons them, they won't heal it off them. So, it's a lot easier to kill these guards than it was to kill the other guards in the Seymour fight. The guards will, however, throw eye drops and things at the Yeti to make sure he's not blind for too long. So you want to get the guards down as soon as possible. Um, I used Jinx here for some reason. I have no idea why. I just wanted to see what it did. Apparently it lowers their luck. I'm not really sure what the luck stat even does for enemies. But um, yeah, so that first guard we know is pretty much dead because he's got poison on him and he's not going to cure it off of him. So now we just have to deal with the other one. We're still making sure to get blind off on the Yeti because we don't really want it to attack us. I'm pretty sure we don't take any damage from the Yeti, so spoiler, the Yeti does not cause us any problems whatsoever. He's just so easy to negate. It's very refreshing after such a difficult fight to have this. As you can see, once the guard dies, he casts Protect on the Yeti. And we don't have Dispel yet, so that Protect is going to stay there the whole time. And another thing, once we get this guard down, he will cast Shell on the Yeti. So his defenses are up, but he's not doing any damage to us, so no threat whatsoever. Uh, we couldn't get the poison off onto this guard, so I'm deciding to just use some powerful spells. Going with the old technique again, focus with Waka and then use Drain on Lulu to make sure that we're doing more than a thousand damage and hope that we can get him down. 
takes a bit of time. You know, we have to keep focusing, putting haste on our characters, etc., etc. But honestly, it it's it's so easy you know it's, it's super easy time consuming but easy so yeah this second guard takes a little bit longer than the first one but eventually it does go down now it's time for the big bad yeti man himself and without his minions to protect him he's super weak to all of these statuses we're using dark attack over dark buster so dark attack has less chance of being successful but it lasts for three turns whereas dark buster is usually around 100% success rate of inflicting darkness on them but it only lasts for one turn so I have Yuna, Lulu and Waka that all know Dark Attack. Waka starts off with Dark Attack, Yuna learns Dark Attack on her way to Auron's Sphere Grid and Lulu obviously has Dark Attack because she is on Waka's Sphere Grid. So that's pretty cool, we now have the darkness on him and we're pretty untouchable so we just send out our three strongest attackers, that's Kimari, Auron and Yuna and we just keep on attacking. I try to use slow but it doesn't work, I was just testing it out, wasn't too sure. I have Kamari to use cheer on everyone to increase their attack and then just keep on attacking. I'm really enjoying Kamari in this run. He usually just casts haste and cheer on everyone so he kind of is sort of like a, kind of like a buffer, you know, sort of like a white mage in the sense but more for like buffing characters, increasing their stats and increasing their speed but also has a really powerful attack as well so um yeah, he's super handy. I really enjoy using Kamari this run. But yeah, as you can see here, we're just attacking and attacking until eventually he dies. So nice and easy boss fight. Probably say more of like a mini boss fight than anything. But yeah, even though we just saw him die, it turns out he is actually still alive. And instead of running away, we just kind of stand there and watch as he jumps up up in the air. And breaks the ice, Crazy sending us all down to the bottom of the lake. Said. I'm aware that Yuna is about to leave the party for quite a while, so I use the two sphere levels that she has just to get armor break. And then, oh no, Sin's back again, and he's rumbling. Except when they show him in the FMV, he's literally just swimming around. So how is there water above them? I felt like Sin was above them. It, it makes no sense. I think they got very lazy with this. They just had this shot, and they decided to use it. And then, oh no, he uses Sin's toxin. But we don't actually see what the toxin is, it's just a bunch of like white flashing lights and somehow this toxin can teleport you to a random desert island. Uh... We wake up in an oasis on Beaconel Island but Tidus notices that he's all alone so he decides to walk around but then gets ambushed by a giant bird. I got a little nervous in this fight because I thought, oh god, Tidus has no offensive capabilities. There's no way he can get this bird's health down and I wasn't sure how long it would take for someone to arrive. But before we know it, Auron comes and joins in and now I'm feeling a lot better because Auron is powerful and I feel like with him we can actually destroy him. And then all of a sudden Lulu uses a magic spell that she hasn't even learnt before. She's got Fundara for some reason just for that one time. So now that we have a party of three, I'm not feeling too worried. I know this guy has a lot of health and honestly most of the enemies in Beacon Hill Island have a lot of health and this is probably one of the harder areas of the game especially because we don't have Yuna and Yuna does the most amount of damage so yeah this part of the game very very slow I feel like I've said slow a lot through this playthrough but it is just very slow because of how low our stats are but yeah as you can see here we're just getting haste off onto Lulu and using lots of cheers to make the fight go a little bit quicker and using darkness is super effective on this guy because it just ensures he can't really attack us and yeah it just becomes a case of beating him up until eventually he dies. Since we're missing the damage from Yuna I decided to give Lulu the third strength sphere that we got from the Thunder Plains and then we continue on through the desert. If you're going for all the special items around here, you have to go through this area full of very tough monsters. And one of the toughest monsters is this big old worm boy. He has a lot of health and he's immune to stone touch. I'm not sure if he's immune to death or not. I decided to take Lulu's death strike weapon off of her just to see like what we're dealing with. 
And she's dealing a good amount of damage now. She's like in the 700s or so. Best way to kill this guy is to poison him. So we have poison touch weapon for Kimari, I believe, and maybe Lulu as well, I'm not too sure. Poison does 4,500 damage, which is way stronger than any attack we can do. So you just want to get poison on it and then attack it. He likes to use this swallow technique, which is really frustrating. It removes you from battle and he will spit you back out again. But if you kill him while he's swallowed someone, they don't get the experience. You spent all this time trying to kill him. And then if he swallows someone and then he dies before he spits them out, then your party member just doesn't get experience and it's a complete waste of time. Not a complete waste of time, but it's just annoying. Do you know what I mean? And honestly, most of the fights in this area are just very tough. There's a lot of big monsters here. And the lack of unit is really showing. I won't show you too many fights because there's nothing much I can really say about them other than they're quite tricky. And Yuna is very sorely missed. Yuna has become my favourite character in this playthrough because she can heal. She's kind of like a paladin, I guess. Because she can heal and she can also deal a lot of damage. Yeah, she's just, she's just very cool. To be honest, I've found most of the random battles in this game a lot harder than the bosses. And that's because the bosses have like a strategy. You know what they're gonna do and they're not as frequent you can prepare for them you know whereas random battles it's like you're just trying to get from a to b and you're having to spend like 15 minutes just trying to get through like one basic enemy just to then be brought into another random battle with another enemy with loads of hp but yeah so that's the big wormy fight you can see here he swallows up lulu and then we actually kill him so um well the poison kills him so Lulu gets none of the experience, but um, anyway, that fight's annoying. I'm going to show you another fight that's quite difficult usually, and that's against this giant thing. Uh, I don't know what to call it. The big plant that shoots seeds at you. Uh, the main reason that it's annoying and difficult is because it has a seed burst attack that almost always inflicts confusion on you. As you can see here, he's using it on Waka, and now Waka is confused. And it's just a bit annoying. It also has a very tough armor, so you have to use piercing weapons on it. They're kind of like mini boss battles, I guess, but not really. They're just they're just slightly more challenging than the uh, than the rest of the enemies. But yeah, I didn't have too many problems with this monster like I usually do, and that is all thanks to my main man Waka. Comes in with his TKO and boom, dead. We make it back to the Albed home and then Riku's all like Aah! And we discover that her home is being destroyed by the Guado and then what follows is possibly the saddest scene in any Final Fantasy game ever. The death of random Albed number 43. After wiping away the tears, it's time to do a little leveling up sesh. So Auron's got some more strength and agility, which is lovely. Uh, Kimari has learned Sloga, which is awesome. So now we can slow all enemies at once with some nice HP and strength boosts. Waka has actually got much better defenses now. We increase his magic defense and his defense, which is awesome. We also gain some MP as well, which is always handy as he'll be learning more powerful spells soon. Tidus has also boosted his defense, so that's good that both of our mages have boosted their defenses as they can take more hits. And he also increases his magic. Lulu gets a good little buff in her magic, her HP and her strength, which is super cool. She also learns uh, Sleep Buster, which is really nice. The increase in magic is also really good because she uses Drain quite a lot. And most importantly, Riku now has access to all the level 2 black magic spells. And now I'm going to start moving her into Waka's grid. So yeah, the red mage is coming along with the magic side of things. I just need to boost her strength now. There's not much to show of the random battles in this area, mainly because Waka's TKO and Lulu's Death Strike makes good work of everything here. When we get to this little save sphere here, I decide to do some leveling up. The only notable things is that we get Demi and Mug. And then it's time for some very important story stuff that happens here. So this is when uh, Titus kind of finds out the truth about what happens with the pilgrimage. And he's asking loads of questions and everyone's being a bit awkward about it and silent. If guardians do their job well, summoners will be safe. Right? Right? And then... <laughs> Kimari just decides to break the silence with this hilarious line. 
It's quiet. Kimari goes now. And then he just sort of walks off and it plays like the really emotional music. And everyone runs down the stairs. I don't know why. It's just so humorous. Whenever this game tries to be emotional, it just ends up being so funny to me. I don't know why. It's so awkward and I freaking love it. I do actually really like this scene after when Titus finally finds out the truth that Yuna's gonna die at the end of her pilgrimage. I never saw it coming, maybe it's super obvious, I played this game first when I was about 10 years old so I was a stupid dum-dum and I was like, oh my god no Yuna dies! And you really feel that Titus is actually genuinely heartbroken by this, he's been promising all these things like I'm gonna take you to Zanakin and you know, you feel really sorry for him, you feel kind of like everyone's cheated him. Nobody told him because they thought it'd be too hard, but they've just let him be dumb the whole time. And um, yeah, for how awkward the last scene was, you actually feel how genuine his emotion is in this. And it's really nice. I, I like this scene. That's the thing about this game. It's, it's got two halves to it. It's super cringy and awkward at times. Then it has some like really real heartfelt moments that really punch hard. And uh, yeah, this is one of those moments. Was I the only one? didn't know tell me why why were you hiding it why didn't i know we weren't hiding it it was just too hard to say lulu how could you how could you isn't she like a sister to you i thought you were family why don't you do something waka don't you think we tried to stop her she follows the track that plays in the background as well is like the main theme of the game and it's used so well here, it's such a pivotal point. Yeah, it just drives the emotion right back home. And then of course this game kind of ruins it by this super super close up shot of Riku. Like the camera just keeps on going in and in and in and you're like ah! We make it onto the airship, but quickly, we've only got three minutes left till it blows up. So let's spend about five minutes arguing and fighting and talking about absolute nothing. However, I do like the way Sid says Sin. I find that very entertaining. And then you just drag her to Zanakin and make her fight Sheen, huh? I love the airship in this game. It just has a really cool design to it. Very like futuristic compared to most other Final Fantasy games. And it's really cool that you actually discover this airship right at the beginning of the game when you're underwater with Riku. But yeah, it's time for a little send-off sing-song with the owl bed to see home goodbye. E -A -U -E. No go me no. Oh, so sad. Goodbye home. But the adventure continues. We are now heading to Bavel to get Yuna back. But we are interrupted by the giant dragon worm Evre, which protects Bavel or something. And uh, this is a scary fight. I was actually quite nervous for this because I remember this being very tough, having to pull in and out. And some of its attacks are very powerful. I think it can turn you to stone and it can poison you. And it uses haste on itself. So... Yeah, let's um, let's see how our party does against Evre. So here we are against Evre, and as mentioned before, it can move backwards and forwards and do different attacks depending on how close in proximity it is to you. So as the battle starts, I'm just testing out what I can do to it. Using Riku's new level 2 magic abilities, not doing too much damage, but her magic's fairly low. Um, Lulu's doing some good amount of damage now, over a thousand, so that's really cool. Uh, she's going to be used quite a lot in this battle just to be dealing damage. I'm getting Tidus out in this battle to use Protect on everyone. Because he did over 1200 damage to us, I'm thinking I need to get Protect on all of the main party members that we have. However, using Stone Gaze is a bit of a problem because it removes all of the buffs that you have on it so if you have protect on or haste or cheer that is no longer on you anymore so it's a little bit annoying but i still think it's worth getting protect and haste on everyone just so that we get more turns in
Drain's doing a nice amount of damage. And then I know this guy likes to use haste on himself, so I'm going to use slow for now. I'm not quite sure when the haste comes out. I believe it's once it hits a certain threshold, haste will come out and then slow is no longer useful. But for now, we'll keep him slow. That's one of the things that actually, uh, which can actually affect him because sleep and darkness and all of that doesn't do anything to him. And poison as well doesn't affect him. Here's the dream team for this battle. We've got Lulu for damage, Auron casting haste on everyone and Tidus casting protect on people. So there's his big poison breath attack, which is quite scary. It does a lot of damage to us, but we have access to Albed potions now. And Albed potions are way better than white magic because they heal all three party members and remove a lot of their statuses. So you can see here, Auron is poisoned, but once we use an Albed potion, the poison's gone and his health is healed up. Super, super useful item, so powerful. If you have alchemy on your armor, then it actually does 2000 healing to you. So alchemy plus albed potion is super broken. Yeah, as you can see there, stone gaze still stoning people, but we're just using Tidus to use Ezna. And whenever Tidus has nothing to do, we can use cheers or we can use protect or shell or Tidus is just there as a little like, you know, helping hand. Lulu's and Auron are the main ones doing damage. So cool now that Lulu is our strongest character, just seeing her little Moogle run up to this big old dragon and deal him 1300 damage. It's kind of crazy, but I, I love it. It's so fun watching um, Lulu just decimate shit. being stronger than Auron, this big dude with a massive sword. And you can see there, she did over 3000 damage. Oh yes, as you can see, now that he's getting lower on HP, he brings out haste. So I'm like, okay, I'm going to bring out Kamari and you slow on it. But he automatically counters with haste. So you kind of can't get rid of haste. I don't know if using Dispel would do anything different, but it seems to be whenever you cast slow or remove his haste, he casts it back on himself. So you just have to deal with him having more agility towards the end of the fight. Whenever he does this thing where he sort of like stretches and leans up, that means he's going to come in with a poison breath. So you can kind of prepare for it, you know? So the poison breath comes out and we all just about survive. It's a powerful attack, but it's not doing too much damage. And the poison doesn't even really do much because we can just get rid of it with an Albed potion. So you can see here, I just send out Riku just so that she can use her Albed potion. Everyone's back to normal again. Not a tough fight. I, I remember this fight being a lot harder than this. I think when it uh, pulls out, it uses like this photon spray thingy with Bob. And um, that's really powerful, but he never moves back at all. He just stays really close. But yeah, a lot of people have mentioned that this isn't a very challenging challenge run. And I get that, it's not. It's more just for the adventure and the thrill of it and coming back to a game that I love so much. So Evray goes down and now it's time to crash the wedding. Now, that's the easy part out of the way. The hard part is actually these guards leading up to the altar bit where Yuna is. So, I mentioned earlier that boss battles are pretty easy because we can prepare for them. And normal enemies are just so ridiculously hard. So, I know that these guys have flamethrowers. So, I use Null Blaze to make sure that we negate it at least once. But, of course, there's two of them, so it happens twice and poor little Waka goes down. And yeah, you don't actually get to heal up between the every fight and this part of the game. So everybody's MP and HP is quite low and there's no way to use Lancet on any of these guys. Like you can use Lancet, but they don't really have any MP. So you're kind of stuck. If you run out of MP, you have to use an Aoife or you just have no MP. And we used Cura and Protect and things like that quite a lot. So you can see that Tidus is... Um, MP goes down quite a bit. But yeah, look how much damage we're taking. Our party members are dying. They have a lot of health, these enemies. So it's just taking a while because every turn we have to use a Phoenix down to get our teammates back up again. And yeah, you can definitely see some characters are way more powerful than others. All of our mages are just so unbelievably weak because usually the mages in this game, i.e. Yuna and Lulu, have high evasion to make up for their low 
HP and defenses and things like that. But since Tidus and Waka and Riku are the mages essentially, they all have terrible HP, terrible defenses and lack the natural evasion that Lulu and Yuna have. So I'd honestly say the strongest ones are Auron, Yuna and Lulu. They have good strength, good HP and evasion, good defenses like they're solid, but all of our mages, they're just weak AF. So this, this challenge definitely benefits the physical attackers more than the magic attackers, which is, um, which is interesting, I suppose. I don't really know. Maybe it's not interesting. Hey champ, that's really interesting. After we get down the big robot, it's quite easy to finish the fight, but we're struggling a lot. And yeah, as you can see here, I'm curing everyone with Tidus, and then I'm like, oh sh**, I run out of MP. So I'm like, okay, let's use Lancet on this robot, and I get one MP back. But yeah, once that's all over, we meet up with Yuna, and she decides that she is going to jump from the top of Bavel. <laughs> and everyone's all like, no! But then Yuna's like, I can fly. And then Tidus is like, no! Then Yuna's like, bro, chill, I got this. And Tidus is like, <sighs> Yeah, okay. And then Yuna does it. She steps off the platform and falls to her death. Just kidding, she actually gets saved by Valfour. And this seems actually really nice. Maybe this is me reading way too deep into it, but this is sort of like a reminder to Yuna of where she came from. You know, Valfour is the first day on that she gets in the game, and it just so happens to be the thing that saves her. You know, she's come so far and done so much and so much has happened and changed and this is like a reminder that her home is with her you know she's got this that's probably looking way too deep into it but um there's some significance in veil for being the the aeon that saves her in this moment you know the bevel cloister of charles can literally suck my left toe nobody likes it it's dumb it's stupid having to mash the x button to stop yourself from flying off into space is dumb having to be on this platform instead of just walking around is dumb Nobody likes this part of the game. It's the worst part of the game, but we get through it. We obtain a HP sphere, which we immediately give to Tidus because he's pretty weak. Then we also receive the Knight Lance for Kimari, which is pretty cool. It gives him like plus 18 strength. So that's really cool. It means he can now deal a lot more damage, which is nice. The real traitor is Maester Seymour. Now, this is where the story goes a little bit off the rails for me. So Yuna gets put on trial because she didn't want to marry Seymour, I guess, or she's a traitor or whatever. And then Yuna's like, no, actually, Seymour's the traitor because he's dead and he killed his father. And then Micah's like, psych, I'm also dead. And it's like, if everyone is dead, what is the point in living? Like, what is the point in being alive in Spira? When you die in this world, you still get to be yourself. You still get to exist. There's no repercussions for being dead. So like, I understand why the maesters want sin around, why they want everyone to be dead, because being dead is awesome. You're basically immortal. Unless a summoner sends you, you just get to walk around the earth doing what you do. Life is but a passing dream, but the death that follows is eternal. Why are we even fighting anything? Why do we need to kill Sin? Can't we just let Sin kill everyone? If people can just walk around and be exactly the same as when they were alive, except they get to choose when they get sent off to the far plane, then let Sin kill everyone. I'm I'm on the Maesters team. I get it. But yeah, it, the intentions start to get a little bit skewed. It gets a little bit confusing. Not quite sure who the good guys are, who the bad guys are. Maybe the maesters are allowed to be human when they're dead because they believe in Yevon so much. And if you're like a normal human and you die, you turn into a fiend. Who knows? They don't explain it very well, but I'm on team maester. Kill everyone. I'm team sin. Kill everyone, get everyone dead. After the trials, we all get sentenced to death and Tidus gets pushed into this lake with all the other characters that can swim because that's convenient, right? And he happens to have the latest reactions known to man. The characters who can't swim get sent to the Via Purifico where we get one of the most awesome tracks of the entire series. Lady Yuna, forgive me. Okay, finally, we're back in control of our characters and we can get into some fights. That was a lot of story stuff going on, so now we can get back into some gameplay. Now that we have Yuna, we are all by ourselves. But I'm like, this should be easy. Yuna's a badass. She can just kill these guys, no problem. I've got poison touch weapon. I've got healing abilities. This should be easy, right? So we've got two 
of these little fishmen and a flan. And we're taking a bit of a beating, I'm kind of worried. Usually at this part in the game you would use Aeons to get through this, this part, but obviously we can't use Aeons. I'm thinking Yuna's got this though, she's, she's a tough gal. I'm just going to go through and use Armor Breaks. I still don't have Piercing yet. I do have uh, Piercing available, but it uses a level 2 Key Sphere, and they're quite rare. So I don't want to waste the level 2 Key Sphere yet. I want to put it on a weapon that I know I'm going to use for a while. And she has Armor Break, which does enough. But yeah, Yuna dies. Yeah. We have our first game over, guys. We try again and the same thing happens, so we try one more time and then on the third attempt I'm like, okay, Kamari's around the corner, so maybe if I get to him before we get an encounter, we'll be okay. And surprisingly enough, we actually make it there without encountering anything. So if we did get into a random encounter, I would have eventually just put piercing on her weapon and we probably would have been okay. Yeah, we didn't need to. We got Kamari and then we soon pick up Lulu and Oren and we're alright again. So now that we have the party again, it's time to just show you where we're at with everyone's stats. Oren still can't kill these hard enemies, but that's okay because we have Yuna again and she's more than capable of taking care of them. And we have this evil eye which we can't seem to hit, but check this out. Lulu manages to kill it, so all those accuracy spheres on Waka screen is paying off and she's turning more into Waka now. Now look at everybody's strength before we go into the Asaru fight. Everyone's on 30, 31 and then Lulu and Yuna are both on 33 strength so they're well powerful and uh, feeling confident going into the Asaru fight. So this is of course where we do have to break the rules as you are forced to use Aeons here so we're going to fight Isaru. I'm not sure how powerful my Aeons are going to be because I haven't, you know, used them at all and we haven't grinded very much so they might be really weak but Let's, let's just see how it goes. He, he first sends out Ifrit and I'm like, right, I'm just going to send out Bahamut because I know that Bahamut is very powerful and there's just no point in sending out anyone other than Bahamut. He does the most damage. You can win pretty much every single battle in this game using Bahamut, so it's definitely the most broken option you have playing Final Fantasy X, which is why I said no Aeons in this run because it's, it's a very easy out from a, a difficult fight. But yeah, I'm like, I'm not quite sure how much damage he does. And then, hmm, that, uh, right. So according to the internet, Yuna's stats and her Aeon stats are like interlinked. So because she's gained a lot of strength nodes, it means that her Aeons have also gained a lot of strength nodes. Hence why Bahama is just doing massive damage to everything. So every single other fight goes the exact same. We just send out Bahama and kill him, except for when Isaru sends out Bahamut because then we have to send out Ixion who literally kills him in like three hits so all, all his Bahamut does is count down until he uses his overdrive but we kill him way before that even happens so we never really hear about Isaru ever again and we can all just move on and pretend he never even existed. Back underwater though with our mages and things aren't looking too peachy. So I'm going to get into a random battle here and show you how weak these guys are. These enemies are usually quite easy to beat because we just attack them with our powerful characters like Atidas and Waka, but we have to rely on spells now. Luckily Riku has learned her level 2 black magic spells so she can be casting Fundara along with Waka, but it'd be really good if we knew our level 3 black magic spells but we're not quite there yet so it's chip damage until they die. Waka has Demi, which is so powerful. I think it does a quarter of their max HP to them and it targets all of the enemies. So it's a nice uh, ability to use at the start of a battle because you know, that's when the HP is at its highest. And you can see here, Fundara is making good work of the little ones, but these big boys are a little bit more challenging. Riku can't really take many hits as well, so I use Tidus to use Protect on her. And yeah, you can see Tidus also takes a lot of damage, over a thousand there. Yeah, Tidus is doing his thing, curing up everyone, giving them Protect, and our mages are Fundaring everything. And it's just really cool to see these characters using magic spells underwater, because you just never usually would see that in a normal run. And that's what I love about this game, is that I'm still finding new ways to play it and enjoy it because it's just a good game. You can see they are actually weak to stone touch so we have a nice easy out. Now let's get into the second Evray fight which is against Evray the zombie so 
The big worm that we killed earlier actually didn't die, it somehow ended up under the water and is ready to kill us again. I know what you're thinking, just chuck two phoenix downs at this guy and he's dead. But I want to try to do this legit, I don't want to, you know, take the easy route. And I have two white mages on my team with Riku and Tidus, so I'm like, let's just see how the fight would go without using phoenix downs. So everyone's health is low, which is the issue, but he also has stone gaze and it misses on Waka. Every will always get stone out on at least one party member and destroy it. And honestly, whoever he picks, it doesn't really matter. Because we have two people that can use healing magic if it gets rid of one, no biggie. And we also have Waka that can do focus, which is pretty good. So I'm not too worried about that. He uses his photon spray, which is the only thing that we have to really worry about. I get protect out on everyone as well, just so that his physical damage doesn't do too much to us. And I believe the photon spray is magic damage, so focus is helping with that. We've got albid potions. Stone Gaze comes out and it hits Riku, and I think that's probably the best one it could have hit. Of course we don't have access to Albed Potions anymore, but we can still use Cura from Tidus and Focus from Waka. So that is pretty much the fight. Protect is doing a lot of good stuff, so his physical hits aren't doing too much. Photon Spray doesn't do too much to us either. We're looking pretty good. I can also use Waka to do, use High Potions and Heal instead. Tidus' Cura can simply deal damage. And you can see there, Fira does barely anything. We're so much better off using healing magic. But yeah, there's there's not much to say about this fight. It kind of just goes like that. He just rinse and repeats using photon spray and his usual claw attack, and that's fine. We're not uh, we're not too worried. Everything goes pretty smoothly. And yeah, I, I'll, I'll skip past most of this and just get towards the end because nothing interesting happens. We keep using Cura and Evray dies for the second and final time. The gang is all back together. Now that they've killed their respective bosses and gotten through the dungeons, it's time to leave. But oh no, Seymour's back again and he's killed Keenock, oh, everyone's favourite character. And for some reason, Keenock can't come back to life like the rest of them. And then Seymour just starts saying more cryptic bullshit like he usually does. Like, oh, come with me, Yuna. We will become sin together. And it's like, bro. Come, Lady Yuna. Get the hint. She ain't interested. She literally jumped off of a church to avoid marrying you. Like, she clearly ain't coming with. So Kamari's had enough of his bullshit. So he just decides to do what he knows best. <laughs> And then Seymour's like, oh no, you shouldn't have done that. And he starts transforming again into this uh, crazy monster. And we have the second fight against Seymour. And everyone is ready, except no, they're not. They all just decide to run away. Ah! But then Yuna's like, no, we shouldn't run away. And they're like, okay, let's go back again. Checking out their stats before we go into the Seymour fight. And you can see Lulu has some pretty good strength and accuracy. Compared to Yuna, they're on a similar sort of level strength-wise. But Lulu just has a bit more defense and their agility is around the same as well. Tidus's magic is actually really high on 40 and you can see compared to people like Riku who only has 27, he's a way better mage. He also has higher agility than her so Tidus is looking pretty good. And you can see Waka's magic also isn't very high, only on 29. That's just the nature of Lulu's grid. Yuna's grid just happens to have more magic stats in it, hence why Tidus's magic is so high and the other two mages aren't. And you can see here Auron's agility is doing really well, he's on 26, and yeah. Now getting into the fight, you can see Seymour has this little buddy with him this time, and it has its own HP bar, but there's no point in killing it, because when it runs out of health, it just absorbs health from Seymour, so you might as well just keep attacking Seymour. Seymour does quite a lot of damage here, he's doing over a thousand with his magic spells. So you can see here Waka can use Faraga now which is awesome, he's learnt the level 3 black magic skills. So that's good, he's doing a lot of damage, he's actually got the highest damage of any other character at the moment. So that's very cool. Just testing out Lulu here now and she's doing some good damage, making sure everyone gets a turn, you know the drill. And yeah. This, uh, this is another fight that goes through phases. So this first phase is Seymour using multi War Terra and multi Blizzara, all of that, which he did in the last Seymour fight. So we, we understand that, we know how to deal with this. 
But once his HP gets to a certain threshold, he'll start to use Break on us, which petrifies us, and his little buddy can use Shattering Claw to completely wipe out one of our party members. Uh, and then after that, he moves into a third phase where he uses Flare on us, which just deals big amounts of damage. So you can see here, the third phase is actually triggered when you do enough damage to him and he casts Protect on himself when it's not even his turn. So now we know he's in the break phase. And luckily Tidus has Dispel now, so he can get rid of the Protect on him. And we have to be cautious of the Petrify. So the little buddy uses Shattering Claw. That's fine, nobody's petrified. We survived that, all good. We're just attacking him until he decides to use Break and it comes out. It gets Lulu, but we have another turn and use Ezuna. So we're in, we're looking good. You know, the Shattering Claw, when it comes out, it's not going to do anything. Now you can see in the little sidebar here that Tidus is in the middle of Seymour and his little buddy, which means if he petrifies anyone that isn't Tidus, Tidus can just immediately remove the petrification and not get shattered. But yeah, Tidus gets the break and then Shattering Claw comes out. <laughs> And it misses, so we get off pretty scot-free. We surprisingly don't get anyone who stays petrified and gets shattered. So that's really good. We get to use all three party members. Here a break comes out again, it hits Tidus, but luckily it is Yuna's go and she can immediately cure it again, making sure that it doesn't get the shatter off. And yeah, that this phase is coming to an end. We're doing good damage to it. You can see here, Seymour goes for one more break onto Lulu and then the Shattering Claw, but he targets Yuna for some reason instead, which is fine. And that is pretty much the break phase over. We cure off Lulu's petrification, give him a few more hits, get haste on our important characters, and uh, yeah, keep hitting him until he moves into the Flare phase. Oof, that is some big damage, but hey, Yuna survives it, which is pretty cool. Uh, but then she also dies to this desperado attack. But I'm feeling good. Our, our party is strong somehow. Like we're just very strong at the moment. This is probably the strongest that we've been. This feels the most like a normal run here. We're not falling into too many issues with this fight. To be fair, this is probably the easiest of the Seymour fights. They do get a lot trickier after this. And the one before was quite tricky. But this one is a nice easy one. And yeah... Flare does a lot of damage, but we can just revive whoever gets hit by it, so we're sitting pretty. It's just a case of healing up, doing damage, you know, the usual. No super special tactic required for this, just keep on doing what we usually do. Now that I know that Seymour is just going to use Flare and his little buddy is just going to use Cura on him, I can get out my three strongest damage dealers, which are Auron, Yuna, and Waka. Auron can also cast haste on people and use Albed potions if their health get too low. So these are the three that end up being the MVPs of this fight. Just Firaga with Waka, attack with Yuna, attack with Auron whenever he doesn't have to heal up or do any other sort of tech, and just keep on doing this until Seymour dies. It's definitely pretty easy. I think if you get the Shattering Claw on someone in the second phase of the fight, then it becomes a lot harder and I can see why this would be a very challenging fight. Lucky for us, RNG was on our side and that didn't happen to us. If it did, who knows, maybe this could have been a game over for us, but I highly doubt it. So we're getting towards the end of the fight here and I'm just going to leave this episode here for now. And tune in next week as we return in the Calm Lands and make our way through Xanakand and do some more of the endgame sort of stuff of this game, which is very exciting. And yeah, Seymour goes down, but I'm pretty sure we'll be seeing more of him soon. Just like how you'll be seeing me soon, next week actually, when the next episode comes out. So tune in and see you later. Bye bye. Bye. Welcome back to the fourth part of this series where I try to see if I can beat Final Fantasy X by swapping jobs. On the last episode, Tidus and Yuna just escaped from Seymour after defeating him in Bevel, and they find themselves here in Lake Macalania once again. And this is the scene where Tidus and Yuna first finally kiss. This is where we actually see that they have admitted that they have feelings for each other and are starting a sort of romance. And there's something I really love about the romantic story that is told in Final Fantasy X. And the reason for that is that 
In a lot of other Final Fantasy games, you're often just sort of told that this is main boy character, this is main girl character, therefore they are in love. What Final Fantasy X does is it gives us enough time to see their relationship develop and get us to properly understand why these characters are connected to each other. So Yuna has had to watch her father go and fight Sin and bring the calm to everyone in Spira and now she's deciding to follow in his footsteps. So while she was sitting there mourning the loss of her father, everyone around her was applauding and cheering and, you know, saying how honourable and great he was. And therefore, it sort of got pushed onto her. So, you're High Summon Nebraska's daughter. That's quite a name to live up to. And I think all she really wants in life is for everyone in Spira to be happy. She says it several times. If my getting married would help Spira, if it would make people happy, maybe I should do what I can. She just dreams of a world where there is no suffering, there is no sin, because if that was the case, she would still have her father around. And Tida sort of represents like a manifestation of that ethos, you know? Like he comes from this world where everything is perfect, there is no suffering, people watch Blitzball every day, you know, everyone lives in peace and harmony, and she talks to him about this several times. And I think he sort of represents a hope for what Yuna really wants, and I think that's why she feels so connected to him. And Tidus also forces her to challenge her own beliefs, because she is blindly following along in her father's footsteps, but she knows the outcome and what it will mean and how it affected her, and she knows it's going to affect everyone that she loves around her. And Tidus not being from Spira, and questioning the teachings, and questioning why people People have to sacrifice themselves puts the idea into her brain that things can change and she has the power to do that so it, like it makes sense why she feels so connected to him but Tida seems to be the only character that actively advises her to sort of go against the grain everyone else is telling her to stick to the teachings Waka and Lulu they have her back but they sort of are just going with whatever she thinks she has to do you got to marry him I think it is the right thing to do okay I guess and Tidus isn't afraid to say, actually, you don't want this, you're just doing this for everyone else, but there is a better way. And I don't know, I just think that's a very lovely story. Yuna's such a strong character, she's forced to be so strong for everyone. But summoners and their guardians are kind of like Spira's ray of light. A lot of people in Spira depend on us. I learned to practice smiling when I'm feeling sad, you know? She's so unbelievably selfless in every act that she does. And I think Tidus kind of like gives her some leeway and tells her she doesn't have to be this perfect person all the time. It is hard to follow in his footsteps. As a summoner, the honor of having a father like him surpasses all that, I think. Well, there wasn't much to honor about my old man, that's for sure. You shouldn't say that about your father. I got the right. Hmm. I guess you do. She's also aware that Jekt, one of her father's guardians, is Tidus's father and there's that little connection to someone that she's lost that kind of draws her to him it sort of like reminds her of you know a happier memory and as for Tidus while well, he likes Yuna I mean Yuna is literally like a celebrity in Spira she gives people hope everyone is obsessed with her like why would you not love someone like Yuna everyone else seems to not believe him whenever he talks about Xanarkind and where he's from but Yuna is the only person who kind of sees through that I do believe your Xanarkind exists I really do you know I love seeing the progression of their relationship throughout this game, and I like that it happens at this point. Instead of it happening very early on, you sort of get the sense that they fancy each other early on, but they never actually actively do anything until this moment. Because there's more important things to think about, Yuna has to be focusing on her pilgrimage, she doesn't have time for stuff like this. But it's sort of in the background throughout the entire game, and I love that it just comes at this point. It's like the perfect point for something like this to happen. The pacing here is just like incredible. But yeah, I just wanted to get that off my chest because I haven't said much about like the actual story and how it makes me feel and what I think about it. And uh, that's, that's just one thing about this game that I think has aged really well. The love story in this game just really is powerful and clever and I really believe it. That's the most important part, right, is that I believe that these characters want to be with each other. And yeah, they did a great job. This scene is beautiful as well, watching them like flutter around in the lake all cute and lovely like. It's, it's, it's lovely. What a great scene. Bravo Square, bravo.
Now that we're at the calm lands, I think it's about time that I gave Yuna piercing on one of her weapons. And while I'm here, I'm going to upgrade everyone else's weapons and armor because I haven't really done that. And I've got a lot of stuff and things from enemies. So I'm just going through everyone's equipment and giving them some handy techniques like SOS haste and, you know, higher defense, higher HP, higher magic. And I also give auto med to one of Auron's armors, which is really cool. I don't know why that just sort of feels like a thief ability to me. But yeah, let's get into this fight here with a Marlboro. And you can see here where the auto med comes in handy. This is also a chance where I can show you how strong we are looking. Uh, yeah, Yuna's weapon unfortunately has eye strike. I really liked this weapon because it has alchemy on it. And I thought that's perfect. Alchemy and piercing, they're two really powerful abilities. But it also has ice strike, which is fine, but against the Marlboro who is immune to ice, it does nothing. So I just have to remember that she has ice strike. I kind of hate giving weapons elemental attachments because it means you can't use them for everything. And I like my weapons to be, you know, universal, to be able to be used at any point in the game. Not having to worry like, oh, am I at a stage in the game where there's going to be lots of ice enemies or fire enemies? So I have to counter it with this. You know, if they have no magical affinity attached to them, I can just use them whenever I want. Here we go, Bad Breath comes out. Everybody gets hurt by it, but then Auron automatically uses his remedy, which is so cool. It just means that we now have a character who can cure the statuses off of himself without having to have a turn. So enemies like the Marlboro are a little bit easier because we don't have to worry about getting instant game overs because that can happen. If Marlboro confuses everyone and poisons them and everyone's attacking each other and getting hurt by poison, there's no way to break out of it. So you will just get a game over. So having one character like Auron with Automed just ensures that that is less likely to happen. And yeah, you can see that Waka's Firaga is doing a good amount of damage. He's like the most powerful character at the moment, which is really cool. Yuna, Waka, Lulu, those three I feel like have consistently been the strongest. And Auron as well. Auron's been pretty strong. Kimari's pretty good for tech. Riku is just kind of bleh. And Tidus as well, not the best. But they can heal, so that is quite handy. Oh, as you can see here, he goes for a bad breath twice. And uh, we get very lucky that Kimari doesn't get berserked or confused because if he did that would have been very dangerous but we managed to kill the Marlboro no problem. Once we make it through the calm lands we then get ambushed by this big giant robot machine thing. I realize I call every enemy in this game giant robot thing but there are just a lot of robots and I know they're called machina in this game but to me in my brain it just makes sense to call them robots so we have big robot fight number 5023. And this guy's super weak to armor break. So I make sure Yuna gets that out straight away so that we can start dealing damage to him. And yeah, you can see he just dealt almost 2000 damage to Yuna. So he's quite powerful, but he is weak to darkness, which is really nice. Although the darkness doesn't help with blast punch, which is his automatic counter attack that does like half of our HP. It's kind of frustrating that we can't do anything against that, but we're just going through each character, stealing from him, and making sure that we are doing the best we can to negate him. As you can see, we're using Faraga here, which does a nice amount of damage, to be honest. And we can get Mental Break on him as well to deal even more damage. Just testing out Delay to see if that works, and it doesn't. Auron dies because he is just getting whacked around by this guy. Yeah, look at that. Haymaker did 3,500 damage. Even with Protect on, that probably wouldn't stop them from KOing. He doesn't use Haymaker too often, it's like every three or four turns or so. So I'm just testing it, I'm using Power Break and he's immune, so it's, it's, it's tricky. We have to make sure he has Darkness on him, and even when he does, that only really protects us against his regular attack, because Blast Punch can still hit us, and I think Haymaker can probably still hit us through Darkness as well. Kimari's doing his thing, getting haste out on people, and... I've realized his role is kind of like a synergist from Final Fantasy 13, where he gets buffs out on people. But someone in the comments on the last episode described him as a bard, and I thought that's like the perfect job class to give him. Because he can still do damage, but a lot of his focus is on raising people's stats. So yeah, I'd like to say Kamari's like a bard role. And yeah, this is like the team that we use for this fight from now on. We have Tidus to heal us and use protect and things, and we have Yuna dealing damage, and... Kimari doing his bard thing, buffing everyone and attacking whenever he's not needed to buff. Actually, I did just tell a lie because we swapped Tidus out after everyone has protect on them for Riku. Just because she has a bit more potency and efficiency 
than Tidus does. She has access to use, which means she can use protect on herself because she hasn't got the spell protect, but she can use a lunar curtain or light curtain even on herself. That effectively works as protect, which is awesome. And she also has access to Albed potions, which is a lot better than Cura because Cura does a lot of healing, but only to one person, whereas Albed potions can heal everyone. And yeah, the rest of the fight goes exactly how you'd expect to. Just keep on healing with Riku. And now that Kamari has got buffs on everyone, he can just start attacking. And Yuna again is also just attacking because that's what Yuna does. She is the powerhouse, the damage dealer of the party. And we love her for it. We, we Yuna is a boss and I've said it before and I'll say it a million times. Yuna is a boss ass b Oh, look at that. 5,000 damage. I won't show you the rest of the fight because it just goes like this. We're just attacking until he dies. And yeah, after that, we move on towards Mount Gagazet. I'm not going to bother going through the Temple of the Stolen Faith, whatever it's called. But I am going to pick up Doran, who is one of the last goalkeepers we pick up for our goalkeeper-only team. And that episode will be coming next week, so stay tuned for that. For now, it is time to make our way to the sacred Mount Gagazet. She was saying goodbye to the places she'd never see again. Now, this is it. It's finally time for Kimari to show what he's got and beat up those Ronzos that have been bullying him the entire time. And I'm actually going to skip through most of this fight because it's actually really boring and there's loads of boss battles in this episode. And if I go through every single one of them showing you every little detail, then it's going to take way too long and this video will already be longer than it already is. So I'm just going to skip through this one. Sorry, Kimari, you don't really get a chance to shine in the limelight but you are probably the most boring character with the most boring storyline of everyone's no, Drag her. so i don't feel too bad skipping this just know that it was easy we didn't have any problems they did barely any damage to us and kimari wins the battle And if you thought we could just move on from that, well, you are sadly wrong. It's time for some more beautiful Final Fantasy X cringe. Summoner Yuna! Oh, don't make me sing. What is it this time? Oh, don't make me sing. Oh, I could sing one, I guess. E -A -O -E. No more Okay, we're Okay, so let's see how strong we are after that battle. So the fiends on Mount Gagazet aren't too difficult. There are a lot of them though. The, I don't know what it is, but the random encounter rate here just seems to go off every five seconds. You walk for like 10 steps and then all of a sudden, bam, you're in a fight. And this happens all the time. It's super annoying. And Mount Gagazet is also very long as well. Like it's just a long road that you have to go down when not much happens. But luckily our characters are feeling pretty strong at this point, you know? And yeah, we're against these little plant monsters and a bomb. And what's interesting about the bombs is, although we're in like an icy sort of mountainy area, they're actually weak to ice, whereas most of the other enemies here are weak to fire. The the bombs are different. They are, they are actually fire and are weak to ice, which is really cool. And it just so happens that good old Yuna has an ice strike weapon. So yeah. These bombs, if they're not killed in three hits, then they will explode and deal loads of damage to you. You know, it's been difficult in the past trying to kill these guys, but bam, have a look at that. Over 3000 damage means that two hits and a little tiny hit will be enough to kill them. So that makes this part of the game a little bit easier for us. And yeah, everybody's looking good. I'm, I'm getting nervous for the next Seymour fight because I know it's a tough one, but we're looking pretty strong, so I don't think it'll be too much of an issue, hopefully. Uh, we will see what happens, but yeah, the normal enemies here, they're easy as pie. 
We actually pick up an armor for Yuna that has SOS haste on it, which is really cool. So I go ahead and give it SOS protect and SOS shell as well. Then we meet Awaka's brother once, who has the worst British accent I've ever heard in my entire life. Don't worry about me, just go help Lady Yuna. He does, however, have some very cool weapons and armor available for us. So we go ahead and equip everyone with that and start customizing it to make it stronger. Giving people SOS haste and protect is really cool. And yeah, just boosting up everyone's stats. And then we do a bit of leveling where Kimari gets haste dagger, Tidus gets Kuraga, uh, Riku learns haste as well. And then we're just gonna have a quick look at everybody's stats before we go into the Seymour fight. So Yuna there is looking super healthy with 45 strength, a lot more than Lulu now. But she's still do packing a big punch as well, Lulu is. You know, they're, they're, they're some powerful characters, them two. Let's just say that. Now we can see Auron here is also very powerful. He has 33 strength and 33 agility as well, which is really nice. And you can sort of compare him to Kamari. They're both on a similar sort of agility and strength level. Um, and then, of course, we have Riku, who is still very weak in the stats department. But she has a lot of, like, cool techniques that she can use. You know, she's very vulnerable. She's very weak. But... She can do a lot of stuff, you know, jack of all trades, master of none. And then you can see Tidus and Waka are still our mages. Waka's magic is still really low. I wish it was higher, but hey ho, you, th 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 that is just the nature of Lulu's grid, unfortunately. Huh? Hello? Hello? Hi. Hi. Now, before we get into the next Seymour fight, I'm just going to remind you guys to please like, comment, and subscribe if you enjoy the content. Uh, if you don't enjoy the content, then don't bother. I hate saying this, I hate telling people to like, comment and subscribe, but I did it on the last video and the number shows that by saying that it works, people, you know, respond to it. And it just helps the algorithm, it lets me know that you guys enjoy watching this sort of stuff and yeah, incentivizes me to keep on going. So uh, yeah, we've got this long ass cutscene with Seymour and it's time to face Seymour. I don't know what this one's called. Uh, the giant crabby shell looking Seymour fight. Yes, that one. As you can see here, the first phase of this fight consists of Seymour using zombie attack on us and then using full life to wipe us out. He could just use life, it does the exact same thing as full life, but he just has to be that extra and do full life on us. Um, I can see here he's weak to silence, so I silence him. Don't actually think that does anything, especially in this first phase. But um, yeah, cool that we got it off, I suppose. And yeah, we're just testing out our character, seeing how much damage we do. And uh, yeah, Seymour seems to have quite a lot of defense because Yuna's attacks are only doing like just over 2,000, which is not very much. Luckily, we have a lot of holy waters which we can use. And uh, as you can see, he uses full life and it does nothing because we got no zombies on our team. Testing out Waka's Faraga now, and that's not doing very much damage, and I'm like, hmm, how are we going to do this? It might just be one of those fights where it takes a long time, but I'm feeling confident, you know? I know this boss is tough, much tougher than the last Seymour fight, but I feel like our characters have come a long way, and they must be pretty strong. Uh, yeah, you can see here he's not weak to delay, you can't delay him at all, which is annoying because... Delay and uh, quick hit and all of those moves that increase our speed and, you know, give us more turns. Super duper powerful. Really, really broken in this game, I think. And, um, yeah, I keep getting silence on him just because I'm like, well, it works, so I might as well do it. Even though it probably doesn't do anything because uh, the full life is actually being done by Seymour's little buddy. You can't see his little buddy on this one, but he has that, like, little friend that he had in the last one. Um, yeah, so here comes Cross Chop and oofed, that is a big amount of damage. Yeah, and he just keeps getting loads of turns in, like look at that, he used his uh, lance attack thing, and he used full life, and he managed to use his like cross beam thingy attack. So um, it's looking a little bit scary. This first phase is uh, surprisingly not that difficult, despite how much we're struggling, it, it only gets harder from here. So. Yeah, making sure now we have haste dagger, it's so much easier to get all of our party members haste. So um, that's really handy. This makes Kimari super useful once again. And yeah, here he goes again. Full life. Ain't gonna do shit, mate. Sorry about it. And uh, we're mugging, stealing an elixir. That's a very powerful item. I'm glad we got that. Testing our armor break. Doesn't work. That's pretty annoying. Um, so yeah, 
He also can use Dispel on all of us, which is so stupid because it means we have to keep putting Haystegger back on us. I'm going to keep doing it, you know, because it's just so much better to have all of us uh, with haste on us. Ah, now you can see the Protect comes out, which means he's moved into the second phase of his fight. So, um, yeah, we immediately use Dispel to get rid of that because we need to be doing physical damage to it. It's just more powerful than our magic attacks. And here comes the second Cross Cleave. Yikes. That time, Tidus dies, because Tidus is a weak little baby. Sorry about it, Tidus. You just suck in this playthrough. And, um, yeah, we get him revived pretty soon. And I'm like, quick, we need to get everybody's health back up again. So, uh, make sure I get Zombie off and, uh, see what he goes for. Of course, he goes for full life, and it does nothing because we got the Zombie off. Thank God for those, uh, Holy Waters. I think I picked those up from once. I think you can get it off of him before this fight. So, um, that's really handy. Kuraga doesn't do too much because Yuna has SOS Shell, but it's enough. And uh, we get another Kuraga out onto Kimari, doing almost 5,000 healing with Kuraga. So, like, I don't understand why Yuna's grid has so many magic spheres in it, because increasing her magic just increases her healing potential, but, like, Kuraga does so much anyway. Like, it's going to heal you to full health regardless. So, like, why does she need that much magic? I'm talking about Eunice Sphere Grid, you know, Tidus. Why does Tidus need that much magic? I thought the second phase would come out. Turns out it hasn't. He's still using Lance Apothecary, or whatever it's called. Uh, he's using Dispel again. Maybe now he's moved into his next phase. We will see. Hey, Stegger. Once again, it's, he's always going to Dispel it. I'm just going to keep on using it. And, aha, this is now the second phase, because he's used Reflect. And we want to get that off of him immediately, because he starts using Flare. But, if we can Dispel it... then that means he can no longer use Flare on himself, and instead he'll actually be damaging himself, which is uh, which is exactly what we want. So here we go, he uses Flare, hurts himself, silly silly boy. Now he's glowing up and he's ready to annihilate, and I'm like, ooh, I cannot remember what this attack does, I just know it's going to be powerful. Fiesta, glow, and charge up for it, it's probably going to be pretty powerful, so let's just wait and see. His defense has also increased with that, so I'm like, ah, something scary is going to happen, but I'm like, I think we can take it, you know. Another Reflect comes out, we're just going to dispel it immediately. I'm using these three because Kimari can keep putting haste on us, Yuna has damage, and Tidus can heal and use Dispel and things like that. I switch into Waka because I can see that our physical damage isn't doing very much. Now I'm just waiting, I'm getting out some stronger characters here because I'm like, he's going to do a big attack. So let's get out my strong boys. I've got Auron and I've got Yuna. Walker's not very strong, but yeah, let's see what this does. So we're taking a lot of damage. Walker goes down to be expected. And then everyone dies. And yeah, that's our third game over we've had. And uh, this is the first actual game over that we've had that's been a proper fight. So let's go through this annoying cutscene again and try for a second time. So I'm not going to go into this fight too much. The difference we make in this fight is that we give protect to everyone before total annihilation comes out. So here we go, total annihilation comes out and protect isn't doing anything, it's uh, magic damage. So yeah, same thing happens, we die for the second time against Seymour. So, it's time to watch that cutscene one more time, ladies and gentlemen. Here we go. Third time's the charm, right? So on our third attempt, we give Shell to everyone and then Total Annihilation comes out. And yes, as you can see there, Shell is doing its thing. We are taking way less damage. Everybody survives pretty well, except for Tidus, of course, because Tidus sucks. Hey, what's a big idea? Yeah, so now I can show you the rest of the fight. So he continues using Flare on himself because he's a big fat dum dum. And yeah, we are looking rather healthy. I know that we can survive total annihilation if it comes out again, as long as we have Shell on us. So yeah, I'm just going with Kamari to raise our stats using Cheer. And it's just that point in the fight where it's attack constantly. So you can see here, he's glowing again. It's time for another total annihilation, but we survived the last one. We'll survive again. Shell is still on us, so we're looking healthy. I go ahead and give Kamari Shell. I'm just looking for the light curtains. Um, 
I believe that's what I'm doing. Nope, I used a silence grenade. Don't know why. I used a silence grenade there. So, um, yeah. Oh, he doesn't even get the, t the second total annihilation out. Perfect. He just dies. He just goes down. And yeah, that took a very long time because obviously I had to retry the fight three times and have to watch that cutscene three times, which is really long. But yeah, I feel you, Tidus. I I'm, I'm tired too. I get it. All right. And stay up there. We're nearly at the home stretch now, but before we continue, we learn that Tidus is a dream or something. I'm not really sure. They don't make it very obvious. Wait. Wait. This is a dream. A dream? A dreaming. Dreaming. You are a dream. Dreams. Dreams? Yes. You're a dream of dreams. Dreaming? So what if I'm a dreamer? Dreaming. Dreams. You are the dream that will end our dreaming. What happened? I was dreaming. Now that we're in the cave in Mount Gagazet, it's time to show you this fight here. So this big flying eye monster is probably the monster with the highest evasion in the entire game. I could be wrong. Of all the normal enemies, I do feel like this one has the highest evasion. And uh, it also happens to be resistant to magic. So that makes it very hard for us because Lulu has the highest accuracy of any of our characters. And I think Waka is sort of on par with her and she can't hit it and Waka can't really hit it. So you'll see how much trouble we have with this particular fight. Um, the other little enemy here, the Jewel Horn, he's, he's, he's quite easy to beat. You know, he's uh, fairly weak. His, you know, flame ball attack does not a lot of damage at all. And uh, he's weak to piercing. And yeah, he goes down quite easy. And this guy doesn't hurt us too much. He can cause confusion, which is a bit annoying. Aside from that, it's like not a tough enemy. It's just made really tough by the fact that we can't hit it. And the hits we can do on it by using magic does barely anything. So um, yeah, this is where aim comes in handy. I'm not sure if I use it in this fight or not. We'll soon see. But yeah, Lulu, as you can see, is missing. He then confuses us. I'm like, ugh, okay, we gotta cure the confusion off of her. We've also gotta give her haste so that she can get more turns in and just hope and pray for the best. I test out some magic here with Riku, and 149 damage is very, very bad. It's not going to do anything to this guy. So I go ahead and use some Abed potions to heal us back up again and go ahead. Come on, Lulu, you can do it! And no, she can't do it. And I'm like, ah, why is this so long? Let's try Waka. Here we go. Ah, Waka missed as well. Okay, uh, what do I do? What do I do? I have to use aim, really. I hope I do eventually start to use aim because um, otherwise I look very silly. Nope, I'm just going to keep attacking because I'm like, at this point, I might as well. Uh, something I didn't realize is that luck can also increase your chances of hitting an enemy with high evasion. So I've given quite a few luck spheres to Auron just because it felt like a thief thing to have high luck. So I should have really been using Auron to uh, attack this guy because, um, yeah, he just has a higher chance. Ah, here we go. Yeah, I'm using aim. So that that's really good. Oh, we got a hit, but it was with Waka, whose damage is terrible. So that means absolutely nothing. We're going to keep on getting confused. Auron keeps missing. Lulu keeps missing. I'm like, I, I should probably cure the uh, confusion off of Waka, but like, what's the point? Ah, oh, finally, Oren gets him down. So that's probably that luck stat that Oren has, which uh, got us through that. Now you can see we've got to complete these little trials and I actually get this first time, which I was pretty proud of. So uh, yeah, look at that, first time. Uh, and then we swim into these little colorful bum holes that represent each character. Wok has the big fat bum hole, of course, because he's a big fat bum hole. And yeah, we can continue on to the next boss fight. Now, Riku has actually managed to go to everybody's sphere grid and learn their basic skills. So I'm going to use a friend sphere and get her to where Lulu is. Because Lulu is at the end of Waka's sphere grid. So Waka has a lot of magic and strength and HP nodes in his grid. And I really want that for Riku. I want her magic and strength to be really high, sort of like how a red mage is. And since she's learned a technique from every single sphere grid, I'm just going to set her onto Waka's path now. So Riku is becoming like a secondary Waka within her red mage sort of role because I've run out of spaces for her to go to. Now I'm just showing you the end of this fight against the Yeti because it picks up a red drop, which you will see in a second is called the Raging Cacti. And I'm like, oh, okay, what's that? So I go on to Lulu and check out this Raging Cacti. And it actually has counter-attack, which is so cool because when would you ever see counter-attack on someone like Lulu? So that's cool. She's got high strength anyway. So that counter-attack is going to be pretty handy. And now let's move on to the big dragon beast 
fight that protects Zanakend or something. Yeah. As always, we're going to get Hastegger out straight away with Kimari, which is awesome. This guy doesn't have any way to get rid of our haste, so that will stay on for the whole fight. He's also really weak to armor break, so we make sure we get that off. And then, yeah, this, this attack here, it, it's kind of like bad breath in the sense that it gives us loads of status ailments. But luckily, Yuna doesn't fall asleep, so she can swap out into Tidus, and Tidus can use Ezuna on all the party members that are asleep. And yeah. Uh, as you can see here, he goes to swipe Lulu, but he misses, and yeah, check it out, Cactar does his little counter-attack, and that's so cool. That is the first counter-attack weapon we've got on a useful character. We have counter-attack weapons for Waka and Tidus, but they are terrible at, you know, doing physical damage, so there's no point in using it. I tried Triple Foul here, which uh, Rika has learnt from Waka's grid, and it does nothing, he's not weak to blind or anything like that. Yuna's pretty powerful, as you can see she's doing over 5000 damage which is way more than any other character so yeah I, it's really cool now that she's uh, properly into Auron's grid and has become this mega mega strong character. Lulu's not too bad either but there's no comparing to Yuna, she is just next level. Yeah the mana beam attack does a lot of damage, poor Kimari, he is, he's got very low defenses so uh, he goes down quite badly. I think it's magic defense that he lacks and uh, that's why it did so much damage to him because it's a magic based attack. He can cast protect on himself so we make sure we get rid of that straight away with Tidus. Yeah keeping our characters all healed up with our uh, secondary white maid which is Auron and Riku because they can use those really cool Albed potions. Yeah, Kiraga does 999 healing, which is so annoying because it's like, what was the point in me doing all that damage if he's just going to cure it all back up again? But um, yeah, you can see armor break wears off there, so I make sure to get that back on him again. And now our attacks are doing some good damage to him again. Yeah, here we go again. Lulu's counter attack coming in handy, getting an extra 2000 damage in when it's not even her turn. Making sure people have haste to get the fight done quicker. Um, yeah, this, this fight didn't take too much problems, you know, it was a nice and easy one. We're also getting a few lucky misses, which is nice. Our evasion must be pretty good. And these are our strong characters, Auron, Lulu, and Yuna. They've got good strength, good speed, good evasion, good defenses, good HP. Like, yeah, powerful, powerful stuff going on here. Uh, this fight is never usually too big a problem. The, the gimmick of this is that everyone gets cursed, so they can't use overdrives, but... We're not even using overdrives anyway. Oh yeah, you can see there, Lulu actually survived that mana breath attack, which is awesome. She's uh, got some good defenses on her. Uh, not much to report on with that fight. Big old dragon goes down. We can continue on towards Zanakind and uh, get towards the end of the game. You remind me of myself. We get some really cool character development here from Auron. And I haven't really spoken too much about Auron, besides the fact that he's awesome, but... I love his character so much. Yuna and Auron and Tidus are by far the most developed characters of this game. It really is about those three. And you get this sense that Auron is sort of like this beaten down old soldier who had so much life in him, had so much hope for the world, and then it was crushed when he saw the truth behind Yevon and Spira, you know? Legendary guardian. I was just a boy. A boy about your age, actually. I wanted to change the world too. But I changed nothing. I think he looks at Tidus and sees a lot of himself in him. He can see history repeating itself and he's determined to make sure that doesn't happen. But he doesn't help everyone straight away. He gives them the freedom to make their own choices and realise the mistakes by themselves. And I just think that's a very admirable trait. I just think oren has got a lot of mystery around him and he's just very cool. We, we see a lot of his personality here in this scene. I want to share something I found very entertaining. So when Lulu counterattacks when it's against her own party member, she just bitch slaps him right in the face. So that's pretty cool, that's something you might not have ever known before. So we do some leveling and Yuna and Lulu have both made it to the end of their sphere grids. And Riku now is also at the end of the sphere grid. So what I do now is I use Lulu 
to friend sphere over to Yuna, then I use Yuna to friend sphere over to where Riku is, since she is also at the end of Waka's sphere grid. So now Lulu and Yuna have essentially swapped sphere grids with each other. We've got a lot to get through in this episode, so I'm just going to go straight past the Cloister of Trials and show you this boss fight against another giant wormy dragon thing. Much like Evre, but this one's a little less cool. But it's definitely a lot more dangerous and the gimmick of this guy is that everyone is on these little glyph thingamabobs and he can make them flash and then after a few times they explode and you instantly die no matter how much HP you have it just causes death. Yeah he also counter attacks after every single hit with that move where he hits absolutely everyone for massive damage. So uh, yeah this is actually quite a scary fight. I often forget this boss battle exists uh, mainly because the next boss battle against Unalesco is quite, a, quite an iconic bit of the story and uh, an iconic fight in general. So as you can see there he uses Berserk Tail to make us berserk and the camera just lingers on for a very long time. I think it's to like show that they are berserk because of all the flashing lights here. The game being like, just so you know, you are berserked. Um, so that's really nice. And yeah, every single hit we get a counter attack. But depending on where we are, can actually affect if it gets us or not. So we can move our party members around to make sure we don't get hit by the counter attack. And to make sure that we don't get hit by the glyphs as well. And um, yeah, this is quite a cool fight actually. It's got a lot of tactic to it compared to a lot of other fights. There's uh, much more to do because of how you move. And there's one thing I will pride this game on is that the boss battles in this game all have very different ways to defeat them. They take the basic structure of what the battle system is and give you little mechanics that are unique to each fight, you know, whether it's moving the airship backwards and forwards, moving your party members around, or, or like the chocobo eater where you have to push him off the edge. It, it's really cool, it keeps the game exciting and fun and uh, adds a little twist to it. I, I think this game's brilliant. How it can do so much with a relatively simple system, it's like complicated but so easy to pick up and learn, you know? And yeah, as you can see here, the glyphs are glowing, which means it is about to blow up and it does so on Auron, who's already dead, so it doesn't even matter really. He just, uh, he just dies twice, which isn't a thing, but. Now, I left Yuna in Berserk because she's a highest damage dealer and Berserk increases your strength even though it forces you to attack. I thought, well, if anyone's going to attack, it's going to be Yuna. But uh, you can see mistakes were made because uh, Yuna is the last one standing and she can't do anything, so she dies. And that's like, what, the fifth death? I I've lost count at this point. There's been a lot of deaths in this video, but it's the point in the game where things are getting tricky. So let's try that one again. Okay, so this time around, I'm going to make sure that I'm setting up correctly, getting protect on everyone because this guy only ever does physical damage and making sure everyone's got haste and only attacking when we know we can survive the counter attack. And another thing is making sure we do not have any berserked party members because berserk, as we've seen, can cause a lot of problems. Even though it increases our strength, you don't want to automatically be attacking this guy. You really want to pick and choose when you attack him to make sure you know you can survive. So, with the characters that aren't very strong, mainly Auron, Yuna, and Lulu, those are the three that I want to use in this battle. So the rest of them, I'm just getting them out and defending so that they've all got a turn and they can get the experience, but I'm not playing around with them. And yeah, we're getting out people like Kimari to cast haste on people, which is cool. And Auron actually kind of becomes the MVP of this fight because he can just do the most. Yuna also, Yuna's alchemy comes in handy with this battle as well. Auron's good because he can cast haste on people, he can cast protect on people with his use technique using light curtains, and he can also use albed potions. Lulu comes in handy in this fight because she has counter attacks. So you got alchemy plus Auron's techniques plus Lulu's counter attack, and that makes this fight go a lot smoother. These three are really, um, really strong. We get into a bit of a pickle here where we need to be reviving people. And as you can see, because of Yuna's alchemy there, Auron actually gets revived to full health with the Phoenix down, which is really cool. But yeah, we need to be reviving people, but we also need to be curing Berserk off of people. And it's like this sort of battle between, I need to get this many turns in to make sure that they're not berserk but then this person dies and we have one berserk so it's just a case of reviving and then healing berserk i feel like reviving is more important than getting rid of berserk because obviously if everyone dies then that's still good
So luckily he went for Lulu there because she was berserked and now she's dead. Which means that all three party members are now alive after that Phoenix down. Two of them are on full health. Yuna is now giving herself high potion so she's nearly on full health. And this is the point where we've stabilized. We've got three party members that are alive. We can now start casting haste on them, protect on them and curing berserk whenever it comes out. The counter attack as you can see there, super powerful. Uh, Lulu gets berserked but it's nice that she can counter attack and not cause their counter attack. It would be nice to have Kimari in this because Kimari can use haste stagger at this point but Kimari doesn't have the use technique so he's just not as useful. Warren's agility is also really high which is handy as well which means he gets a lot of turns in to do his special stuff and yeah from now on the fight becomes pretty easy because we're all set up, we've got protect, we've got haste, we can cure berserk whenever we need, we've got Yuna with her alchemy to revive people to full health again, things are looking good. I would like to get alchemy on Auron just so that his albed potions do 2000 healing instead, but I just haven't found the correct armour to put it on or one that already has it on, so for now what we've got is fine you know. Uh, and yeah, I won't show you much of the rest of the fight because it just sort of goes like this. We're, we're set up now and it just becomes a case of healing when we take damage, uh, doing damage whenever we can, and moving around the board to avoid getting blown up. And yeah, that is the Guardian Worm fight. You must choose the one whom I will change to become the faith of the final summoning. <gasps> so this is the part where we find out that Yuna has to sacrifice not only herself but one of her guardians to become the final Aeon. And this is where the party all decide together that no, we are not having it Yuna Leska, we're going to fight you. And we get this cool speech from uh, Aurum which is like the most anime thing ever where it keeps cutting between each person and you hear everyone's reaction. This is it! Now is the time to choose. Die and be free of pain. Or live and fight your sorrow. Now is it's really, really cool. It's like, this is the moment where they're really going against the grain. They are really going against the Evan. And if they destroy Unaleska, then no one can ever get the final Aeon ever again. So it's like, whoa! It feels super epic. It feels super powerful. It feels like this is what we've been waiting for the entire game. This is like the badass moment where we see that our party ain't no joke. We are really going to do stuff that nobody has ever done before. And I love it! Yuna! This is our story. Now let's see this thing through together. Unileska is that story boss that you don't really forget when you play this game. She's super tough, it's another battle that has three phases much like a lot of the Seymour fights and it's just very cool you see her evolve throughout the fight from like this tiny little lady with like crazy medusa looking hair into like this giant crazy actual medusa head and um yeah it's very cool i mean this fight you usually get a game over on because if you aren't aware she uses hellbiter which inflicts zombie onto people and then you automatically assume to get rid of the zombie right but if you do get rid of the zombie she will use mega death and if your party members are not inflicted with zombie then they will die and how are you to know this your first time around if you do know that then this fight isn't actually that hard her normal attacks do very little damage like 100 to 200 damage which is like peasy right that being said she still does a lot and she has a lot of hp and there are still some pretty tough moves we have to deal with yeah she will automatically counter attack quite a lot with uh, some status ailments luckily for us Oren has that auto med so he will definitely be out if you attack her with magical damage she will counter with silence and if you attack her with physical damage she will counter with blind You can see there she absorbed some of our HP but it's not too big of an issue. This first phase really ain't nothing too special. It's just her countering us every time we hit her which is like slightly annoying because we have to cure off the status ailments but it's not actually that hard. She does however get a little bit harder when it comes to her second phase which we're about to see in a second. So Orin is just healing us up and uh, now Yuna is ready to give her the final blow. 
she now emerges from the ground and it's like whoa what's gonna happen and she just like grows tentacles because of course why would why would there not be tentacles we you know it's final fantasy they love a tentacle monster oh and look she summons tentacles out from the ground which hits everyone so as you can see now everybody is in zombie form and this is where you could go wrong in this fight do not cure zombie off of everyone you want to have at least one party member without zombie or with zombie sorry you need one party member with zombie because that way you can survive her mega death attack which comes out in the third phase so yeah she puts zombie on you and then she uses cure on you so like you know obviously you're gonna think oh i don't want to be healed to death so i'll get rid of zombie no don't do that she's a she's a lie that's that's a oh you know what that's kind of deep maybe this boss fight is trying to teach you that like everything you see isn't exactly as it seems which is kind of like Unileska herself and Yevon you know what I mean so like the fact that zombie is seen as a negative status ailment but then becomes a positive one later is kind of like how Yevon is supposed to be like holy but is actually super evil and stuff whoa that's that's like mad I've literally just thought of that right now um I'm very tired this this <laughs> this video is so long <laughs> Um, yeah, you can see we're using haste a lot on all of our people. These three are the three that I'm using because uh, Yuna's strong, Oren's got that auto med, Kamari can haste. Um, I guess that's why I'm using these three. He's also pretty strong now, Kamari. Kamari's strength has gotten up there. Titus's grid kind of starts off a bit like crappy, but as it gets towards the end and you learn haste dagger and he gets more HP nodes and strength nodes and agility nodes, he, he becomes super powerful, so that's cool. Hellbiter coming out again, giving a zombie like that even matters. Oren obviously automatically cures his zombie off, so that's cool. You know that he's never going to be zombie for too long. Um, ah, and then he, the final blow comes out, and we now reach the third phase, which is like super ultra Medusa evil phase. And yeah, here comes Mega Death. So as you can see, everybody is getting deft, but only Oren dies because he's the only one who is not a zombie. And yeah, Kimari and Yuna survive it, but what's annoying about zombie is the fact that obviously you can't heal yourself, so you need to have a party member that's zombied, uh, but she does so much little chip damage to you over time that it actually starts to add up, and like Yuna has been zombied for like most of this fight now, and I can't do anything about it, like I can't get her health back up, I just have to either wait for her to die, or just leave her on low HP, but luckily being on low HP isn't too big a deal, because you know, 200 damage you saw there 86 damage with protect it's like fine medusa is using kiraga quite a lot but only on Oren, who isn't a zombie which is like cool keep at it love you know maybe i would have had a harder time with this fight if the rng would have been worse but i feel that about a lot of fights in this game like i've just gotten very lucky a lot of times in this game and uh hey i will take it i think like my playstation likes to take pity on me like you can see that I'm struggling and that I don't really do everything the correct way. So it's like, you know what, we'll give you this. We'll just let you have an easy time. And hey, I ain't complaining. The rest of the fight goes as followed. They use Hellbiter once again. And Yuna manages to survive with 13 HP. And I'm like, yes, Yuna, hang in there. I ain't curing your zombie off of you just yet. Oren is being the Healy man that he is. And Yuna, I think I decided to use a Holy War. Yeah, because I'm like, it's getting to the point where she's literally about to die. I think I have to, you know, I have to give her some health. And hopefully Hellbiter comes out again before Megadeth does. But uh, I'm not too sure if that happens. Oh, here it is. Megadeth comes out once again. And now two party members are going to die. But that's cool. Kamari don't give a f He's like, he's chilling. And, oh, we use a Mega Phoenix. <laughs> That was very silly. I used a Mega Phoenix deck, so I was like, oh yeah, I'll get both of them up. But it obviously kills Kamari in the process, so that was me being a dum-dum. And now we only have one party member that's not a zombie again, so that's a bit silly. Yeah, let's let's revive Kimari. He needs to come back in this, and then Hellbiter comes out again, which is perfect. Now we have two party members that are zombied and one who is not, thanks to Auron's auto med. And that's kind of the best way to play it, I think. Having two party members with zombie is just better because having two party members alive after mega death is just easier for you to, you know, get back into the game again and not get a game over. Which it looks like isn't going to happen in this fight, you know? It all went pretty well. And yeah, like I said, this boss fight is like sort of hard, only if you don't know what she does. The confusion could be quite annoying. I suppose if everyone gets confused as well from Mind Blast, that could uh 
increase your chances of game over. But as soon as you know the gimmick behind this one, it's annoying, like you kind of have to play her at least once to know what she does in order to not get a game over. So like most times on your first playthrough, you will get a game over with her and you'll have to watch that cutscene again. And it's even longer than the Seymour one that we had to retry. But luckily we do not have to watch that cutscene again because we are getting towards the end of the fight here. I do one more cheer, Yuna attacks her and then she is dead. And that is us done for this part of the series. And next week we're going to take a little break from the main story and do the episode where we find out if we can win a league of Blitzball using only goalkeepers. So we now have access to the airship again and can fly around all of Spira and we're going to pick up our final goalkeeper. After that it will be the final part of this series where we defeat Sin and then defeat Braska's final Aeon. Maybe we do, maybe we don't, who knows? Wait and find out. But yeah. Hope you guys enjoy. My name's been Jamzak. Can you win a League of Blitzball in Final Fantasy X by using only goalkeepers? We've searched far and wide throughout Spira, all faces of the planet, to find every single goalkeeper we can muster up. And now it's finally time to visit Luca and get our final goalkeeper, Jamal. This is actually a special episode in a much longer running series where we see if we can beat Final Fantasy X by swapping jobs with another character. And if you want to check that out, just follow the links in the description or I will post them at the end of this video or just look around, click on my channel, you'll be able to find them. But um, it's really good fun, so I highly recommend you check out those videos before or after you've watched this one. Without further ado though, let's get into this challenge. So the rules are pretty simple, I'm not going to go too deep into it. If the character has really high catch and is supposed to be a goalkeeper, he or she will be used in our team and we can use no one else. I'm banning a player named Wedge though, because although towards the end of the game he becomes a really good goalkeeper, at the start of the game he's so OP and he is a really, really good striker, so it'd be way too easy to score goals. So um, yeah, I'll, I'll get into the first game here against the Ronzo Fangs, and I'll show you the team and where we decide to put everyone. We'll start off with Yuma Guado, who we're putting in left field, but we do actually change this in the second game, but for now we've put him in left field because he has four strike which is actually really powerful for a goalkeeper most of the other goalkeepers as you will see do not have very high shot and we need to score goals because otherwise we can't win so that is why Yuma is in left field for now but we'll see we'll change that soon next up our right forward is going to be Jamal and I just realized I called it a left field I meant left forward I don't do sports the RF which I believe is probably right forward, that makes more sense. We're gonna put Jamal, and Jamal is probably our worst character. He sucks, he really does suck. One attack and one shot. The only thing you really need to do in this game is tackle the other players so that they can't score and score yourself. Uh, Jamal can do neither of these, so he's just terrible. So we only need one character to score, so the other character in right forward is just there. Jamal is just there to take up space because we need to have six players, so. Sorry about Jamal, but you suck absolute ass. Somebody who doesn't suck ass though is our star player Q or Kyo, who, however the f*** you say it, like, I don't know what the developers were thinking when they decided to name the Blitzball characters, but I swear to god they're just putting layers together that aren't supposed to be together. Like, a K and then a Y and then an O and a U, like, how are you supposed to say that? And the Q is not the only one. I'm gonna call him Q, because it just sounds cute, like Q. Q is not the only one, there are several that have very weird names that I've no idea how to pronounce. Many of the Guados, like Auda Guado and the Gira Guado, like how are you supposed to say these? I don't know. Q is actually a really good player, he's got 15 attack, 8 pass, 9 endurance, like he's, and 63 speed, that's really really good. He ends up being one of our best players, without him this run may not be possible. I'm feeling a lot more confident knowing that someone like Q is on our team, he makes a great defender and I put him in midfield because of his high speed it means he can get around the sphere quite a lot and the midfielder kind of needs to be everywhere so Q is just sort of that guy who will always be in the enemy team's face so uh, yeah big up Q, he's sick. Now another player who made this run a joy to play was Mayu. Miyu, I'm gonna say Mayu, we're going with Mayu. 
Uh, and again, she's quite similar to Q in the sense that she's got really high attack, really good endurance, and she's got four shots, so her along with Yuma are the only two that could possibly ever really score a goal. Because everybody else has like two shot, one shot. But Mayu here is sitting pretty with four. Yeah, without Mayu, you'll, you'll come to see later, I, I move her position, and um, I don't think this run would be anywhere near possible without Mayu. So, um... Once again, bigger up. She is an absolute joy to work with. I'm treating her like she's a colleague. I'm literally just playing a game, but she, she she's good. She's one of the really good players uh, amongst these terrible, terrible goalkeepers. See, the thing is with goalkeepers is their stats don't increase like all the other players. Every time they level up, their catch will grow, but nothing else really will. But Mayu and Q can sort of be used outside as defenders, so their stats do increase a little bit more than the others. Every other goalkeeper we have does not develop very much. Yeah, we will be relying on Mayu and Q quite a lot in this. Next up is our right defender, which we have put Durin. And Durin is also pretty bad. He's kind of similar to Jamal, but a little less useless. Uh, he actually has pretty good block, which uh, is good for a defender because it means that they can catch the ball if they don't break to them. But his attack is terrible, and if you're a defender, you need to be able to attack. And he can't do that, but there's nowhere else to put him. And defense is very important. I didn't want to put Jamal's one attack in defense. And I could have put Q in there because Q has really high attack, but who would I put in midfield? I'd have to put Darren in midfield and look at his stats. Like, what is he going to do in midfield, you know? Your midfielder needs to be a strong player, and Darren isn't. So we just got to hope people don't go towards the right-hand side, because Darren here won't be doing much. Uh, his block does actually increase quite a bit as he levels up, which is quite cool. So on the odd chance that they don't break for Darren, he has a good chance of stopping the ball when uh, they shoot and catching it. So Darren's not terrible, but... He's definitely no Mayu or Q. Yeah, let's go on to our goalkeeper now, which is the OG goalkeeper himself. It's even in his name. It's the one and only, it's your boy, Keeper, whose stats are so bad. Like, look at that. Everything is below five. Even his speed is terrible. Keeper has actually got the lowest catch of all the goalkeepers that we have. It would make sense to not put him in goal, but let's make it even more challenging. We're going to put Keeper in goal. So we've got terrible stats in goal and on the field. So it makes this as challenging as humanly possible. But now let's head into our first game. And as you can see here, Q actually already has an ability he can use. So we go ahead and give him elite defense because his attack is very high as it is. And elite defense just makes it so that he can reach targets a lot easier and uh, start a break from much further away. So the first thing you want to do as you start a Blitzball game is change to manual mode because that means we can take people wherever we want. You know, if it's on automatic, they just start going forward and it's very tricky. Whereas when it's in manual, you can choose where they swim to. And yeah, nothing much really happens in this first half here. I'm just literally passing the ball around. I'm not going to show you the whole game of what happens, just the key moments. And we're just passing around to try get some stats. And um, yeah. As you can see, we level up quite a bit and we move on to the second half. And this is where I want to try and score. So Gazna here has a lot of endurance and we cannot get through that. So here we are running into some trouble. Our defenders cannot get through 17 endurance. So Basic here, the Basic ass Ronzo, uh, decides to go for a shot. But he goes for a shot very far away. So I'm like, okay, we can catch this. Come on, keeper. He does have spin ball, and it goes through. Yeah, this is going to be tricky, because as soon as they get the ball, there's nothing we can do. Luckily, Q and Mayu here managed to break, but he doesn't break Mayu, and Mayu has terrible block. So, luckily he goes for a pass instead of a shot, and we get it on Durin. But can Durin even keep hold of the ball? Uh, he breaks to Basic, he keeps hold of it, and five passing isn't that bad. So, we pass it to Jamal. And uh, Jamal decides to pass it over to Yuma and we just continue passing it around until the time is up because we can't really score yet. Our shot is way too low. We need to learn some techniques first to uh, be able to actually score goals and win games. So yeah, that's the first game. We lose 1-0. 
but it's the first game, you know, we, we need to level up, we need to overpower, we need to grind. Now, moving on to our next game against our mortal enemies, the Luka Goers, and this is where I decided to swap Mayu and Yuma around, and the reason for this is because Mayu actually has an ability called Napshot, which is the only reason this run is possible. Seriously, Napshot is pretty overpowered and it means that no matter how low our shot is we can put the goalkeeper to sleep and score from there because if the goalkeeper is asleep if we shoot at the goal and as long as our shot doesn't reach zero it will always score so that makes Mayu the one that we need to get the ball to and to be honest Mayu and Q are the only two characters we really need Yuma is actually not too bad as a defender as well. I think he learns with a tackle, or she, I actually don't know what their gender is. Um, but Yuma learns with a tackle and things like that, so they make a pretty good defender. And yeah, it just made sense to switch them. Even though Mayu's um, attack is so high and you'd like want her to be at the back to defend, she's the only way we can score, so we, we gotta get Mayu up there. And as you can see here, I'm going to go and test this out. So I tackle both of these and go for nap shot. And let's see if she has enough endurance. She does not. So there is that part. She does have really high endurance. And uh, the more she levels up, the more that increases. So she becomes like the perfect striker. Even though her shot is so low, she like really is the only one who can score goals. And uh, it's awesome. But yeah, Abbas here goes for a shot. And the keeper's catch is just so bad that every shot is so terrifying. And, of course, they score. And that's us losing 1-0. So this is the second game now where we are losing. And we want to win the league. So we can't have this. We don't want to lose anymore. I get Q to sort of swim around a bit to kind of jumble the team up a bit. So Maya has a, a clearer path to get to the goal. That's all we're going to be doing in games. Is making sure we are getting the ball to Mayu. And using Q to sort of disorientate the other players, get them to swim towards him to clear a path for her. And I go for a nap shot here. Surprisingly, it goes through. And I'm like, yes, Mayu, go ahead, gal. I was expecting the, sh the nap to come out and put the goalkeeper to sleep, but we just score anyway. And yeah, they're going for shots and they ain't scoring. And uh, as you can see, they're going for another shot here. I'm just skipping to like the, the good parts of it. And this one is scary, but we have 10 seconds left on the time. And I'm like, ah, come on, keeper. <gasps> and luckily he blocks it and it just about hits half time. So second half now, we're drawing 1-1 one, one, and I'm like, okay, this is a tense game. These are our arch nemesis. The Luka Goers are the bullies of Final Fantasy X and we can't let them win, right? Because they're, they're evil, they're horrible. You know, they, they, they said that we were idiots on a boat and it made me really sad. Oh, right. You're that idiot. I don't want to lose to them right so here we go Mayu's got the ball and I'm thinking come on you got this we've got three people on us that's fine one of them only has one block we just need to protect against two of them and yeah that's not happening Doram uh, just rams into us and destroys us and luckily she's got terrible endurance so we can hopefully get the ball off of her again and the Luka goers aren't actually that tough they're one of the weaker teams you know, I think the ones we have the most problems against are the Guado Glories and uh, another team that is very hard, which we will get to very soon. And uh, yeah, so I thought that Q's uh, speed would be enough to sort of outswim them all. So I get the entire team on them and I'm like, come on, he's got 63 speed. Surely he can just like outswim them all. Uh, but it's not happening. So I have the entire team against me here and I'm like cool let's just pass it to Mayu hope for the best oh we got a miss and a block and obviously they catch the ball but now they're all together so that's a uh, that's a thing they're a bit scrambled up I guess and um, Grav has really high pass so most of our players block is terrible that's one of the weakest stats of all of our players like besides Darren Darren's got pretty good block but everyone else terrible block so here comes a shot from really far away and I'm like, that can't go in. He's so far away and it goes in. <sighs> he was literally like behind the halfway point, but he still managed to score. So I'm like, okay, I'm just going to try to get a nap out. Come on, Mayu. We're nowhere near the goal, but surely we can just get a nap. And of course we don't. And time is running out and it looks like we're about to lose. And I'm like, no, we've lost against the goers. 
And uh, yeah, that's time up. Hopefully we can get our revenge in another game, but now it's time to go against the Guado Glories. And as mentioned before, these are quite a problematic team to go against. And their stats aren't that great, they just have really high speed. So every single Blitzball team has their own like gimmick, like their own like standout stat that other team members don't have. So like the Ronsos have really high endurance, and the Albert Sykes seem to have a very good everything. But uh, the Guado's thing is that they have really high speed. And that's a problem because they can just outswim us and our defenders can't do anything and they can score. Because even when our defenders can catch them, they are really bad. And we need to get Q to be able to uh, tackle most of them. And if Q can't catch any of them, then as soon as they get the ball, they keep the ball, they score. So yeah, as you can see here, we are going for nap shot and um, oh okay, Noiguado had already been napped. I missed that. I wasn't looking at the screen. Yeah, we napped the 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 the, the goalkeeper and then we scored and we're winning one nil. So although this team seems quite problematic, we're doing really well. And Q has learned an extra technique, so now he has two techniques he can use. And um, yeah, he's he's one of the only characters, as you can see, who actually increases in stats. Everyone else gets more HP, and that's it. So leveling up and grinding doesn't even really do much. It just gives you more technique slots and more HP to use those techniques. And yeah, let's go into the second half here now. So here is Navguado. He is uh, not very good, but he's got really good pass and... Um, that means that he can get it over to Gira, who is, look how quick he is. How are we supposed to catch that? Even our own Guado. Oh, okay, he does manage to get to him. But like, five attack ain't do enough. He's really close to the goal. He goes for a shot. Of course he scores. So there goes that win that we were securing. The lead has now gone and it's back to a draw. And I'm like, ugh. If only we had like kept the ball, we could have just passed it between us. I don't do that hack in this where you sort of hide behind the back of the goal and the time just runs out and nobody goes towards you. I don't do that because I want it to be legit. So even though we were winning just now, I would have just tried to have kept the ball on us and uh, not allowed them to get it. I wasn't just going to hide behind goal. So here comes Mayu. She beats off three people. Watch your profanity. So she's looking well good. She just like lets them kick her in the face and then she's like, I don't give a f I'm just going to go for a shot. She's really close to the goal and we don't get the nap off and we don't score. And that's fine. We're only a minute and a half in. We still got time. So Zazie now has the ball and these two are just showing off now. Like they just decide to continuously pass it to each other backwards and forwards several times from really, really far away. Just draining the time, even though they're drawing. And I'm like, okay, one of them's going to start swimming. Nope. We're going to pause again, and we're going to pass it all the way back to the other side of the sphere again. And I'm like, what the f*** are they doing? Why are they doing this? Why are they programmed to do this? Oh, he's breaking. He's going for another pass. Like, what? why are they programmed to do that? I don't get it. Um, finally, Zazie decides to move and go for a shot. And I'm like, eek, 16 shot. That's a lot. Come on, keep it. Uh, that's 2-1. Um... This, this is a really hard challenge. Harder than, like, the actual run I've been doing. The actual run I've been doing is very easy, I'll be honest. This, however, challenging. And Blitzball isn't that fun. <laughs> so it, it adds an extra layer because it's not even that enjoyable to play. Um, but here we go. We got Mayu. We can maybe scrape a drawback. So here we go. Yes, we go for a shot. We get a goal. 2-2. Two, two. I'm happy with that. A draw is better than a loss, you know? And at this rate, um, you know... Oh, another thing I just noticed, Alda and Yuma, same people. Look at that. Did you see that? Yuma and Alda, same person. They just they just used the same model twice. Crazy. Yes, yeah, so we draw that one. That's pretty good. And now round four. Oh, God. No. Have mercy. Please. I don't think I can do it. I don't think I can do it. These Albed are so freaking hard. Like, Nimrook himself has, like, 18 catch, which is ridiculous. Like, we have to nap him to score a goal. There's no way that Mayu's puny seven shot is ever going to score against them. So we have to get lucky. And not only is Nimrook crazy, but the rest of the team is pretty nuts too. They've got really good blocks, so you have to break against them. Because they will almost always catch it off of you. The defenders have really high attack. The strikers have really high shot and endurance. 
So, like, what are you supposed to do? I mean, Beric isn't that good, but I mean, look at Beric's attack. What am I on about? Beric is really good. 11 attack on the midfielder is like, what? Why? And yeah, look at Eager here. 15 endurance and 15 shot. Like, all right, mate, we get it. You're really good. But Q's better, as you can see, because he just managed to take the ball off of him. So, um, yeah, Blapper here is not as good as Eager, but even though the pass is good, like, they're the strikers. Why is their pass at 10? Like, that's not cool. Eager's got 11 pass, like why? So yeah, I'm definitely scared of this, but we're almost three minutes in and there's been no goal, which is good, because usually they would have scored by now, so uh, we might be able to win, who knows? We might be able to win. We've got some pretty strong hitters with Mayu and Q, like as long as Mayu and Q are always around, we can, uh, we can get through it. And yeah, as you can see here, we're just trying to sort of stabilize any way we can, I'm just sort of Passing it around, trying to get it to uh, our strong players, and we're just not finding an opening. We're just not finding a way to get there. Passing it to Jamal, because I'm just trying to get him some experience, but that was a terrible idea. Why did I do that? Because Judda is obviously going to take the ball away, and now they have the ball. We're in trouble. We get passed to Blapper, and Blapper is on the side with Durren, so I'm like, oh god, we are screwed. Durren does nothing. He goes for a shot. Come on! Of course, Keeper doesn't catch it. Which sucks. So, the way the catch works in this game is that it's like a 50% chance to go above and below, if that makes sense. So, say someone has a 10 catch and somebody shoots the ball and there is 5 shot. Because that is 50% below, it still has a chance to go through, but if it was at 4, it wouldn't. So, Basically, there's a 50% window upwards and downwards as to whether you catch it or it goes through. So, you know, if uh, they have 15 shot and you have 10 catch, you can still catch the ball because it's within that 50% range. But 16 shot means there is absolutely no chance that you are catching the ball. Does that make sense? I don't know. I'm not very good at explaining things. I've not been paying attention and apparently they've scored, which is like obvious, and now they're going for another shot, which uh, means they're probably going to score again, and yep, of course they do. So we're losing 2-0, and this is looking like another loss. We are yet to win a single game. This is like our fourth game now, I think, and it's not looking too good for us. It's going to be very hard for us to win the league, but once we get more techniques and once we grind a bit more, it will get a little bit easier. The issue is we kind of have to win. If we don't win this league, we have to win the next league because then everyone else's stats will start to outgrow us. And we need to, uh, we need it to be early enough that the keepers are weak enough and the other players are weak enough so that we don't just get run over. So if we don't win this league and we don't win the next one, it's probably impossible. So I do pass a lot because like at this point it's 3-0, there's no way we're winning. I, I go for a nap shot here just to see what happens and uh, we actually get him asleep and I'm like, oh, okay, maybe to make things a little less embarrassing, we can at least score one goal. You know, at least if I say we scored one, I can say, hey, we're pretty sick. But that's if we can even get the ball off of them again. And they might score a fourth one. Who knows? Eager's got the ball. You know, it's very possible. And oh, he goes for a shot. Uh, let's see what happens here. Yes, keeper. See, I knew he could do it. I never doubted him for a single second. And here we go. We're going to break to Beric and we're going to pass it over to Mayu. Nimrok is already asleep, so we don't have to worry unless her shot goes below zero or gets to zero because she can't go below zero, obviously. And here we go. We got free shot. Yes, we score a goal. So we might not win this match, but hey, one goal against the hardest team ever. I can I can rest easy, but we need to start winning some games soon. You know, we may have lost the game, but at least we've got some levels and land with a tackle for Yuma Guado. And Q has even increased in his speed. And now it's time to fight the easiest team, the Killica Beasts. Now that Mayu's slots have increased, we can give her another skill. And she actually has quite a lot of good skills, including tackle slip. And that coupled with her really high endurance anyway, makes her a super good striker because tackle slip gives you a chance to dodge someone's attack and so that means that even if she is up against two defenders there is a chance that she will dodge one of their attacks and then take the other attack because she's got really high endurance so as you can see here labrit has got the ball 
uh, Larbate, sorry, not Labrit, Larbate. Uh, he's got the ball and he goes for a shot and I'm like, oh no, but Keeper saves it. And the Killica Beast, as you can see, their stats are really weak. You know, I was saying earlier that every team has their own like little thing they're good at, like whether it's speed or block or attack. The Killica Beasts are just bad at everything. So Albed Sykes, good at everything. Killica Beasts are like the opposite of that. They're just bad at everything. If for some reason you play Blitzball all the way up to like level 99, they're actually some of the stronger players ever. So they start off really weak and they get really strong. But who the f*** is playing Blitzball to level 99? Um, yeah, we get the nap out on Nizarat. Nizarat? Is it Nizarat? I don't know. I'm saying these names like I know how to say them, but I'm going to say Nizarat because that's what came to me. Uh, the goalkeeper has the lowest uh, catch, besides keeper, of course, of all the goalkeepers. So, um, oh, I thought this was Jamal's time to shine. I was like, go on, Jamal! And, of course, he gets tackled. But, um, yeah, it's, it's very possible that we can score a goal without even sending him to sleep. So, that's really nice. But Q gets the ball here, and I'm like, you know what, Q, you're such a good player. I'm going to let you score this one. So we take a hit from Vroja, <laughs> and then we get a goal. So it's 1-0, and we're looking good. I'm not worried about this match at all. This is like an easy win. Every time we're against the Killica Beast, we're fine. Oh, yeah, you can see there. Boom! Two dodges from Mayu. She's like, yeah, you ain't tackling me, mother d***er. Um... Yeah, she goes for a shot, and oh, we get super goalie, and uh, we miss. So yeah, super goalie can make goalkeepers a lot stronger, and obviously the more we play the games, the more likely it is that the goalkeepers have these techniques. So we do need to win a league pretty soon, because they're only going to get stronger. And there, look at that. We uh, we score another goal. We don't even get the nap off of them, We just we just get a goal. And they go for a, a shot here. We block it. You can see that Durham's block was real high there. You know, he's actually a pretty good defender if uh, if they don't break to him. And yeah, going up in some levels now. And Keeper learns super goalie. So Keeper's actually useful now, which is awesome. Uh, he can he can actually catch better. So uh, I, lo I love Keeper. He's, he's a good boy. And look, eight catch with super goalie. We're sitting pretty, right? Second half now, and we're already winning, so there's no point in trying to score again. I'm just passing it around between our players and trying to get with a tackle two off of Larbate because uh, it can actually be learned by Yuma, I think, or Q. We'll find out in a minute. So here Larbate goes for with a tackle two, and we get the tech copy. And yeah, Q now has with a tackle two, so that's really cool. After that, we just pass around again until time is up. Now, we are halfway through the league. We fought every single team once, and then we have to fight them all once more. And you can see there we're in fifth place with one win, three losses, and a tie. So we're going to have to get a lot of wins in these next five games if we want to win this league. I'm going to go through the next five games pretty quickly now that we know more about the team. So you can see here Yuma is tackling people super strong with that nine attack making her a pretty good defender and she even manages to take a tackle so Yuma's looking good uh, we then pass it over to Mayo we're against the Ronzo Fengs here and they're an easy team because you can outspeed them and we've already got Zamzi asleep and we get a goal making it 1-0 and nothing else really happens time's up next up we got a match against the Luka Goers and you can see here, we're going to break towards Doram, get a nice little cheeky dodge in there, go for the shot, and the goalkeeper is ready and doesn't stand a chance. That's 1-0 to us once again. We're looking good. Abbas then goes for a shot real close up, but keeper's got 15 catch with super goalie. We block it, catch the ball. Bixen goes for another shot, and yeah, keeper's doing really well now. He, uh, he With super goalie, he's actually not too bad at all. And um, yeah, that's the end of the game. We won 1-0. And as you can see there, Mayu now has five shots. So, hey, that's pretty good. That's one more shot than we had before. We might actually be doing pretty well now. Oh, that's not the end of the game. That was just the end of the first half. So, yeah, we're now going to go for another shot here. We're breaking against both of our defenders here. And hoping for a dodge. We get a dodge. And we're going for the shot now. Let's see if it will go in. And it does. That's 2-0 to us. We're actually doing really well. So that's two more wins under our belt. Now then, this next fight is against the Guado Glories and they have Wedge and Wedge is a broken player. This is the guy I was going to have on our team because he is technically a goalkeeper, but in the early stages, he is super strong as a striker. 
And yeah, luckily we catch the ball there. Mayu goes for a shot after Noi is asleep and we get a goal, making it 1-0. And that was very close. It was uh, almost half time. And yeah, Wedge has the ball again. He's very close and goes for another shot. And there's no way we're catching this one, right? So Keeper gets 18 catch from Super Goalie and we actually catch it. So even Wedge isn't any match for our team. And now it's time for the next fight. Oh, oh God, not again. Not again. <laughs> okay, we are a lot stronger this time, so maybe we stand a chance, but they are also a lot stronger. And as you can see here, we've got that wither tackle too, but it's not quite enough, and I'm like, oh god, scared. 15 block, come on keeper, you've done it before, you can do it again. Use that super goalie and catch it! And it goes through. And he only had 10 shot and we had 14 catch, it still goes in. So we go for a shot and of course Nimrick just catches it with his 19 catch which is crazy. But as you can see it is now on 5 minutes and that means the time is up so we actually lose this match 1-0. But that's fine we now have a match against the Killica Beast and we know that they're terrible so as you can see here we get a lovely dodge from Deem Dime and uh, we go for the shot and we win we score a goal. And I just wanted to show you this real quick. So Jamal is so bad that when he goes to tackle, Culliken doesn't have tackle slip. His, the tackle is just that low that she just dodges it. And um, yeah, we score another goal, 2-0. And this fight is easy. It always is. And uh, we win the match against the Killica Beasts. So this is the final ranking uh, after 10 games. And as you can see, we finished in third. We did actually end up getting more wins than we did losses, which is nice, but it just wasn't quite enough. So this next league, we have to win. But hey, it's not all terrible, right? We came in third, so we still get a prize and it's five ability spheres. And my is the top scorer, which is awesome. And we learn an, an ability that nobody can learn on our team. So big waste of time, but I'm feeling positive now about this next league. Our first match of the new league is against the Ronzo Fangs. And honestly, I'm not too scared anymore. I do feel like this is possible. We were starting to get into a rhythm. And now that our teammates are really strong, I think we can get through this. So with a tackle two coming in super handy there with Q, love that. And then we're just going to pass it to Mayu. And I'm going to show you why the Ronso Fangs are so easy because their speed is very low. So what Mayu can do here is just kind of swim around all the defenders and they can't catch her. She's too fast. We make our way up to the goal, go for a nap shot and we hope and pray we get a goal. So hey, one goal within the first minute of the first game. Things are looking pretty promising. But uh, Basic Ronzo has Sphere Shot, which is a very powerful shot. And can Keeper hold it? I don't know, he does have Super Goalie. Yes, he can, because Keeper's a boss, all right? He, he started off super weak and now he's got 11 shot. He's good. Uh, everyone on the team is now gunning for Mayu, so she's like, I'm just gonna swim back to midway and then go all the way round and they can't do f all about it. So Mayu's going to get right up close, go for a shot, hope for the best, and... Oh, okay, he actually catches that one. But uh, yeah, you see here Bassett goes for another shot here, seeing if he can try his luck. And Keeper can get that four shot, nothing. You know, Keeper's a boss. And it's half time. So second half now, and we've already got a goal. I just want to secure one more to make sure that we secure the win, because if they get a goal, then... Um, we could tie and we don't want that so yeah we get another goal and then that's it pretty much nothing else happens the time is up now it's that time again ladies gentlemen and everyone in between where we fight our arch nemesis but it's okay i'm going to actually swap the team around a bit because i'm just sick of losing to the albed psych so jamal is now going in goal instead of keeper and the reason for that is that jamal just has more catch i know i tried to make it harder on myself at the beginning but jamal isn't that much better so I thought, why not? Let's swap it around. Uh, we actually just tied that game. Nothing happened very interesting that I needed to show you. So I'm just going to run for it pretty quick now. We're against the Killica Beasts. We know these guys are easy, but uh, let's see how this game goes. So we're chucking it over to Mayu here, and we're just going to try and get a goal. So the game has literally just begun. We're 30 seconds in. We're already at the other person's goal, and let's see if we can get there. So she dodges one, and then the other comes out and we go for the shots we get a goal so less than a minute in and we get a goal so it's nice we also get another goal shortly after into the second half and then mayu uses the force to get the ball back to her hand again after she throws it 
Now take a look at the Killika Beast levels in comparison to our own. So kind of given up with everyone except for Q and Mayu. They're the only two I'm actually leveling up. So after three games we're actually in second place. Only one behind the Luka goes. And look at that. They're actually our next team. So this is an important match for us. We have to win this to ensure that we are in the lead and we can stay in the lead. So we're getting towards the end of the first half here. And I'm going to go for a goal. We've only got 30 seconds left. So we're going to break both of the defenders. Get the dodge out onto Doram and then Belgrader. Belgerda? Bel Belgerda hits us, but who cares? We get the goal and we are now up 1 0. So this is now towards the end of the second half. That nap tackle is coming in pretty handy. And I believe the keeper is already asleep, so I let Q score and just rub salt into the wound and get two goals on them instead of one. Because we can. We're that good. And yeah, that is knocking the goers out of their first place spot because now they have a loss and we have three wins and one tie. Heading straight into the next fight against the Guado Glories and they now have recruited Rin, who's the travel agency guy. And his stats are really terrible because he's a new player. So we put him to sleep, uh, give it to Mayu. She goes for a shot, we get a goal, looking good, that's 1-0. And then Wedge goes for a shot, he's a very powerful striker, but not good enough for Jamal, who uh, blocks the shot, nice and easy. And we chuck it back to Mayu, and she goes for another shot, giving us another goal. And yeah, that's the Guado Glories pretty much gone. And now that we've fought each team once, let's see where we are halfway through the league. We're in first place, 4 wins, 1 tie, 13 points. It's going to be pretty tough to beat us. The Abed Sykes are the only real team we have an issue with. Everyone else, pretty easy. We go against the Ronzo Fengs again. We win 2-0. Love that. Next up is the Killika Beasts. And Iskan gets a shot off. And Jamal is ready to catch it. And it actually goes through with one shot. So they have a goal. But we end up beating them 3-1. So... No real issue there. Uh, the next fight is against the Luka Goers. And we score one goal against them. I haven't included it, but we tied against the Albed Sykes. But we get another goal here against the Guado Glories, making it 2-0. That's the end of the league. That's everyone for. And look how powerful we got. 29 levels on Q. That's awesome. He, uh, he did some good work. And as you can see here, we're in first place. We did it. So... To answer the question in the title, yes, you can win a league of Blitzball using only goalkeepers. And now, as you can see here, the league is over and the Besaid Aurox have ended the season at number one. If you guys enjoyed this video, please remember to like, comment and subscribe. And tune in next week where we will be at the final part of our series where we see if we can beat Final Fantasy X by swapping jobs. And if you haven't watched those episodes yet, then go check them out. A link will be available in the end card coming right up. But for now, guys, my name's been Jamsack. Welcome back to the fifth and final episode of my challenge run where we see if we can beat Final Fantasy X by swapping jobs with another character. And yes, this is the final part of the series. And as you can see, Sid is very sad. And I'm sad that it's coming to an end. But there will be more content to come. In the last episode, we had just won the Blitzball League with our goalkeepers. And before that, we had just defeated Unileska. And now we're ready to go and face Sin. But before we go face Sin, we have to go break the news to Micah. Well, we don't have to, but we choose to. So let's see how that goes. We did meet her. We fought and defeated her. What? You have profaned and subverted a thousand year old tradition. Fools. Infants. Do you realize what you've done? You've taken away the only means of calming sin. There is no other way. The only thing that could have pierced that armor, you have destroyed. Nothing can stop it now. Um, so yeah, I, I think he took that pretty well. Disappear on us, will you? Rotten son of a trooper! Now we have some more very important information from the faith, so listen carefully to this. Hello. Dream. A dream? You Yevon. You Yevon. What do you know about You Yevon? Sin. Sin. You Yevon. Dreams. Yeah, that's right. Sin with You Yevon. You Yevon. Sin. You Yevon. Sin. You Yevon. Huh? You Yevon lives inside Sin. Uh huh. Yuna, listen. You Yevon. Dream. Dream. You've been dreaming. I'm sorry. About what? Oh, nothing.
Now that we have access to the airship, I'm going to use the search function and just go around Spira and collect all of the really cool weapons that are available. I do unlock the Omega Ruins, but I don't go there to be honest because there's no point. I'm just doing the main story quest. Uh, we get this really cool weapon for Kimari, the Dragoon Lance, which has magic counter and evade encounter, which is really cool. And then we get the sonar weapon for Riku, which is fine, it's not great. I equip it on her anyway because it's kind of cool, I guess. Uh, and then we pick up this weapon for Tidus, which gives him double AP. But I don't really care for that. I've, I'm happy with his Sonic Steel. It's got magic plus 10 and it's also got first strike, which is really handy. I think we're ready to take on Sin. So Sin goes and does his thing and like blows up half of the world and like we get this cutscene where you see him just like demolish half of the planet like he just tears it to shreds and uh, you can actually fly around Spirit after this and every everywhere is fine, nothing actually goes wrong and nothing really makes sense in this FMV. You see uh, these explosions everywhere, I will admit it's very cool, this is very cool. But like you see this massive explosion and it looks like the airship itself blows up right like look at that they're, they're, it's blown up they're, they're dead uh, and look at the world the world is in shreds but apparently everything's fine because once the cutscene is over everyone is just chilling on the airship still and they're like oh okay uh damn you old man and yeah now we've got to kill both of the wings on sin and then we have to like jump on sin and kill some like weird little things that are attached to him and then we have to kill his head so, yeah, the, these fights aren't very, you know, dramatic. Nothing really happens. Sin can't really do too much to hurt you. You know, he's the most powerful being in this game. He's the thing that is destroying Spira. But, you know, when he's flying around, he's uh, he's pretty chill. Maybe because the Hymn of the Faith is on. That's why he's chill. Oh, yeah, that we did establish that. The Hymn's the key. Yeah, I'm not going to show you too much of these fights because they're pretty basic. You sort of go inwards. You, you move the airship in. And it has a lot of armor. It took me quite a while to kill the fins, I'll be honest. And I won't bore you with it because it was just like attack, 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 attack. Until eventually they die. And yeah, so that is one wing taken care of. So Sid pulls out his big guns now that we've hit its weak spot enough. And pchow, look at that, dead. That's one arm gone. And then we do the exact same thing on the second wing. This one takes a lot less time, actually. I managed to defeat this one a lot quicker. The second wing goes down, here comes the guns again. Pachow! Yeah, this is this is really cool just watching Sin be demolished like bit by bit. It's quite an epic fight, but uh, yeah, we now jump onto his head and it's time to fight the little monsters that are chilling on his head. We got this big old spot on the back of his head. That looks juicy, like that looks ripe to pop. Disgusting! And uh, we also got this armoured thing. Uh, very similar to the thing that we fought all the way back in Kilika on the first ever episode. Nice little throwback there. Yeah, not much to report on on this fight either, really. You can actually end the fight just by killing the spot in the back, but I, I wanted to kill the uh, this little thing too. Um, yeah, he goes for a Venom here, and that's fine because Lulu has counter-attack. Well, hey, look at that. I love seeing Lulu counter things. I don't know why. It's just very cool because she never does that, you know? And I love seeing just how powerful this cactus is. And it makes sense that the cactus would be the powerful Moogle because uh, it is a cactus. And I imagine if that thing ran at you and then kicked you in the face, it would probably hurt. So, you know. And Yuna as well. Look at that. 9,000 damage. She's like nearly at quad 9, which is madness. Super, super powerful. Yuna is definitely my favourite character in the game and in just like this run. She just does really well and you saw that he went back into his shell but uh, he got killed as he went into his shell so he pops out of his shell again so that he can give us a nice and dramatic death so um, I appreciate that from from them that was really really nice of them to show us their face before they died and now we're going for the spot and there is no pop ability you can't just pop all the pus out Disgusting. you have to kill it uh, Walker's Firaga comes out here yeah, not doing too much damage oh that's okay because Yuna can do lots and lots of damage yeah, magic is kind of obsolete at this point, just because Waka's magic stat isn't like high enough, so he's just not doing enough. And Yuna's kind of just broken now. See that gravity attack that just came out? Uh, quite strong, but it can't actually kill us, so we're fine. It only drops us down to like three quarters of our health, similar to Demi, but a lot more powerful. And yeah, the, the fire attack it does after, also not very strong, but obviously once we've been gravid, 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 
it, it does a lot more damage, you know. And yeah, we're just gonna use some armor break here so that everyone can do some strong hits against it. It's gathering up its energy, it's about to pop, it's gonna explode. Uh, Lulu's poisoned, but do we care about that? No, we don't. We just, uh, we know that she can take it. She's a boss, you know? Nothing can hurt Lulu. We do cure the poison off of her though. Oh, look at that, quad nine damage. Oh, you're going for Blizzard, have you? Yeah, not gonna do much. This little boss gauntlet thing against Sin, it's not supposed to be hard, it's just a bit of fun to sort of whittle down his armour and, you know, chip bits off of him before we go inside and kill the actual Sin. There's no real threat of uh, an actual game over, it's very easy to heal up your party, it doesn't do too much damage to us. I mean, Tidus did just die, but we've established that Tidus is a bit smelly and isn't very good at staying alive. <laughs> But yeah, we get the overkill out, which is awesome, and then the spot is defeated. Hey, the Faith, they're tired of this whole thing too. Let's let them rest. The Faith said, it's pointless to keep dreaming. The dream will disappear, he said. What did he mean? I do feel kind of sorry for Yuna because Tidus doesn't actually tell her that he's going to disappear, he just sort of hides it because he doesn't want to hurt her. At the same time, she hid from him that she was going to die at the end of her pilgrimage, so maybe their relationship isn't as good as I thought it was. They're both very bad at communicating and being honest with each other. So, uh, yeah, I mean, as much as I do love the story, the love story between these two, you know, there's an obvious flaw there, but it makes for a great dramatic ending, so uh, I'll give it a pass, alright? I'll give it a pass. I'm coming for you, Dad! Daddy? Now we're ready to tackle Sin head on so that we can create an opening and get inside his mouth and destroy him from the inside. Okay, word. And this fight, again, it's not meant to be too hard. The gimmick of this fight is that he has an overdrive gauge and if that gauge fills up, he uses an attack that just gives us an instant game over. So, you know, if that doesn't come out, he really can't do much harm. So, unfortunately, I am going to skip ahead to the end of this fight. I know, I apologise, I'm skipping through these very quickly. But there's a lot to get through in this video, you know, it's the final part, and there's really just not enough here to show you that is very interesting. So, we get towards the end of it, he doesn't get his game over out on us, and we kill him. Now that we have made our way into Sin, it's time for some really, really difficult normal fights. And uh, yeah, this part of the game, it's the final stretch, the final dungeon. So you can see that the enemies here are very powerful. Uh, this fight here I thought was quite interesting. We got three of these guys and we always have trouble with these guys. Um, turns out they are weak to death and I don't realise that in this run at all. So uh, I do just try and attack them head on. And uh, you'll see here that Lulu's accuracy has gotten a lot better. We're not struggling nearly as much as we were in the Mount Gagazette portion when we had the these enemies and we were struggling to hit them. You'll see here in a minute, she uh, she's doing a lot better. She's got higher accuracy and she is succeeding. Uh, we do also use aim in these fights because aim just gives us that little more boost to, uh, to get it so that we can attack them. But yeah, the encounters in this part of the game are ruthless and it's a very long stretch as well to get through the dungeon. And the map also isn't completed, so you're kind of running around blindly trying to get there. And, uh, oh yeah, you can see there, overkill. Nice, we, uh, we landed a hit on them. Yeah, this part of the game is just like a slog. It's, it's tricky, but it makes sense because it is the final dungeon. And you want it to be challenging. And uh, it never felt too challenging. It's more that the uh, enemies just have a lot of health and we end up having to use a lot of resources to get through them. But we're, we're never struggling too much. Lulu did just kill Oren with her counter attack, but that's okay, we, 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 we revived him. And yeah, you can see Albert Potions now are doing 2000. I did actually get a uh, customizable weapon on Oren that has alchemy. So that's really interesting. And we got that from the big tortoise fights. So you can steal these uh, items from it, which can be crafted to create a alchemy weapon. So uh, yeah, I just wanted to show you that battle to show you where Lulu's at. She's uh, looking pretty good. Now, I'm going to show you this fight against the big tortoise man, uh, the Enderman tortoise. And we fight loads of these guys. They're like everywhere in this part of the game. It feels like after every single other encounter, this guy pops up. And it's not a bad thing, to be honest. He's actually one of the easier fights of this area, mainly because he's super weak to sleep. 
So uh, whenever we know he's about to attack, we just send in Lulu, send him to sleep, and then we're good. And uh, he's also weak to armor break, so Yuna can use armor break, and then we kind of just use our three strongest hitters, which are Kimari, Lulu, and Yuna, to just get his health down, and um, yeah, no problems at all. Having this alchemy weapon on, uh, uh, what's his name, Auron, is really handy as well, because it just makes our Albed potion super potent, and he uh, becomes quite a good white mage when uh, he's got alchemy. But yeah, I thought this, this fight was super exciting. We are getting all these hits in, and then uh, he goes for an Earthquake, and it's not doing too much damage. We're, we're fine. We do have to use up a lot of our MP during this part, just because the battles here just do more damage to us, and we have to heal more. <laughs> Lulu just don't give a f She is slapping anyone who comes in her way. Giant Armoured Tortoise? No, mate. Do not hurt Lulu. She will slap the s*** out of you. Um... Yeah, so those are a couple of the fights that we have here, and um, yeah, it's it's a it's it takes a long time this part. I was getting very tired at this point. I was like, I just want to get to the next Seymour fight, you know. But uh, yeah, you can see that was just one fight that happens multiple times through this long dungeon. So we do get to the uh, safe sphere eventually, and you can see there, Waka just learned double cast, which is very helpful, and Tidus has just learned full life, and is now unlocked the path to get towards Lulu's grid. So checking out our stats here, Lulu's super powerful, man, like, she's got such good uh, everything, really, and so here is Yuna, 64 strength, looking nice, uh, Kamari's looking pretty good, got great agility, great strength, good defense, uh, magic defense is still an issue, it always is with Kamari, but that's fine, and then Waka here's got pretty solid magic now, 49 magic, not bad, good magic defense as well, and evasion, also Auron is looking great, 49 agility, he's so quick, and 36 strength isn't too bad, it's not great, but it's not bad, Tidus's magic looking great, 52, uh, good magic defense, he's, he's fine, you know, good agility too, but he's quite weak, in the defense department and Riku is still our weakest in terms of stats but she ain't too bad so uh yeah let, let's get into the Seymour fight now shall we <laughs> how on earth did Seymour get inside Sin I don't know maybe Sin just ate him but it's never really explained uh yeah he's full-on crazy now let, let, let's kill him let's kill him for the final time now nothing can stop us well we can She's got a point. We get this super awesome boss battle music. It's a shame that the 1.5 speed modifier I'm using doesn't really do it justice. Take my word for it though, it's, it's very cool. And I will say that about a lot of the music in this game, it's just got some really cool tracks. This song and the Via Purifico song is a bop and the main theme to Xanakand is also a bop. Like, it's got some great uh, music. And the final boss battle, when, when we get there, the music there is really cool as well. But enough about the music, let's talk about the fight here. And Seymour has now turned into Liquid. He is now a big Liquid Man thing. And he can use Firaga several times. And I went into this quite blind. I wasn't quite sure what he did. It's It's been a long time since I've uh, fought this battle. And yeah, he uses Firaga like four times in a row. So it's uh, it's quite dangerous. You do know what he is going to cast though. So you see those little pallets at the back of him? All the red ones are facing him, which means he's going to cast fire spells. You can see I use a Mega Phoenix there to get through that because, um, yeah, it, it, the Firaga does way too much damage to us. So I was like, okay, I am not prepared for this. It's, uh, it's not looking too good for me. I need to go into this with a strategy. Now I remember that he casts uh, four magic spells in a row, I can um, prepare better. You can see I'm learning, I'm using uh, Null Blaze to get rid of the um, fire damage, and that makes this fight a lot easier. But yeah, he's uh, he's powerful, he gets a lot of turns in as well, he's got a lot of speed. Uh, yeah, four Firagas obviously isn't enough for Null Blaze, one person is unfortunately going to die. So Tidus is definitely a very um, strong character for this, we, we will be relying on Tidus quite a lot with his uh, null abilities and there's of course different phases to this fight but instead of having like phase one phase two phase three this fight sort of has like a phase one and then like an alternate form and then when he's in his alternate form he does some different stuff 
and then he sort of reverts back to his uh, normal form like this. Yeah, I'm just kind of scrambling around trying to stabilize, get everyone used, and then uh, figure out a tactic on how to defeat him. And you'll see soon, it's, uh, it, it turns out to be quite tricky. I should have done some preparation beforehand, but I don't like looking stuff up online. I like to just go into a fight and see what happens, and if I die, I die, I just retry it again. So yeah, he's weak to Blizzard at the moment because he's in his fire form, so we get Kamari to do that. But unfortunately, he's going to use Firaga four times against three of our weaker defensive characters. So uh, they uh, unfortunately go down. He gets four Firagas out, and then I think he just gets another turn here. So he uses it again, and Waka's dead. So that's a bit sad. Let's retry this one again. Right, this time I ain't wasting any time. I'm getting Null Blaze out straight away with Tidus, and I'm also going to put Shell on some of our more important characters. So I know that Tidus is going to be very handy with his Null technique, so I get Shell out on him straight away because I want him alive. And uh, Seymour here can only actually do magic attacks, so we're pretty safe to just go with Shell on our important characters. We don't need to do Protect or anything like that. And you can see there, Shell made it so that Tidus only took a thousand damage from his Firaga, which is lovely. That is what we want. And uh, it turns out Seymour is also weak to armor break, so that is incredible. We can use Blizzaga from Waka, and then we can also have Yuna use her powerful attacks against him now that his armor is broken. So, yeah, I'm feeling more confident now. Now I know what to do. He's about to attack again, so Tidus comes out. Faraga comes out and uh, yeah, he always attacks each player once and then he'll select a random person and do his fourth Faraga attack on them. Uh, I guess it's like each pallet is attacking because there's like four pallets around him so like it's one Faraga for each of the pallets. And that's uh, that's cool. Well, is it cool? I don't know. It's just a thing. It's just the fight. I don't think this Seymour fight is as cool as the other ones. I think the coolest one was the one on Mount Gagazette. That one, like, he just looks awesome. This one, like, it's hard to see what he even is. Like, the shape of him is very cool, but I wish he was, like, more, um, you know, more detailed. Instead of just being liquid, I wish it was, like, this cool, like, humanoid-looking thing. That would have made it so much more cool. But, hey, the music kind of makes up for it, I guess. I'm just uh, making sure that each person gets an attack in, like I do. Getting out that Null Blaze on people, healing everyone up. And yeah, Lulu's uh, making good work of him, you know? she's. It takes her a very long time for her Moogle to... Uh, I say Moogle, her Cactus. It takes her a very long time for the Cactar to reach him. Because he's so far away, everyone's standing so far. So Cactar has to run a marathon just to hit him. And that's not fair. Oh, yeah, cool. You can see here now he's going into his, like, spooky, spooky, scary phase. And this is where he starts doing some scary sh**. So he uses Dispel on us, that removes our haste and gets rid of our Null Blaze, but we don't really need Null Blaze anymore. Uh, I do get haste out on us again, because haste is important. And I do get Null Blaze out again, because I wasn't quite sure what he does here, but it turns out I don't need it. And I'm putting the shell back on, so yeah, this is good. I'm making sure that even though he's dispelling us, I'm, you know, I'm going to uh, put all the spells back on myself again. And he also gets a, uh, an increase in defense when he's in this mode. But yeah, here comes Ultima, and I was not sure how much damage this was going to do. Yikes! That's, uh, that's a lot of damage. But Yuna, thank god, she survived. So Tidus had Shell on him, and even that wasn't enough. And because he's on Yuna's grid, he has quite high magic defense. But I guess his HP is very low, and uh, yeah, it just wasn't quite enough to survive it. So that's terrifying. That's the only thing we really need to watch out for, because... Now he's moved into Blizzard. Ooh, he's now changed to use Blizzard attacks. And once he's in this phase, it's uh, it's not an issue. We just get the Null Frost out onto our party, and suddenly he can't do anything to us. It's just when he goes into his Ultima mode that we need to be a bit scared. But we saw there, Yuna didn't even have Shell, and she managed to survive it. So if we get a Shell out on her, and get some of the other more defensive characters out, We'll be able to survive Ultima no problem. So now that I've figured out what he does, and now that I know that my party is more than capable of handling it, 
I'm feeling confident. I'm feeling like Seymour is not going to be too much trouble. And that's great because the last Seymour fight was an absolute nightmare. That that big old, uh, I don't know what it was, that, that giant attack that he did that kept killing us over and over again. We don't have to worry about that. Now that I've figured out what he does and what we can do to defeat him, it's just a case of executing it and getting his HP down. So I'm going to skip ahead a little bit here and show you what happens when he goes into his second form again. So yeah, he gets to spell out once again. So I'm going to make sure I get out Shell again. And I believe I put it onto Lulu as, uh, yeah, I know he's going to cast Ultima again, so I can better prepare. Okay, I give Shell to Yuna and um, I'm just going to attack him and see what happens here. Uh, we're still doing good damage to him, to be honest. I thought his defense increased when he was in this uh, phase, but it seems it doesn't. He's still taking 8,000 damage. Uh, Cactar takes 10 years to get over to him, but yeah, 7,000 damage. We're looking good. And he doesn't even get the second Ultima out. He just goes down because my gals, Lulu and Yuna, they're just too powerful. So uh, yeah, thank God. No more Seymour. He's finally gone. And um, that ends his arc. There is no more Seymour. And... He starts off as quite a cool villain, you know, he's kind of ooky spooky mysterious. And then he just goes a little bit off the rails, he's just kind of mental. But uh, I don't know why Yuna didn't send him way before this. Like, he, she's had so many opportunities to send him. And uh, also, we, we figure out that Auron is dead, spoiler alert. So why is he not being sent at the moment? Because she's performing and as ascending, and he's like right behind her. So why is he not disappearing as well? But... Yeah, see you later, Seymour. It was nice knowing you, mate. Okay, Fab. So, he is dead now. Seymour is no more. And we're at the final parts of the game here. We're at the final dungeon, getting towards the final boss. So, the enemies in this part of the game are super duper hard. They were hard in a bit before the Seymour fight, but, like, these enemies take it to a next level. And you can see that with this fight here. I, I went in quite unprepared. I just sort of thought, yeah, we're strong enough. I'm just going to go in and kill everything because, hey, I've got Yuna on my team. And there's nothing Yuna can't handle. But yeah, this uh, Demonolith, I believe it's called, it's it's a very tricky enemy because it's got a lot of armor. And it always counterattacks with that Pharaoh's Curse. And uh, we do have Auto Med on Auron, but Auron's strength is just not quite where I want it to be. So we won't really be using Auron very much. And yeah, luckily we have people like Riku and our other white mages to kill the status effects. But uh, yeah, he uses Stone Breath. And I didn't have any protection for stone on me, so everybody died. And um, I had to start again. Luckily I saved before the last Seymour fight, so it was okay. This is another enemy here that's very tricky. The, oh god, what's he called? The Behemoth? And yeah, that is what it's called. I'm, I'm doing pretty well. Usually I just give them a silly name, but I remember these guys for some reason. And I remember the Behemoth. Because he's in a lot of Final Fantasy games, and he's a problem. He's a very strong uh, enemy. Very cool looking. Like, look at look at the size of him. He's just this big old beast with uh, a mohawk that goes all the way down to his tail. Like, his mohawk starts at the tip of his forehead and goes all the way back to the tip of his tail. That's, that's pretty exciting. I, I like that. Very fun. Uh, he's very veiny as well. But yeah, tricky fight. Fundara there does a lot of damage to uh, Tidus, and... It's only a level 2 black magic spell, and Tidus has a lot of magic defense, so the fact they did that much damage is like, eek, yikes, but, um, yeah, the reason why this guy is quite challenging, you do face uh, behemoths in other parts of the game, I believe, but this behemoth is different, like, you, you fight these in uh, Mount Gagazet as well. This behemoth in particular has a, an overkill thing, not an overkill thing, it's like a, an on-death effect, so when he dies, he casts uh, Meteor, which absolutely obliterates us. And um, yeah, you'll see that in a second here. He also can cast Mighty Guard on himself, which is, gives him Protect, gives him Shell, and gives him Null to every single element. But luckily Dispel gets rid of all of that, so not too much of a problem. If I was using Limit Breaks, then uh, Kamari could steal that Mighty Guard, which is really good. It's actually a super handy defensive overdrive. But we're not using overdrive, so we don't bother learning it. Yuna takes him down and the meteor comes out and I'm like, right, I've got my three strong boys out. <sighs> Lulu just survives on 300 HP. Yikes. Okay, we've made it to the final boss and now here's the last bit of leveling. And um, you can see there, Kamari has just finished Tidus's grid. 
Uh, he's just learned quick hit, which is a super, super broken technique. And now I'm going to send him over here using a return sphere. And if I use a level, is that level two or level one? If I use a level one key sphere here, it will actually get me onto Auron's grid, which is, you know, the, the grid with all the strength on it. So now Kimari is just going to start growing in strength because that's all we really need now. And yeah, you can see here, Tidus has also learned Holy, which is a super powerful white magic spell. And Auron has learned Flare. I go ahead and teach Tidus Flare with a black magic sphere. And now for the final time, let's take a look at everybody's stats. So here is Waka's final stats. And yep, he is definitely very Lulu looking. And as you can see here, this is Tidus's final stats. And yep, it's very Yuna looking, but obviously with more strength because he starts out with more strength. Kamari has grown into such a wonderful uh, attacking person. I don't know how to describe it. He's, his strength and agility has grown and he's like really awesome to use and I like him very much. And here is Oren. He's like, he's fallen off a bit. He started off really good, but his strength has not kept up with everyone else's. He's only handy really for his Albed potions. And Yuna now is super strong, 72 strength. Like, we know she's a boss. We can uh, we can move past that. And hey, Riku's strength has gone up quite a lot now. Since she's been on Waka's grid, it's increased quite a lot. But her magic is also really good. So definitely filling that red mage role. And here is Lulu. She's kind of just like a second Yuna to me, you know. She's not as strong as Yuna, but she's still pretty strong. And her accuracy is super good now. Great evasion, just great stats in general. Before we get on to the final boss, you have this weird little mini game where you have to collect items and we get this infinity weapon for Riku. It gives her one MP cost, so I go ahead and teach her Kiraga just so she has that. And I go ahead and teach Flare to Waka since he is the black mage. But yeah, it's time to finally confront our dad. Our dad, Tidus' dad. We, we do not share the same father of Tidus. Yeah, the dialogue here is like Final Fantasy X-ish. Dad? Yeah. I hate you. Like, it's so silly and, like, baby-y, but it's funny, you know? It's a big epic moment. Tidus has finally come to confront his dad, and he just goes, I hate you! Um, <laughs> but that's exactly what you'd expect from Tidus, right? And yeah, now we have Braska's final Aeon. Jectin is, like, super scary Aeon form. And this is so freaking cool! And the music here, oh, the music is just like, whoa, what an epic way to have, like, a final fight. Let's get into it. I promise this will be quick! Hit me with all you got, Dad! Daddy? Here we go, Braska's final A on time, and let me tell you, I was not prepared for this. Usually at this stage of the game, I've got all the celestial weapons, you know, everyone's broken, I've done all the after late game stuff that you can do in this game. Or I'll just send out Bahama, use my overdrives, like, there's so many ways to just cheat a lot of the boss battles in this game, once you get to a certain point. And yeah, I've never had trouble with him because I'm always broken. This is like the most underpowered I've ever been going into this fight. And without having to use summons to rely on. And this boss battle is really, 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 really hard. I had a lot of trouble with this and you'll see um, just how many times it takes me to kill him. It's, uh, it ain't funny. Well, it's kind of funny. I don't know, you can laugh at me if you want, I don't mind. But at the time I was getting so frustrated because I was like, this guy is just too tough. But I didn't want to overgrind, and you'll see, I don't overgrind at all. I figure out a tactic eventually, but it takes a while. Here is Braska's final Aeon. He has these two little uh, pagodas, is that how you say it? You pagodas? And they can like heal him up and do special things, and they have a bit of health. They have about 5,000 health, but it like increases every time you kill them. But you have to kill them because they'll boost his overdrive gauge and they'll give uh, him health. So you want to get those out of the way. Now, Jet can also do this Jet Beam, as you just saw, which petrifies one of your characters. Bit annoying, now I know that. I know to protect against petrification in my armor. And yeah, he's also very quick. He's got a lot of, like, big damaging effects. He can hit multiple people. But yeah, you can see Jet Beam is just doing a number on our team. We've got two people petrified. Yeah, I thought this would be a cakewalk. Turns out it's actually very difficult. And there's also a second phase to this guy's fight. He starts off really hard, but he only gets harder. And when his overdrive gets filled up, that is a very big problem for us, we soon find out. And yeah, it's it just takes a lot of trial and error. The best sort of tactics I have is to double cast Flare, but it doesn't do enough damage to uh, one-shot these Pagodas. You see, I sort of like experiment by using Tidus to use Flare, and um, 
I teach him double cast eventually. I don't think I have it here in this first fight, but I want as much magic stats as possible to be thrown at these pagodas because I want them to go down, preferably in one hit, because it just makes my life much easier. I'm sort of going through all of the items, sort of just seeing what I can do because I'm like, it's the last fight and I have lots of items. So if there's ever a time to use them, now is the time, right? And you'll see when I get to like the final part of this, um, there's a, a certain item that I didn't even know existed. I've never even used in this game before. But there's an item that we use that ensures our victory towards the end. That is kind of a spoiler, but like obviously I'm going to beat him in the end. Like why would I why would I leave this challenge run without defeating the final way on? So um, spoiler a lot, I, I do kill him, but it's definitely the hardest part of this game. And yeah, look how much damage he does to us. Ah! I don't know what his overdrive does yet, so I'm just like, I'm just going to keep attacking and see what happens. He's nearly dead, so I'm like, okay, he's not even going to get his overdrive out. This is easy. Uh, he goes for another jet beam here. Poor Lulu, she's petrified. I thought once I got his HP down, he would be dead. But you'll see I'm very wrong about that. And I'm like, oh, I'm not going to bother going for the pagodas because he's basically dead. But here comes his overdrive. Yes, he's dead. I did it. Nope. It's now just time for him to turn into his second form. And this is quite cool, actually. He's like, right, I'm done playing around. Oof, it lights up at the back. And he's like, I need my big ass sword. So I'm going to pull it out of my chest. And uh, sorry to hear, but you are all about to die. And yeah, he goes for triumphant grass. This is his overdrive. So it does a little bit of damage to us. Uh, and I say a little bit of damage. He does quite a bit of damage to us. And then quite a bit more of damage to us. And I'm like, oof, okay, we uh, we managed to survive it though, so that's pretty good. Let's uh, let's cure up Lulu, and we will continue to go from there. They're powering up uh, Jekt as we speak, and I'm quite surprised I managed to survive that, to be honest. But look how much health he has. Oh, it's going to take so long. Like, our hits just don't do much damage. Our best bet, of course, is Yuna. And she does have armor break, and armor break does work on him. But it's going to take time, and now the Pagodas have really high HP, like that one has 15,000 HP. And it's like, what? Now it's going to take me more hits to kill the Pagodas, we don't have enough speed. Uh, yeah, he goes for this sword attack and just completely obliterates Tidus and Yuna. And now it's just Lulu on her own, and she can't seem to get a turn in. He's just attacking her, and then they're cursing her, and uh, there's just not much she can do at this point. She's now asleep and poisoned, and... That's it. That's our first game over against this guy. It's a... Uh, it's a problem. So we try again, and this is our second attempt here. You can see he goes for Triumphant Grasp again. Everybody dies. So, okay, second attempt didn't go too well. I'm just going to keep on trying. So this is the third attempt now, and uh, look, same thing happens again. No luck. And I actually got really frustrated at this point. I had to have a break for the game for a little bit because uh, it really annoyed me. So I decided to have a little rest and come back to this the next day with a fresh mind. Okay, so it's the next day. I've had time to think, I've had time to adjust, I've had time to reconvene myself. And I'm like, right, what can I do to best increase my chances of winning? So I teach you in a quick hit. And um, I'm just going to go back in and see what happens and of course I die but I did get a lot closer this time so this next attempt now I'm feeling good and I'm going to show you the strategy we used for this next attempt here so this is like my fifth attempt at this point so I, I know what this guy does I know how he behaves I know the sort of attacks he does it seems it's kind of random whether he uses jet beam or that little like palm attack that you just saw so um yeah, Jex Beam is the only thing that's actually a problem because of the petrification. But I believe I gave petrification armor to Auron and maybe one other character. But um, there's three characters in particular that I end up using for most of the fight and you will soon see why. Um, yeah, I don't bother switching out into everyone because I'm like, nobody even needs experience anymore. So why am I bothering to even do that? And I believe this is the party. These are the three that end up doing it for us. And um, we've got really high magic on Tidus, and we've got really high strength on Yuna, and we've got good tech options with uh, Auron. He's got that auto med, he's also got Albed potions, and he's also immune to petrification. So Auron becomes a sort of like techie slot, I guess. 
We make sure that Tidus has dual cast and flare, which takes care of the pagodas. We also increased his magic a bit using, uh, I think it's like an attribute sphere that you get during the little mini game thing you have to do before where you collect all the items. And yeah, I'm just searching through my items, looking for something that will help me win. And oh, I find a stamina tablet, which doubles our maximum HP. Where we got that from, I have no idea, but we have, well, we have two of them. Where we got two stamina tablets from, I don't know. I'm glad we got them. So uh, yeah, I make sure I get one on Tidus because Tidus is very handy with um, his magic spells. And then I use the other one on Yuna, I believe, just because Yuna has a lot of strength. And I believe she has alchemy as well, so if anyone gets KO'd, she can revive them with a phoenix down for free. Well, not for free. Well, yeah, it's for free. It uses a phoenix down, but what I meant to say was it heals you back up to full health. So I get, get my stamina tablet out onto Yuna, and now we are sitting pretty. You know, there's uh, we still have to worry because he's still a tough battle, but there's a lot of things that do like 3,000 damage, 4,000 damage, you know. Sometimes he gets multiple turns in. And it just means that, like, now we can survive that. Yuna's got 9999 HP, and I'm feeling a lot better about this, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be the easiest thing in the world. I get Kamari out to use haste on himself, as Kamari just has more strength than Auron does. So on the turns that we don't need Auron's sort of techie capabilities, we can swap into Kamari and use Kamari to do some damage to him. And yeah, the first phase of this fight, I've got down to a T. Like, it's really not that difficult. It's actually quite simple. Protect is also very handy, so we get Protect out. Ah, see, it's uh, Yuna. Yuna is the one who also has uh, Petrification Protection. And he goes for her a couple of times with Jack Beam, I think. So we got very lucky with that, that he only went for Yuna. Yeah, I'm, I'm feeling proper good. We got Cheer with Kamari. We've got Protect on everyone to make sure we're doing less damage. So I'm just making sure in this first phase where he's not too dangerous, we're setting up enough to uh, survive when he gets into his super strong, scary phase. So I think that's what I was missing. Obviously, the stamina tablets really do help, but I do think with more Cheers and Protect and everything, I would have defeated this monster without the stamina tablets, possibly. And it kind of feels like cheating, but it's not cheating. It's in the game. I had it in my items, and I used it. So, yeah, you can see there. I only took 900 damage from that attack, which is awesome. I go ahead and get some focuses out from Waka, because uh, I just want Tidus to be able to one-shot the Pagodas each time. But they come back with more health, as I've said a million times. So using focus just ensures that we have more magic. And, yeah, obviously double-casting Flare uses a lot of MP. But we have turbo ethers, we've got loads of items, because I don't really use items too much. Besides high potions and things like that, all the like ethers and all the special elixirs and mega elixirs, I tend to save them for moments like this, because uh, I don't like to waste them on anything, you know. I want to make sure I'm using them at really tough enemies like this. Okay, his overdrive gauge is full, and we know that triumphant grasp is going to come out. And I think any one of these characters should be able to survive it. I go for a power break just to make sure that he's doing less damage. So we've got protect, we've got cheer, we've got armor break, we've got power break. This should be fine. He grabs Kamari, which is not the best person he could have chose, but... Hmm, 1200 damage and then 1100 damage. That was his overdrive. That was fine. That was a 2000 damage attack to one character. Awesome. It does get zombie out on him, but we can just cure that off. And uh, go for some Albed Potions just to get everyone back to full health again. And yeah, we, uh, we've, we've taken Tidus out because we didn't really need him. We just want to do physical damage, but I bring him back in whenever the Pagodas are back because that is just the best way to deal with them. I'm not sure if Flare is going to be able to kill them. It doesn't quite kill him, but that's fine. We do get the kill out onto Jekt. And now it's time for the dreaded second phase, and I barely ever survive the second phase, so... I'm, I'm set up pretty well, so I'm feeling fairly confident, but not like the most confident because I know that this guy can do some serious damage. But let's see how it goes here. So he always goes for this big sweepy attack when he transforms, and pff, pathetic! It did less than a thousand damage to us. That usually does, like over two thousand to us. And you saw in the first fight, it did like three thousand. So you can see with protect, armor break, power break, all of that, it's made it super easy. 
Just replenishing Tidus's MP because he's going through it with Flair. Flair costs 54 MP and we're double casting it. So that's almost 100 MP like per turn and he doesn't have that much MP. Uh, yeah, you can see Auron there is still taking a lot. I think the power break must have worn off because uh, suddenly we're taking lots of damage. Yeah, it has. Oh, it's worn off because he's transformed. So we get armor break off again. We get power break off again. The tactic is here. Like, we know what we're doing now. Like, we've, we've got this. I'm gonna make sure everyone's got protect. I give protect to Auron, just because um, I don't want him to get too hurt. Auron is immune to petrification too, because of that armor. Ah, so good. Like, this is probably what I should have been doing the whole run, is, you know, getting armors and weapons that best suit each boss. But this is the first time I've had to, like, properly think about what I'm doing and properly think about how to defeat an enemy and that's cool it's really really fun you know if this was a harder challenge I'd probably do that more oh yeah I've been forgetting to use quick hit I purposely got quick hit and I completely forgot to use it but we use it towards the end here so that's pretty good but you can see now he's barely got any health left and I'm like I think it's actually gonna happen I think this is where we kill Jet. I'm just deciding here whether I want to bother killing the pagodas and I, I do go for it just because I want to be safe I don't want to get too cocky and just go for Jet and then all of a sudden, you know, some crazy madness happens. And I'm like, F why didn't I kill the Pagodas? So making sure to do that. Getting another focus out so that Tidus can kill this guy in one hit. Let's see if we can. He's got 7,000 HP. Did 8,000 to that one. And we did 8,000 to that one. So both the Pagodas are dead. This is it now. His, his overdrive gauge is nearly full. But 60,000 HP. It's, oh, it's so close. <laughs> Okay, he might be able to get another overdrive off, but I'm hoping we'll be okay. We're going to use quick hit with Kimari, who's now doing quad 9 damage. Pretty cool. And yeah, we're just going to make sure that we are healed up and that we have, you know, all the necessary protect things on us. And it seems we do. We, we can survive an overdraft, it seems. Overdraft and overdrive. Jack Spin comes out again. It goes for Yuna. She's got petrification armor. We're getting so lucky with that. But... After how many attempts this took us, I think we deserve some good luck. We had a lot of good luck this run, and um, we got a lot of bad luck against this guy. So it's nice that it's finally repaying us, and uh, it's, it's putting this uh, thing to rest. So here comes his uh, ultimate jet shot overdrive. And this is a cool ass attack. It's kind of like holy at the beginning, and then we're like teleported into space, and giant meteor comes down and he chucks it up in the air and throws it at us and then explosions happen does a lot of damage but not too much nobody even died from that so not bad at all and they didn't even have the stamina tablets on them Kimari Nora anyway Yuna did but yeah we could have survived without that and now that his overdrives come out we don't really care to get rid of the pagodas because he's gonna die soon and that's it the final hit happens. We, we did it. We actually did it. And Yu Yevon has now left his body. And of course this isn't the end. There is a boss battle against Yu Yevon. But we have auto revive on us. So it's not really a challenge at all. I don't really need to show you that to be honest. But um, yeah. I'll just show you quickly what happens at the end here. We just cast Doom on um, the Yu Yevon character. Yu Yevon guy. He's like a little spider thing. He's quite cute actually. But yeah. Uh, we have a candle of life, we put Doom on him, Doom just kills him in three turns, we didn't really need to worry about that, because even when we die, you see those little halos, they, they bring us back to life, so yeah, that's it, that is the run, that is the last boss defeated, and it's just time for the ending, and the end credits, we did it guys, we did it! And now everyone in Spira is like, woo, yeah, yeah, you did it, woo, go guys, we love you, yeah, everyone's the best, Tidus is awesome, Yuna's awesome. And then we get a nice little farewell to Auron, he gets like a little death scene, he's like, I've accomplished my mission, and it's time for me to go to the far plane. And that's Auron gone, and now we get the rest of the ending, where, uh, unfortunately, we have to say goodbye to Tidus, and... This is proper emotional, like, I'm not the kind of person that cries at, you know, films or video games, like, I'm aware that it's just art and it doesn't, you know, make me feel anything, but <laughs> I say that this game brings me close to tears, I will say, because you just want these two to be together and, like, they just have such a good connection. And it's like they've finally accomplished everything. They can finally be together and be happy, but they can't because Tidus has to disappear. And, like... 
Oh god, it's just so sad. Like, Yuna deserves the world. She deserves everything, and she does so much, and she does everything correctly. She's brought peace to Spira, but she can't be with the one she loves. And then she finally says it. I love you. And it's like, ah! She loves him! <laughs> But Titus doesn't say it back, which is kind of mean, but I think he was just trying to be like, I don't want to make it too hard for you. And it's 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 beautiful. You know, you want these characters to just have the best in life. And, you know, it's like a happy ending, but a sad ending at the same time. And it's just beautiful. What a beautiful game. Like, I, this game means so much to me without sounding too cringe. You know, I don't care if I sound cringe. This game is just like everything to me. It, it, I grew up with this game and it taught me so much about narrative and story and um, you know how to create a compelling story and I just think it's magical it, it, whenever I think of like a happy place I think about this game and I know that sounds way too deep for just like a little silly game but it, it really um resonated with me as a kid and it still does to this day and yeah Tidus is now going to the far plane because he's a dream or something yes you're a dream and he gives his dad a little high five and it's all over so that's it folks that's that's all you're gonna get from me that is the end of the game and i want to thank everyone for watching this and tuning in i uh i first made this just as like a little experiment just to see if i could do it because i enjoy editing and i enjoy this game so i just wanted to see if i could make something out of it and i never expected it to gain the amount of traction that it does so i'm super super grateful and i want to make sure that people still get content from me so uh let me know what you guys want to see and i'll try and uh, make some more stuff but yeah, make sure to like, comment and subscribe if you haven't already. And I'm also going to direct you to my other YouTube channel, which is Super Promo. And that is more of a personal account that I run with one of my friends. And we are trying to make a TV series come to life that we have been writing together. And we've got to go fund me for it. So I'd really appreciate it if you checked out that channel, subscribed and contributed to the GoFundMe if you can. Don't worry if you can't, but the option is there. And um... Yeah, thank you so much for watching, guys. My name has been Jamsek. See you later.